Good morning, um, everybody. Um, welcome back to our Artificial Intelligence Conference um, this morning. This is uh, day number two, and we are looking forward to a very, very exciting um, day. Before we start, let me thank again our host of today, the state representation of Baden-Württemberg, um, and a very, very strong partner um, for us. We wouldn't, wouldn't have been able at all to put this uh, together today. And also to the team, to the technical team, to the, to, to the content uh, team, thank you so very much. Also, many, many thanks to the Dürr Stiftung, with whom we also wouldn't have been able to put together this four-year-long series on artificial intelligence. And we also wouldn't be here today with our, without our other strong partners, the Friedrich Naumann Stiftung, the Böll Stiftung, um, Accenture, SAP, Microsoft. Um, very, very, very many thanks for your strong support and for believing in us um, that we could pull it off. Today we are starting with a panel which is particularly dear in a keynote speech, dear to my heart, because there are two very special women um, who I'm welcoming today and who are setting us up um, for the day. Um, it is Eva Deininger, who is a very good friend of Aspen and uh, a member of our um, Friends of Aspen board, um, and you have been pivotal in supporting um, Aspen over the last years. Um, and a good old friend, Gabriela Ramos, um, who is going to be introduced by Eva just in a second. And um, I just want to say about Gabriela, she is a power woman. She keeps everybody on her toes. And I know this from the German G20 presidency when I was responsible for the Business 20, where she really kept me on my toes saying, where's the responsibility of business? And I think we are going to hear a little bit more about this. So thank you so much for uh, being here today. And the floor is yours. Thank you. <clears throat> Darling. Good morning to everyone, also, also from myself, here in the representation of Baden-Württemberg, my home country, the land, <laughs> um, and over, also over the live stream um, on the internet. I'm delighted to start with you, Gabriella, on this um, spotlight talk, where you are very happy to have you here in person, despite of the COVID situation. I think the conference couldn't be better at this time, because on November 24th, you um, uh, had a comprehensive global standard setting instrument. You provided the recommendation on the ethics of artificial intelligence. So I'm very curious about to hear how you got there to this enormous paper with this amazing content and um, to hear what are the next steps after your spotlight. But before, I want to give some insights about your amazing CV and what you're doing now. Gabriela is the assistant, Gabriela Ramos, to get the whole name, is the assistant director general for the social and human sciences of UNESCO, where she oversees the contributions of the institution to build inclusive and peaceful societies. So her agenda includes social inclusion and gender equality, advancing youth development, promotion of values, anti-racism, anti-discriminatory agendas, and our topic today, the ethics of AI. So, I'm very, very happy to hear about all this. You served as the chief of staff and chairperson to the G20 and G7 before, as we heard from Stormy. And in 2019, you launched the Business for Inclusive Growth Platform. So you are really connected also to the, to the big companies and the operational business. And you were director of the OECD office in Mexico and Latin America. So a really powerful woman. So the floor is you, and we are very happy to hear what you're telling us about the latest news on the recommendation the 20, which came out the 24th of November. Thank you so much. Uh, so I got there for my initial presentation. Thank you, Eva, and thank you, Stormy. Thank you, Aspen Institute and the, the foundations. Uh, 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 I would say that if, if Stormy calls, I come. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, we are two of a kind, and I'm, I'm really admiring this very impressive work. Uh, the, the, the title of the conference is Humanity Empowered. And I think this is the way we should be talking about artificial intelligence. This is the way we see it in, um, in the, in, in, at UNESCO. Uh, but I feel that now that we have 193 countries approving this very ambitious recommendation by a standing ovation 
at the General Conference in um, last week at UNESCO, it tells you that there is something that is bringing us together in terms of how we need to redress the way we have been uh, advancing these technologies to make them sustainable. I have to say that uh, we are all at awe of how much contributions, how many contributions artificial intelligence can make. We know it. I mean, they help us to find a vaccine in less than one year without their churning and tracking and um, analyzing all the patterns of the virus. I don't think that would have been possible. We know how much they can help in any, every single step of, uh, of, our life, uh, of our lives. But at the same time, we are concerned about many issues. And I think this is very, very linked to the question of resilience. Because if, if the, if the, if the uh, systems that we have been developing have vulnerabilities in terms of protecting people, in terms of respecting human rights of people, we have something that is not sustainable and that is not resilience. And this is how I want to frame it, because of course in UNESCO we frame it human rights, period. <laughs> the ethical framework is about respecting human rights online as we do it offline, which is not still the case. So what are the issues there? First, if, uh, if, 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 the systems, if the systems are being used to meddle with our democracies and with our minds, I mean, they are being used, not by everybody, <laughs> thanks God, but, but they have produced outcomes in terms of how elections are conducted and how much you can profile and target people with messages that raise concerns and trigger certain behaviors. This is not sustainable. This is really uh, very worrisome. Um, if, um, if we are constantly being um, targeted in terms of really protecting your privacy, in terms of every time you go to the, to the internet and, and get something, uh, you don't know what is going to happen really with your information. And the fact is that uh, even if there is consent and even if there is GDPR and we have improved the way these things work, the fact is that we still do not know how our information is being used. Do you know? We don't. We know that, of course, you put certain information in the, in the, in the, in the system and you get uh, some outcomes with, uh, with uh, all of the algorithms, but the fact is that we're still not uh, on top of the issues. And this is more worrisome because of COVID, of course, because uh, there has been a massive uh, uh, gathering of data, which is normal because we are in a crisis, uh, but uh, there has been 60% increase in internet traffic and leaving uh, online footprints exposed uh, to all these uh, things. Finally, uh, we are subject to algorithmic determination every day. And many decisions are being taken with the support of uh, artificial intelligence without full transparency. And therefore, what is the quality of data? What is the framework, the conceptual framework of the algorithms? How much we are really taking into account that they are representative, that they are not biased? Well, this is not true because we have known for many uh, anecdotes or examples or, or, or just the scandals, plain scandals as we have heard from the Facebook uh, whistleblower. But in general, we know that many times uh, facial recognition technologies are less, are less capable of recognizing women. Why? Well, because probably women are less present. And we know because only 20% of the AI developers are women. 85% of AI developments are done by male-only teams. Nothing wrong with men. The only point is that they represent certain view of the world that then when you ask the, the machine to produce certain outcomes, of course they are biased. And this is really one of the questions that we were tackling in the, in the, in the recommendation on how to make it more inclusive, how to make it more um, in, uh, representative. And then there is a the question of uh, the business model. Um, five countries producing the totality of uh, or the majority of, uh, of these technologies, uh, 200 companies producing 77% of the IPRs. And again, this is not that we are going to uh, punish these innovative businesses. <laughs> the only point is that if you have half of the world not connected, this is not sustainable. And therefore we need, or, or you have uh, a small, a small startups uh, growing and then being bought because you have these very big tech uh, firms that can also acquire any kind of development. 
We are hurting. We are even hurting innovation because we have yesterday a very interesting conversation about how much regulation can hurt innovation. The fact is that now I would say that the very high concentration and the winner takes all dynamics is hurting innovation. Monopolies hurt innovation and we are uh, really heading into this uh, situation. So the point is how do you tackle all, all that while preserving and keeping a very positive uh, message about these technologies and the response of UNESCO and the 193 countries that, that uh, signed this recommendation is that we need to frame these technologies ethically. What does that mean? That we need to put the values that we have in terms of human rights, human dignity, uh, uh, democratic values, uh, well-being of people, respect, as the frame, then you need some principles that we know them, because I was also at the OECD and the principles are very straightforward. We all know them. Accountability, transparency, explainability, proportionality, all these principles. But then you cannot just stay with the principles because the main call of the recommendation is to say, let's transform that into rules and regulations and legal infrastructure in the countries that don't have them or have them not very well developed to ensure that we have the rule of law online. And this is exactly what we did. We produced these principles, and then we didn't stop there, because of course UNESCO came, let's say, if you compare all the other institutions that produce principles for AI, we came a little bit late, because in the OECD we produced it to 2019, the Council of Europe, the European Union, of course, has been dealing with these issues for so many years. But the fact is that we, what we said was, okay, uh, let's then translate this into policy action. And I think this is one of the most important contributions that this recommendation is doing. Because we translate what we consider to be the framework into policy action in education, in communication, to avoid hate speech, for example, or misinformation, uh, in culture, to ensure diversity, because again, there is not diversity. You have only one language, or mainly one language uh, producing the majority of the issues and therefore the diversity of the world, the cultural, cultural richness of the world is also not being captured. We, we did it also on the question of the environment and I'm happy that we will have another panel. And this was actually after a, a very global, a, impressive consultation because this is UNESCO style. We don't produce the thing. It, it was 24 uh, experts all around the world representing all the countries, all the regions of the world that produced the first text we went out to a very broad consultation, 55,000 comments, and one of the outcomes of those consultations was, what about the environment? And so we have a chapter on the environment and how to align the AI developments to uh, our goals to climate transition. Gender, again, if we feel that women are not represented in several uh, areas of, of our uh, activities, uh, in AI world is just even less, even lower, than being represented in STEM. And therefore, we build all these uh, chapters and we will be uh, delivering very concretely data. Everything is about data and there is a very strong call for people to own their data, to be able to retrieve, access your data, but also delete your data, to know where is it going and how it's being used. The ethical stewardship of these things, the ethical stewardship of algorithms, the ethical stewardship of how it is developed in the whole life cycle, the research, development, deployment, the, the ethical reflection about the diversity of the teams. And this is pretty straightforward. If you don't have diverse teams, how can you control the, the, the biases and, and all the things as we know them? And then, of course, the question of the governance of these technologies and how much we need to have frameworks, legal frameworks, that will actually do something that is impressive, but we are not able yet, when something goes wrong, um, in the public or private use of AI, we have not been able to allocate directly the responsibility and accountability and redressal mechanisms. So this is where we are. I think that uh, it's, a, it's, a, it's a long journey because it's, it's going to take quite some time. I have to say that they, um, the members also ask us to do two things that we are uh, super interested in, and I invite the Aspen Institute and all of you to join us in building two tools that we are asked to do. The first one is the ethical impact assessment that can be used for the public and private sector. And the second one is the readiness assessment, because recognizing the very different level of development 
uh, we need to work with low income and developing countries so they can also not only be consumers or users because they are now, but be also developers to try to advance uh, solutions for their own challenges. And uh, I want to thank Japan because they are now working with us to implement the recommendation in uh, Africa. So this is where we are. It's a, it's a long journey. Not only it was um, approved by a standing ovation, and let me tell you that it was very interesting because me coming from the OECD, when I arrived there, I was like, how do you negotiate with 193 countries? You get a good chair <laughs> of the negotiations. And I got Ambassador uh, Adam Almula from Kuwait, who is fantastic. And then when, when the thing went uh, out and, and people got so excited about what they have achieved, that they said, we want to be the early adopters. And now I have like 30 countries, including Germany. So I'm very proud that, because Germany played a fantastic role. I have to say thanks. Thank you, Germany. Uh, but we now have a group of 25 countries also from all over the world, Brazil, Mexico, um, um, Colombia and uh, Germany and the Netherlands and the UK and Japan and Namibia and Kenya and Egypt uh, wanting to be early adopters to start working because in any case if, even if you don't do anything if you don't, you don't join this uh, this work um, you will need to report back because UNESCO has this mechanism of reporting how you implement it but this is where we are thanks a lot As you said, implementation, just, I'm very curious, how do the countries, or what are the aims to implement it now? What are the next steps and how do they have to get the um, issues back to you that you know that there is an impl implementation? Well, uh, the fact is that what we are going to do now is to put all of the, all of the, um, framework, the framework as it is now, in terms of the, of the ethical stewardship, in terms of the human rights, in terms of how we manage the data, the diversity of the teams, into some kind of uh, blueprint so that countries can assess where they are in terms of the continuum. So the, the recommendation, you can see it as a benchmark. Mm -hmm. the, the, the things that you have there is where we need to go. Uh, it was very interesting because even some countries uh, like the UK or the Netherlands, uh, when they read the recommendation, they came and said, well, I thought I was going to be on top, but I'm not. <laughs> so we need to that, that, do that assessment. I have to say again that Germany is a pioneer because uh, your National Commission for UNESCO has already launched, and I think they are now uh, discussing, uh, Mr. Lutz, uh, um, this assessment to see how much the legal infrastructure that you have, the policies that you have related to all the things that I mentioned are really uh, in line with the recommendation. Once we have that, we are going to create a group that is going to be um, our basis to bring the policy experts and do the, the peer learning, the peer pressure, uh, learning from each other. And, and of course, the recommendation also asks us to produce a lot of knowledge, analytical, because we need to, to, to document all this. And the assessment, is it about the poli politics and the regulations, or is it also going down to the companies and to the real world who is then dealing with those issues? For us, uh, it's the member states that need to uh, upscale the, the legal infrastructure. Uh, and it's very interesting that many times we hear like, uh, what do you think the, the, the companies will think? I'm like, well, I don't think that the government asks companies whether they can be uh, regulated for good. Uh, I know that, uh, that and, and, and Stormy and I have spoken so many years on how to avoid uh, really burdensome regulations. And, and yes, we need effective regulation. But I think that the time of self-regulation is over. So yes, we are going to do it in a multi-stakeholder approach because uh, the ones that know also how things work are, are the companies. But it's the government that is going to be uh, developing the, the, the infrastructure to address these issues. In any case, um, there are two parts of this recommendation. If you tell me what are the main concerns that really countries had. First, of course, is the very unbalanced uh, power distribution in the economic world, because you have the big companies, and even for the small and medium-sized enterprises, it's not easy to compete. 
um, we have the misuse of this uh, in the private sector, and first for 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 um, commercial purposes, no, the 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 maximizing uh, the money, the the money, and also but maximizing as as we heard so many times. Um, the airtime where people are connected and the impact it has to in our youth and our in our girls in our children, uh, but you also have the massive surveillance and we're so, so by by authoritarian regimes, and we're very proud that uh, the recommendation includes uh, some provisions that ban mass surveillance, ban social scoring, um, and and bring really the the debate into into a higher level. So it's for governments to implement. All the things we say is for governments, but the companies will need to rethink because they are going to be concerned. Uh, certainly. Uh, coming probably right on to the companies, um, regulation for me is one point, but in the end it's also a leadership issue. Um, how, how do we get this ethical values um, into the leadership? What do you think? How, How do we educate also old people to think on these issues, to get known from those harms or those things who really doesn't want to do us good things? So for me, it's also a leadership issue if the company is going for ethical issues or not, and then it's a business issue. Um, if you are open and you open your data and you let extract the users the data of, for example, LinkedIn or something, the possibility to extract and go to another site is much more easier or to use them without using the platform or the product. So what do you think where, where to start also on this leadership issues to, to educate? Well, I think that it, it, it's call, it calls on all these issues, and as you say, I was, I was uh, heading with uh, Danone, with Emmanuel Faber, the business for inclusive growth. This kind of mentality of the 40 big companies that joined us, not only to go for uh, corporate social responsibility, which is fine, and I would not deny that we continue to need this uh, very strong commitment, but the company saying we are really in a world that is so highly unique, unequal, that is going to hurt us. This kind of mentality, recognizing that, that the way these technologies are proceeding might create a social backlash against the technologies, which is what we want to avoid. If people start seeing that their children are being lured into radicalization, as it happened uh, in, the, in, the, in the previous years in, with the European children and France, uh, if you think that your girls are getting this uh, depression or, or uh, being targeted or, uh, of course there's going to be a backlash. So I think that it's very important for companies, as you say, to show leadership, to step up and say, no, I'm going to join this ethical, uh, and we invite the companies to join the, the, the ethical um, uh, infrastructure. We need to be careful because it's true that uh, when talking with some of the leading figures of, of, uh, that are calling for a change of the model, um, the ethical framework can also provide with um, window dressing. And that's why the recommendation is very concrete in saying the ethical framework needs to translate into respect of human rights. Because human rights are codified. <laughs> you have the, the right not to be uh, uh, molested, you have the right not to be abused, you have to freedom of thought, freedom of speech, freedom of agency. We're worried about neurotechnologies being used to, to, to uh, manipulate, which is happening. It's not, yeah. uh, it's not by chance that if you get all this uh, hate speech against uh, migrants or, or people from other uh, origins, That, that then people go out and do things that are completely unacceptable. But it's because these technologies are being misused. So yes, and I think there's so many companies that are really stepping up, because we also work with the companies. We work with the International Chamber of Commerce, and, uh, and actually we have uh, Rolls-Royce and, and many companies that are working with us to, 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 to go for this race to the top, because this is what we want with companies, and with governments to go for a race to the top. Okay. One point for me interesting, as before I give over to the audience, is the data issue. Data and algorithms. Um, a lot of the data comes in, you can say, what, what 
data comes in, it goes also out. How do we get to a gender equalized data collection, for example? I know that the data collection between women and men is completely different, you, as you told already. How do you think we can do more steps forward that we have a better data collection in the countries? I mean, in this COVID pan pandemic, I was, I was quite surprised how less Women. Our government also focused on, or we know real, we get real data where we can, as a person, then say, okay, I have the data, I can do my decision for my own, and I know. So, how do you think this data collection can be on an equalized women, men, can be better to, to have a better data for better algorithms and then also um, better artificial intelligence? Well, I would say that you first need to recognize it. You cannot just go with low quality data that is not representative, build up the, the, the developments, uh, then get uh, conceptual frameworks with the algorithm and the training of data, also biased, because you only have male-only teams. And then the outcome is like, oh my God, but what happened with Amazon? My God, they launched this recruitment tool and they did not include a single woman. And not only not include a single woman, they rejected all the CVs from women. I mean, let's not be naive. Well, let's then look at the model and let's say, okay, if it's more difficult to gather data from women, from women let's do a special effort to do it. But then I think that the quality of the data set is super important. And I don't think that this is recognized enough. Now with all these uh, scandals, we, we get to see that, uh, yes, there are cer certain groups and certain uh, people, only half of the world population, only women, no? That <laughs> might not be as, as, as uh, uh, represented, represented uh, in, the, in the information that, that uh, fits all these systems. But I think that just recognizing that. And then there is some, some trucks that comes not for the technology, but for what we know about gender equality. What about asking, uh, asking companies and asking countries that are developing the, uh, the technologies to have uh, diverse teams? What about, and this is what the recommendation is saying, we have affirmative action. We know, and I know that is, it has been difficult, but you have a quota for boards corporate posts, and we're still not yet there, but you have it. Well, let's make sure that the teams that develop the technologies always have a woman. Or a bit diverse. Or really. diverse, or somebody coming from another country, or somebody coming from another region, or from another socioeconomic. And we call also to be open to the civil society participation, to be more transparent. There is, we are not naive because there is a balance to be done. They are IPR issues. All the, all the algorithms that are, are related to IPR, and it's not that you're just going to open it up and give it to everybody, because that's not how the world works. But the fact is that this also needs to be balanced. And actually, the, the recommendation also say that when there is very strong uh, harm, people has the right to know. And people has the right to know how this was built, how the, the algorithm was built. And therefore, in the deployment, because we took a, a whole AI life cycle for this, you have the developers, and so let's make, make, make the team diverse. Let's have the team develop the whole thing. Do check-ups, because we say, oh, but then there is a black box and the machine learning, and then we don't know how it comes on. Sorry, you can put some controls. You can, you can just stop and say, how are you doing? And then uh, 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 keep up the, the whole thing. And then at the end, what is very important is that there is human determination. Because it's not like the technologies come from the outer space and tell you what to do. No. At the end, when the whole exercise is on, you need to have human judgment, <laughs> whether I use the outcomes or not. And I think that these, these kind of very easy steps should be followed. Very good. I think, looking at the time, I will open the questions for the audience. Do we have questions? Please. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, my name is Wolfgang Kleinwächter. I'm with the Global Commission on Stability in Cyberspace. And I have two questions. The first is uh, in the document, um, you have very often 
uh, reference to human dignity. In the uh, uh, EU regulatory package, uh, you have uh, you know, some applications which should be banned because it goes against human dignity, like social scoring. So social scoring was certainly an issue. And my question is, you know, uh, how you have dealt with the social scoring and what are the implications now for uh, this application? And the second question refers to uh, autonomous weapon systems. I think in the document you have also a clear paragraph that decisions on life and death should not be, should not be referred to AI systems. So we have the negotiations on laws and so they have now introduced a new category, partial autonomous weapon system. Anyhow, you know, uh, the Secretary General of the United Nations is asking for a ban of autonomous weapon systems. So uh, military issues are outside of the scope of UNESCO. But I would be interested, you know, how you have discussed this and could this document now be used to promote a ban of autonomous weapon systems? Thank you very much. Very good questions. <laughs> well, first of all, I have to say that on the social scoring, the recommendation is very clear and it's banned. It should be banned. And therefore, um, we will need to follow up on that. And I know it's difficult and I know that it's being used and I know that uh, uh, th there are whole systems that are being ba built on, on this basis, uh, but it's, it's forbidden. So we will follow up on that. On the question of weapons, um, there was a very, very intense discussion among our, our member states. And I have to say that uh, it was very interesting because sometimes in the UN system, you feel, you feel these lines of north, south, east, west, developing countries, uh, advanced countries. In the case of the, of the weapons, the, the debates were uh, really among everybody. Some countries saying it needs to be in the recommendation. We're not going to be credible if we don't ban autonomous weapons, because this is exactly is the, is the representation of the worst fears of autonomy to a system. And we are also saying that uh, this should be uh, um, taken care of very closely, how autonomous the systems can be, and also how much uh, we also say that uh, artificial intelligence should not have systems should not have legal personality. So that's another benchmark that we're proposing them. But the conclusion was that uh, first is not the mandate of UNESCO, as you say. We are not dealing with weapons, and therefore uh, we should not get into, into that. Uh, but what we got as a, as a compromise was exactly what you referred to. The fact is that whenever there is a decision related to life and death, it should be uh, human-based. Uh, and it should be uh, based on the, on the final uh, call by, by humans. So, so uh, laws and regulations and jurisprudence is always uh, advanced with this, uh, uh, no, with, this paper, with these negotiations and with these agreements. So I hope that it will be uh, serving good purposes for other settings. But that's in the hands of members. Uh, I, can, I can tell you my, my personal opinion uh, <laughs> privately. <laughs> Tommy, you had another question. Um, if, I, if I may, um, I, I do have so many questions. <laughs> um, but one question I wanted to ask you is by, about your team um, yourself um, at, at uh, UNESCO. Um, when I started at, at Espen um, and I told my husband I'm going to do a conference on AI, he was first saying, what do you know about AI? Because he is one of those people at Rolls Royce doing AI. Mm -hmm. And then um, he said uh, to me, I'm going to show you some codes now and how it works. And that was a little bit of an eye opener to me, um, that it's not just the, the, the coders um, who need to have the thinking about ethics, it's also the government people people who are talking about AI and digitalization to understand what we are really talking about. So what I wanted to ask you is, how is your team um, set up? Do you have coders? Uh, is it very diverse? Um, yeah. how, how do you learn from each other? Yeah. That's a super good question. The fact is that, uh, let me tell you that I have the strongest, the strongest team ever uh, Davna Feinholz, uh, who actually is a Mexican, even, even the name <laughs> doesn't look Mexican, but she's a fantastic lady. 
uh, and a team of uh, 15 people that are um, ethicists. They know about ethics. Uh, they were the ones that built the Declaration on Human Genome. And they are the ones that have been building up the bioethics committees in, in, in member states. Um, so they have this uh, very uh, strong knowledge on the regulatory and legal frameworks related to how to in, in interject ethics in the, in the legal processes. Uh, but you're right, uh, no great expertise in terms of the algorithms and the data. Of course, uh, you, you, of cor UNESCO is not only based on the, on the secretariat. What we did was exactly to bring 24 fantastic experts, but it was different, you know, because it's not about coding. Coding you learn, that we learn. And I have Maria Gracia Squicciarini who joined my team as my executive officer, and she's top-notch coder, and she has been uh, looking at innovation and patents and the, the data that I gave you about the 77% is hers. Uh, but that's not the point. The point is to have a multidisciplinary, a more inclusive debate, because if you have just the technical people talking to the technical people, this is what we have, because it has been technically driven. You need to bring, you know what? We brought the philosophers. We brought the sociologists, we brought the psychologists to talk to each other in these 24 global fantastic experts, actually led by Emma Rodkamp Bloom, who is a, a professor in South Africa. She was the chair of the expert groups. And I have to tell you that yes, they have to check with the technologist uh, how much this is possible, how this can be framed. But, but the conversation actually should be the other way around is not about the technology. It's about how the technology is going to help with our own challenges as humans, and how they're gonna help us to have more inclusive societies, to deal with inequalities, to deal with climate change, to deal, and for that, you don't need the coders. <laughs> Sorry, coders. No, we will, we will be, we will we will be need them relying on them, of course. <laughs> to translate this into something that is feasible, we need them. But it's, but it's bigger than that. It's, it's changing the nature of the conversation. Isn't it to bring those issues to the whole society, from those who use it to those who program it, but also the leaders that we come to the question, how we come to this thinking that, it's, that we want to do it for good and not for, not for bad? No, but the, the fact is that it's everybody, because AI is pervasive. And ethics is about all of us. And the fact is that, uh, yes, the, the developers should have this framework, but also the users. <laughs> And that's why in the recommendation, we also have the question of education. Mm. And, and, and UNESCO is the leading agency for education, and we are looking at how to uh, instill this critical thinking in this massive amount of information that we receive. How you critically can determine which is good source, which is bad source, which is uh, something that you can trust, and which is something that you cannot trust. And therefore, it's for, it's for everybody. A very good point of Stormy. The fact is that how do we ensure, and you said it, uh, Eva, the question of, uh, of, of government capacities. We don't have them. Yesterday I was listening to your debates. There are many good people in the governments, but when you want to attract more people to help you to build up the systems in the governments, but also the legal, the legal infrastructure, the fact is that you cannot compete with the private sector because the data scientists and all these uh, fantastic uh, experts, uh, no. You need to bring them almost, and yesterday was your, your German representative who said, we need to bring them because they have the vocation of the public service. And so I said, yes, please, <laughs> because we cannot compete. Uh, but I, I'm sure that we will have more and more people uh, really providing their expertise to these very important points. Is there any more questions in the audience? Please. Janet Lieberherr, ich habe ein Privatinstitut für Innovation. Uh, sorry, Janet Lieberherr, uh, I founded a private institute for innovation culture, and I come from a psychological perspective on, on different uh, things concerning um, IA, um, AI. And uh, my question is uh, congratulations first to have uh, 193 
countries um, coming together to agree on basic human values. Um, which country did not sign and are there reasons why they didn't? Well, we have a big country that didn't sign because they are not members of UNESCO, which is the US. But they participated because they were uh, always, uh, as observers, represented. And I was very proud to see that uh, in one of the conversations, the assistant secretary for um, uh, IOS, she said, we need to be in that table. Uh, and we will be working with them because we also work with uh, many institutions and many experts uh, in the US, um, but, uh, but we will need to work with them. In any case, I can tell you that it's very interesting because um, when we were finishing the, the, the whole negotiation, there were some countries telling me, yes, but you cannot impose this framework to developing countries because you will need, they will need to be uh, building all this infrastructure instead of developing the technologies. And, and that gave me a hint that uh, if you are in the commercial race or the geopolitical race to be the leader and the, uh, you will notice that UNESCO was there because we now have all the countries, the developing countries going to adopt the framework. And we're starting, as I said, working with many countries in Africa. And therefore, if you are a, a seller of the technologies or leader in the technologies, you will find that the, that the new construction will be based in this recommendation. So I'm, I'm very, I'm, I'm really sure that everybody is going to be engaging one way or another. We have, yeah. Um, I must say I am a little bit surprised by your comment about not having the coders in the, as part of the conversation. I say this because I am professor of computer science, so I am from the side of artificial intelligence and, and, and algorithms and so on. And I think they must be part of the conversation because they have to hear what it is said. Otherwise, you won't have in them thinking about ethical aspects because it comes from outside. It is exogenous, they don't deal with that. And my experience is in the last years, there is a need for people coming from the technical side to learn about these implications. All they do is, all they want to do is improve technology, develop the algorithms and so on. And they don't have maybe the knowledge or the, the capacity or maybe the time or maybe, I don't know, to, to get or to dive into those aspects that are now the most important ones. And this is why I would say maybe they cannot contribute as a legal, a legal person, ethical uh, uh, expert or philosophers uh, to the framework and so on, to the implications worldwide and, and so on. But they have the other side that is actually the one that is bringing such issues uh, in the society and in the conversations. So in my experience, in my opinion, they should be there in order to hear, in order to learn what they must learn what we must learn in order to come together and to go into the same direction. Otherwise, we will have both sides disconnected, and I think this should not be the case in the yeah, mid-term future, long-term future, because we will have technologies for a long time. And some, as I suppose, that the framework and all the things will change with changes in society, in our um, yeah, uh, moral uh, stance, with the development we have in politics and so on. This will change according to how we change as humans, as uh, societies, as countries. But technologies will be there in the future and will have a more and more deep impact in our lives. So I think they must be there to learn. We should be there, there to learn, to contribute in some way, but especially to learn from those things, not after regulation is put uh, in, in practice, but in the way, in the path to this regulation too. 
what I think. No, I'm, I'm actually very happy that you're uh, doing that question because uh, uh, I never said that they are not part of it. Uh, I said that uh, it should be broader. Of course they are. They should be. You are completely right. I think that if, if, if they are not part of the group, part of the conversation, uh, we might get it wrong from the technological point of view. What I'm saying is that it's not about only the technology, because what is happening is that we are, have been in this race to, to, to be the leaders in the technological front without due consideration of these other aspects. And the second part of what you say is what I really agree, because it's not about uh, uh, signaling the technologies because how they can be producing these things that are harmful. No, it's not for them. They just go and do what they know how to do, which is to create solutions through the technological developments. Uh, the only point is how do we bring more ethical thinking whenever these things are being developed, which I think has been lacking in many instances. So it's, it's, I would say that, yes, we want the coders to become more uh, ethics uh, uh, savvy and the ethical experts to understand how the code and all these things work. Uh, so they go together. And we had, we had uh, uh, coders and we had, uh, actually I brought also uh, three new members of my team that, that know these things. And it's fantastic because then they can tell you, no, 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 let me tell you how this works. <laughs> and then you see, okay. But you know, the fact is that the, the technologies don't happen in a vacuum neither. And this is what we're, we're saying. We're saying we need a, 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 an environment, an ecosystem that will uh, dedicate more efforts, more funds, more incentives to produce AI technologies that help us address our challenges. And this is exactly what we're doing there. We would say, be aware of the impact of some AI developments that uh, just one single model will, uh, to run one single model takes 125 trips equals, no? you know this figure, 125 trips from New York to, uh, to Beijing. Uh, just be aware. And then, of course, as we do with climate, if, if Rockstar, uh, uh, the, this uh, big investor comes out and say, I'm not going to invest in, in, in companies that are uh, investing in coal or fossil fuels, you change the incentives. This is what we want to create, because I'm an economist. I know how to use these uh, uh, instruments. It's not to impose top-down without understanding the nature of the, of the, of the, of the technological e ecosystem is to align that ecosystem to our values and to we want to get out. And it's, it concerns us all. Let me tell you also that for the 55,000 uh, questions, uh, uh, comments that we received from the global consultation, we suddenly finished with 55,000 comments for the text. And we're like, what are we gonna do? Well, we use artificial intelligence. <laughs> and Irkai, the- Hopefully the, for good. <laughs> for good. And, and Irkai, who is the, this fantastic institute in, in Slovenia, a category two center of UNESCO on artificial intelligence, they brought all the experts to, to, to boil down these uh, comments into the text, into something that, uh, that made sense. So it's, I think it has to be super inclusive. That's, that's the point. I think it was a very good final statement. The time is over and I'm very unhappy because I have several more questions. <laughs> but thank you very much, Gabriel, for these wonderful insights and this new latest news. And um, please enjoy the further conference. Thank you so much, Eva. It has been my pleasure. <laughs> thank you so much. Welcome back um, to our Aspen Artificial Intelligence Conference 2021. And it is a great pleasure um, that we now look at one of the really important areas, application areas of AI, um, climate sustainability. And um, it is a particular pleasure that um, we have a very special moderator today, one of our very dear um, Aspen partners. Um, we have done a lot together on media literacy, um, on uh, influencers, um, you, on AI. You have been with us um, a lot and guiding us on the way. Um, and um, I would like to introduce to you Veran Meyer, and you are head of digital policy division of the um, Heinrich 
Böll Foundation and also one of the supporters of the um, Artificial Intelligence Conference of AI. We are all extremely excited. And with this, I hand over and the floor is yours. Thank you, Stormy. And also from my side, a very warm welcome to our panel discussion on burden or benefit environmental sustainability in the age of AI. As Stormy said it already, I'm head of the Digital Policy Division at the Heinrich Böll Foundation, which is an agency for green ideas and projects. Uh, our primary task is political education and advocacy in Germany and in our 34 offices uh, abroad. One question we've been uh, dealing with for quite some time now is uh, the role that digital technologies such as artificial intelligence can play in uh, the fight against the climate crisis. Um, on the one hand, um, it could support climate change mitigation goals and adaptation, but on the other, other hand, it could also um, be a driver of global resource consumption and emission, uh, depending on the types of applications and the circumstances of their deployment. Today, we will take a, a look together at uh, the various factors that will play a role in shaping the actual outcome if AI will be, in fact, a burden or a benefit for environmental sustainability. We have a great number of uh, uh, excellent guests here participating in the discussion today. I'd like to um, start welcoming our guests here today in Berlin. Um, Anna Christmann, uh, she is a member of the German Bundestag since 2017 of the Green Party. She has been spokesperson in, on innovation and technology policy and civic engagement. I'd also like to welcome Grisha Bayer. He is a research group leader at the Institute for Advanced Sustainability Studies in Potsdam. And his research group, Digitalization and Impacts on Sustainability, explores the effects of digitization on industrial sustainability, global value chains, and international cooperation. Thank you for uh, joining us here in Berlin. And now I'd like to turn to our um, virtual panel and start with um, Benedetta Brivini. Um, Benedetta is an author, journalist, and media reformer, as well as an associate professor for communication at the University of Sydney. This year, she published a book on Is AI Good for the Planet? Alexander Britz is head of uh, digital Head of Digital Business Transformation and AI at Microsoft, where he's especially responsible for a division on AI and sustainability. Cécile Hué is a Deputy Head of the Unit Robotics, Artificial Intelligence, Innovation and Excellence at the European Commission. This um, unit uh, funds and assists beneficial robotics and AI developments within Europe. Um, Vladimir Ragmanin is Assistant Director and General Director General and Regional Representative for Europe and Central Asia at the Food and Agriculture Organization of the United Nations. Uh, thank you very much for joining us today in this discussion. Um, during the session, feel, please feel always free to uh, ask questions via live stream or the Q&A tool, and uh, we will take 15 minutes at the end of our discussion here to answer your question. Okay, so let's start now with a um, very quick warm-up question, um, which picks up our conference theme. You have each 60 seconds, and really 60 seconds, to uh, <laughs> answer the question. So the question is, what contribution can AI make to adapting to climate change and increasing resilience? And let's start with our virtual panel um, with um, Benedetta Brivini, please. Well, certainly um, there is an opportunity, but the major um, hurdle that we have is what do we really mean by AI? So if we define AI as um, commonly defined as the ability um, of machines to just mimic um, the human cognitive function, then we have a problem in dealing with environmental question. If we really are able, as the European Commission recently did, to define AI, in fact, as a collection of technologies that combine data, algorithms, computer power, data capitalism, data extraction, then we can answer this question. So I would say that it's really crucial to start by understanding specifically what we mean by AI application in this context. Thank you. Thank you. This was really quick. Uh, we continue with uh, Vladimir, please. Uh, thank you. I actually represent food and agriculture organizations. So I would say that use of digital, digital technologies and artificial intelligence make agriculture more efficient, resilient, and sustainable. 
as well as more environmental friendly, enhancing climate change mitigation, while at the same time adapting agriculture to negative impacts of climate change in order to provide food security for all. So I am very positive about it. Thank you. Thank you. And uh, Cécile? Hello, good morning, everybody. So uh, I would say that since AI is the tool as well to optimize everything, so optimization of any resources we have, you just mentioned agriculture, but anything, any production, if you can optimize the request and the demand, you limit the waste. Optimization of energy, optimization of any resource we have will help in uh, decreasing also our carbon footprint. Of course, we don't have to be blind to to the use that the, the technology needs resource to run. And we have to fight both fronts. So using the technology to help us, but also making sure that we improve the technology so that it is uh, greener. So that's what we are doing in the commission. We are focusing and, and, and pushing greener AI and AI for green for the twin digital and, and uh, green transition. Thank you, Cecile. And uh, Alexander, please. Sure, good morning. Um, to be honest, I'd rather focus on, uh, you know, fighting climate change than adopting to it. Um, but, you know, we certainly come to that in a second uh, uh, in, in the discussion. But if you're looking at uh, the adoption, I, you know, I, I think, and you look at AI and, you know, depending on the definition, but in a nutshell, AI can help us to understand fairly complex ecosystems and, and also help us to sort of predict future developments. So in other words, you know, sort of allowing us to better plan for the future. And of course, it's an enormous amount of data and it's an enormous challenge. But when we talk about adopting, then I would say AI allows us to be prepared to, for what's going to happen. Thank you. And Anna, please. Yeah, I would even uh, go one step further and say um, I can't imagine how we can achieve our goals in climate protection in the next years without the use of AI because I think it's fundamental for the energy vendor for many fields um, that are in front of us and I think AI is one crucial tool um, to make this all successful. Thank you. And Trisha. Um, I agree with many things that have been said uh, from the other speakers. I go with you that we need AI to optimize the existing sectors, make them more efficient and have less impact on the climate. But I definitely also go with Alexander. I think the most specific part about AI is the calculation power. So we should take advantage of that power to calculate, analyze and maybe permute different scenarios what is going to happen in the situation of uh, climate change that is going to happen and then we can prepare adequately for that. Mm -hmm. Okay, yeah. thank you uh, for this uh, flashlight round. Uh, you all stuck to the 60 seconds, uh, uh, more or less, so thank you for that. Um, I would actually like to expand on um, what has been said. Uh, let's have a look at how AI uh, innovations can contribute to achieving more sustainability. And I'd like to start with you, Anna. Um, because you're the expert, as I said, for technology and innovation policy in the Green Group. And uh, this summer you published a paper on um, uh, using data for change. From a green perspective, what exactly can AI and data achieve in the fight against climate crisis? And which are the um, areas and sectors you consider the to be the most, um, to have the greatest potential? I think you said already energy vendor. Yeah, um, of course. And I, and I think uh, the energy vendor is one of the most important projects we have in front of us and uh, where AI can really be helpful and, and more helpful than we've been using it before. I, I mean, until now, we don't have it um, in, uh, in all areas we could. Um, I mean, beginning from uh, one specific windcraft uh, uh, where you could optimize it to, to the weather uh, forecast and, and make it more efficient, like the one single uh, power plant, uh, if it's so to say. And then, of course, to bring them all together. I mean, uh, every extra windcraft uh, uh, power plant it will um, need more optimization for the whole net. And, and that will be a task where we will need AI to have a, a very efficient um, framework of all these different types of uh, energy protection we will have um, in the future. We will have uh, many more different uh, ways uh, to get energy uh, and uh, not only uh, a few big 
um, power plants. And um, that uh, makes a big change. And there we really need digital tools to optimize this whole setting and um, to make it a success. And I think there we are only at the beginning to really mm -hmm. make use of all the potential and also of data that comes from um, specific um, cities uh, where we can see, okay, where are the peaks of energy use and uh, what does it mean for the whole uh, energy net. Uh, these are all questions where AI will be extremely helpful and, and I'm very happy that we have some projects uh, already going on uh, in this direction mm -hmm. where people try to, to bring these data to, together and um, to really model uh, AI um, tools uh, on the basis of these data and I think that we will need more of that. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Um, Vladimir, we had now um, an example um, uh, from, from this area, but um, as you said, you work on agriculture, food security. Can you maybe provide us um, with a few best practice examples of how we can use AI in these sectors to achieve more sustainability? Yeah, sure. <clears throat> First of all, we have, if we talk about food security, we have a very big task. Uh, the year 2050, around 10 billion people to be fed with healthy food, uh, to be provided with a healthy food. So, and the second task for us, for you and organizations, is sustainable development goals. And that means 2030, zero hunger. It's, it's a big challenge. It's a big challenge and we need to uh, make better efforts to achieve it. So in order to achieve that, we need to use all possible innovation and technologies. And definitely AI and digitalization is in the minds of now, all the people working in agriculture and in the environment. Actually, in FAO, in Food and Agriculture Organization, we established the new international platform for digital food and agriculture, where we produce the platform for the discussions. And we have very specific, talking about organization, we have very specific uh, use of uh, digital technology and uh, artificial intelligence um, where we follow the agriculture water productivity of uh, Africa and the Near East. Emerging signs of droughts around the world, small scale changes in forests, and to detect full armyworm damage. It's very practical things that we do as an organization, but of course we need to work on the ground and uh, um, artificial intelligence is absolutely essential in today's world for weather prediction, just forecasting uh, robotics in agriculture, and of course supply chain connections. It's, it's very, very important because during the COVID we saw that uh, these supply chains have been destroyed in many cases. We need to make a seamless connection and uh, digital technologies will assist us uh, to do it. So there are many uh, issues that we can contribute practically, but there is also a larger kind of social impacts we, we need to follow. And we need to try to overcome inequalities in use of digital technology. We need to uh, overcome in gender imbalance in using technology. We know that young women in rural areas have less access to these technologies. And maybe not being um, exhaustive, uh, one more point, which we all have in the European Union, it's also an issue. When we try to connect national digital platforms, it's always a very sensitive issue. And we need to work on that, how to provide, how to keep the national sovereignty on those issues, but at the same time, make it useful for the people. Final point in this regard, in order to be successful, we need to work together and we need to work with the private business, we need to work with civil society and of course with the governments. So I'm sorry I don't want to monopolize the time, but that's the thoughts that are coming from our agricultural work on this. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Vladimir. Uh, this has been really insightful. I think we, uh, we will come back to um, a few of the things you said already. Let's stick a bit to the, um, to the different use case, because we have uh, lots of expert here, experts here, um, as for instance, Grisha. <laughs> uh, and so you joined uh, the IASS in 2014, and you worked there on a um, project called uh, Sustainability Aspects of Industry 4.0. And um, I'd like to know if uh, you consider the digitizing network industrial production an area which can be in which AI-driven technologies can be beneficial for sustainability, and if so, how does it work? 
Well, I think it can have an impact to improve the footprint of the manufacturing industry. Um, I think one point that's quite crucial is optimizing the energy consumption in large factories, for example, like orchestrating the way big robot fleets work together um, in a sense that they don't produce as quickly as possible, that they, but they produce what is required with as little energy as possible. Um, another point could be that AI can help with uh, dismantling strategies, finding ways how to use these uh, resources that can be taken from products that have come to the end of life phase. Uh, and there's also another way, like bringing together uh, people who could use this secondhand material, let's say, and with uh, other corporations that have that as uh, waste yeah, products they can't use anymore. Um, but I would go even one way beyond that. I wouldn't just optimize the uh, manufacturing industry through AI, but I would try uh, to couple the manufacturing industry and other industries with the energy sector. So what, what you have said, I think that's such a complex task, um, identifying where energy um, is used and where uh, energy might be um, existing but can't be used uh, at the same time and bringing these demands together like a big demand response management system um, arching over sectorial borders that is really a super difficult task and I think that's too uh, complex for, for human beings or standard uh, simulation tools so that's really one point where AI can help a lot. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Um, Alexander, you um, explained already a little bit what you're doing at Microsoft. Um, more and more companies are turning to AI um, when it comes to su sustainability. I saw that Microsoft um, wants to be carbon negative by 2030. How um, do, do you actually measure this? Um, do you also account, for instance, for the emissions by the end user? And uh, what role does AI play in this? Uh, an enormous role, um, and you know, I would underline what Anna Christman was saying earlier. Uh, without AI, it would work. Um, so it, it is an essential part. And you know, from from a Microsoft point of view, we really believe that AI is one of the key technologies to help us uh, to reach our sustainability goals. Now, in terms, of what are we doing? Uh, in, yes, we measure. We pretty much measure everything we can, uh, and you know, we. We, uh, I would say we're not yet perfect, but we have made uh, significant progress over the last couple of years. And when you look into uh, what are we measuring, uh, we are really starting from uh, you know, the, the design of a product to the end of life, so the entire product life cycle that you want. So that includes also the use of our products. So in other words, you know, we have um, you know, products like laptops or gaming consoles and, and all that. And uh, we are also calculating the uh, overall energy consumption over the lifetime of the product into our emissions. And um, that is certainly something where, you know, we have also learned over time, to be honest. Uh, in, Ten years ago, we, we, we haven't done that. Uh, now we're doing it because, you know, we, part of our learning journey, if you want, has been it is part of our, our responsibility. If we wouldn't produce these products, you know, they wouldn't consume any energy. And if you now look into Microsoft, uh, our biggest uh, challenge really is all the emissions from our supply chain, you know, from, from the scope three emissions as, as they are called. So this is the vast majority of, of, uh, of the activity that, you know, does uh, the existence of Microsoft actually, you know, mean in terms of emissions. Uh, just to give you an idea, uh, the entire Microsoft universe, our own, you know, existence, if you want, uh, for those who know the term scope one, scope two, uh, uh, and scope two, uh, scope one, scope two, is about 300,000 uh, 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 tons of um, of uh, uh, carbon every year. The supply chain is 11 million, so it's 300,000 ourselves to the supply chain. The scope three is 11 million. So that is the the, the the ballpark we are talking about, and therefore, you know, we need to measure. We need to have the transparency and. Uh, AI really helps in, in, in the whole thing. I mean, if you look into, as I said before, the, the, the whole prediction part, you know, what is going to happen. We have, for example, applied AI years ago in our own buildings, and we have found uh, energy consumption uh, savings of about 20, 25% year over year through the analysis through AI. And, you know, I, I could go on and, you know, just to, to underline uh, what was said earlier. I mean, we are, we are talking at the end of the day, one of the core capabilities of AI 
is the whole topic of optimization. And you now can think of the optimized production, we increase efficiencies, we lower energy consumption, we reduce downtime, uh, we optimize logistics, uh, we minimize traffic, all that is part of, of the AI capabilities. And therefore, as I said, you know, it's a, it's a very center stone of, of the activities that we're actually having, yes. Thank you. Um, Benedetta, um, you, um, we heard already from a few examples now, and uh, um, Alexander also um, uh, sh showed this um, by pointing at, at this whole debate on efficiency, optimization. Um, I think transparency was also an interesting keyword. Um, what do you think about this whole debate on um, the potential of AI um, for achieving more sustainability? I saw you saying um, that AI is used as a, a soul to us, as a magic wand. Um, how, does, um, how does AI also impact uh, the climate crisis? Thank you. Well, I mean, the reason why I provided the definition at the very beginning of this conversation was that uh, very often definitions of, of AI have this sort of magic feeling to it, right? AI is going to save the planet, AI is going to uh, sort out chronic diseases, AI is going to save us. And this is a typical um, mythical thinking around technology that we saw historically since the beginning of every technology. And we see, of course, the ideology of the Silicon Valley being absolutely absorbing these ideas. But what sometimes, you know, this conversation is obfuscating is the idea that actually um, AI, and this is actually coming out uh, from the white paper on artificial intelligence by the European Commission, so the idea that AI relies on technologies. It relies on machines, on infrastructures that intrinsically deplete scarce resources. And of course, they deplete these scarce resources in the production, consumption, and disposal, therefore the entire production chain. So, you know, what Alexander was enlightening was that, of course, that's the major challenge they have also in, you know, by the big digital lords in the West and also the digital lords in the East, um, try really to reduce the carbon emission. But then the, the interesting thing about us trying to think of the materiality of AI and stopping just thinking of AI as a tool to save us um, is crucial here because like AI, and if you want to read the book, you know, I actually spent quite some time trying to explain it also in lay, um, lay member of society terms, right? So AI contributes to the climate crisis at least in four ways. Now, I mean, every computer scientist and uh, every uh, person on the panel knows that the most uh, you know, relevant uh, way in which AI can be actually detrimental to the, uh, to the climate crisis is the fact that we need computer power to start the algorithm. And we know already, because you know, um, this has been already debated, um, the level of incredible um, uh, carbon footprint uh, of the train of an algorithm. And of course, I could give you a very quick example because I spent quite some time trying to identify, you know, how, how can I explain this to the public? And we have a great study coming from the University of Massachusetts Armrest that showed that just to train a very common, you know, for example, a Google Translate, very common um, AI application, you need something like 284 thousand um, kilograms of CO2. Now, of course, the engineers would tell me, okay, I know this is absolutely um, not something we can generalize, but if we compare this to a very simple flight between London and Rome, the carbon emission would be 235 kilograms compared to the 284,000 kilograms that we need to train an algorithm. But this is just the first way in which AI, you know, is of course impacting on the climate crisis. The second, the second way is of course we know the data centers. So AI rely on data to work, and uh, and of course the data centers and this is you know something that Alexander was highlighting are one of the biggest problem of the major providers. I call them the digital lords just to uh, explain their incredible power, political, economic, and ideological. Um, and and of course then you see that a major struggle you know to make data centers sustainable is the starting point of this conversation. Um, and I can see that corporations are moving forward, trying to reduce. But, you know, let's not forget that globally, globally, the entire production of energy and electricity is based 64% on fossil fuels. Now, we know from the COP26 
that we have only 10 years to reduce and we need to reduce our pledges and our carbon emissions, we need to reduce them by 50%. Now, this has become really an emergency and data centers and the IT, the whole IT carbon footprint is on a trajectory to be something like 14% of the entire carbon footprint in the world. So these are data that we should really consider and think about when we think and we say, oh, we just embrace it and we are sorting out our problems, we sort out the pandemic. And I'll give another example. So I mentioned the two ways in which AI is impacting on the climate crisis, but there are two more. The other major problem we have is with e-waste and is with the disposal because all the devices that are powered by AI, of course, will need to be disposed of. And what's happening here is really, of course, that we are sending these highly toxic you know, devices and, and, um, you know, and that we discard them very often in countries in the global south that are already recovering from you know, years and years of colonialism. And so we are, of course, like also violating you know, land rights because we are polluting these areas you know we are making the water impossible for these populations indigenous population to drink this water bangladesh is astonishing you know as a as a, as a country where that is used for this type of waste and this is the third way and the fourth way which is something that really worries me because it escaped also, you know, the very recent uh, draft of the regulation for AI that has been just discussed by the European Commission, for example. Like, while we all agree that we should be banning AI-powered um, weapons, and, this, and there is an international uh, consensus on this, we never talk about banning AI applications to keep drilling and making the oil and gas discoveries more efficient. So what's happening now is that all of the digital lords, all the major tech giants are investing massively, including Microsoft with Azure, for example. So they're making major deal to make the drilling more efficient. And now, I mean, I think that the conversation, which is a very important conversation, should bring together climate scientists with tech uh, policy people and really try to start with the first question, which is an environmental justice question. So we cannot just focus on a limited you know, ethical uh, framework, but we really need to embrace a broader framework and start designing AI with these issues in mind. We are living in an emergency. It's a climate emergency. We know this. And so we need to act and make sure because, you know, I mean, sometimes we might think, well, you know, AI to reach a sustainability go a sustainable goals means greening AI. That is not true. There are very different things. And AI, because it's a, it's a material technology, because it relies on data, because it relies on infrastructures, is intrinsically extractive. And so we need to say it and start with that, you know, um, you know framework and environmental justice framework in mind. Uh, thank you, Benedetta. You mentioned already the um, uh, commission. I see that uh, Alexander is uh, raising his hand. So before I continue, I'd like to uh, give the word to you, Alexander. Thank you so much. Um, and, you know, I don't want to just, you know, uh, uh, take some of the arguments of, of, of Benedetta away. But, you know, I think in terms of data, it's important that we, we have the same view on it. Uh, when you look at these numbers in terms of carbon emissions of data centers. I think what we have to look at, either we measure it or we rather talk about the energy consumption. Uh, why do I say that? When you look at you know, data centers, the question is, what is a data center? If you look, for example, at all the studies, and I've read a lot of them, uh, when you look at you know, big data centers, hyperscale data centers like the ones we have, and some others, of course, also have, uh, we are talking about in CO2, so a carbon reduction compared to local data centers in the range of 80 to 90 percent. So that's the first one. Uh, the second one that you have to look at is, you know, how are these data actually actually run? If you look and we, we are trying to be as transparent as possible, uh, and I said, you know, we, we, we show our uh, emissions in scope one, two, three, and all sort of details. When you look at, you know, the, the calculation that people, people typically do, which is, you know, the uh, the 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 assumption that you would take energy from the local grid compared to what we actually do because we are running on 100% uh, renewable electricity, there's a, a reduction of another 95%. So in that terms, you know, it is really difficult to say, well, this is the CO2 footprint in general of a data center. So that, that's one. The second one uh, is 
just on, on waste. And yes, that's that's an enormously important topic. And you know, I don't want to uh, you know take that away. On the other hand, you have to also look at you know companies like ourselves, for example. We have set ourselves a target for 2030 to be a zero waste company. To you know, all our data centers are now you know reworked in the sense that they will become circular centers. So in other words, the hardware will be dismantled at the spot, and at least 90% of you know the waste will actually be brought into the the whole uh, cycle. So in that sense. I fully agree it is an issue and we need to tackle that and you know we but in terms of you know having data there and saying well this is we got to be specific and you know that that's the only point I really want to make on that. Uh, thank you, Alexander. Maybe just um, uh, coming back to that, um, before I turn to you, Cecilia, I'd just like to answer, uh, ask uh, Anna a quick question um, on this issue of uh, uh, data centers. It has been said that they um, can be also, can eat up a lot of energy, even become a driver of, um, uh, of climate change. Where do you think we need um, regulation, but where do we also need incentives? Yeah, I think in a way, uh, the question of data centers is quite easy because uh, every data center can possibly uh, be run uh, climate neutral uh, today. I mean, uh, there is no technical question that it's not possible to run a data center um, without any form of uh, carbon emissions. Um, so I think there is a point of regulation, and that's also what we want to do in the new government. We have it in our new uh, contract for the coalition, uh, for the Ampel coalition, that we want to secure that we have uh, from 2027 on uh, only climate neutral data centers uh, in Germany, that uh, every new data center will be climate neutral from 2027 on in Germany. That is the regulation that we want to have here, and I think that should uh, more or less be the case uh, for uh, Europe at least and uh, hopefully um, for the whole world because I think that shouldn't be the issue. You can use renewable energies and you can use the heat that is um, coming from the computation processes and all this is not the case in many data centers we have today And um, but it's technically possible. So I think, uh, yes, we should regulate it and yes, we should just uh, uh, secure that every new data center is uh, climate, uh, climate neutral. Thank you. Um, now, Cecile, uh, the European Commission has been mentioned twice. Uh, Anna mentioned already the European level. Um, I would like you to uh, comment a bit on Benedetta's uh, points, um, the, these various factors that uh, how um, AI impacts also the uh, climate crisis. You mentioned in your uh, statement at the beginning um, all these uh, benefits AI also can have. How does um, the EU Commission assess this conflict in general? How, like, how can we um, build a bridge between AI and sustainability? Right. Um, so actually, uh, so we have different types of action. My unit is responsible for uh, the uh, the programs uh, supporting research, innovation, and and the uptake of the technology, and we work of course closely with the uh, the colleagues developing the uh, the regulatory framework as well. But in terms of uh, uh, pushing the technology in improving its um, its robustness, its accuracy, but also uh, reducing the uh, uh, the energy uh, use. So we do research to to uh, uh, improve the uh, the resource efficiency. So using more efficiently data. So uh, also uh, using architecture which are less uh, consuming, or uh, optimizing the whole uh, uh, the the whole uh, use of resource when when you develop and when you use use our algorithm and also running uh, developing chips which are uh, less uh, energy consuming so that's that's on the technical part where we don't think we have solved the problem still need research and development needs to be done to attack the problem as well from that front and then on the other side we uh, have a number of actions or our unit has been working in um, in robotics for many, many years. And many of the examples I've heard today about agriculture. So we, we've used robots for precision agriculture and drastically, hopefully completely remove the uh, the need of using pesticide, uh, reducing also uh, the, the, the use of, of water and waste at any any moment in the, um, in, in the agriculture, uh, in the agri-food, the, agri uh, the agri-food sector. In manufacturing as well, 
scale. We are uh, supporting uh, manufacturing, zero defect production, also towards zero waste and zero emission, but also yeah, the whole uh, optimization of the chain. So if you better anticipate the, uh, the the needs, the demand, and you optimize also the production to reduce the waste. We see so many manufacturing production plants who have to throw away uh, uh, goods because they, they, uh, they're not used. So, and also another thing which I don't think has been mentioned today in terms of uh, also sustainability and, and, and uh, 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 be also more, more robust to, to change into crisis. It's also uh, manufacturing. You could bring the manufacturing closer to the use. So reshoring some manufacturing and having manufacturing plants which can also adapt to the local needs and, and to be uh, uh, more tailored to the needs. Uh, and of course, the uh, in manufacturing, we uh, we want also to uh, also use uh, the, the manufacturing for circular economy. So we mentioned, we heard uh, dismantling and then reusing uh, uh, the, uh, the materials is something that we are um, we are supporting so both from the the research development and deployment so we have a number of of activities and, and a very important aspect is to really build an ecosystem around that. So we work with the community uh, with that. So we have built a PPP, public-private partnership, where on the private side, you have all the actors from research, from industry, uh, and from the civil society to really define the strategy. How should we use uh, AI for the benefit of the society? And then on the other front, we work with the member states in the in the context of the coordinated plan on AI uh, to, to make sure that, again, we work together to be more efficient in addressing those aspects. And one of the, so, so we have a number of actions where we work together with the member states and uh, in the updated coordinated plan with them, uh, we have highlighted a number of strategic sectors where we want to work together to, to be more efficient. And one of them is to bring AI to play for climate ch change and environment. So, so then uh, we have a number of action. There is also the, uh, the, the, the program Destination Earth, where we want to model uh, the, uh, what's happening on the planet or effect on the planet in order to also take better decision policy making, which is more uh, better informed, uh, make prediction and adapt. But I agree also that we better act rather than react. So uh, we should first uh, try to do our best uh, to make sure that we don't have to react to those uh, uh, bad situations, but uh, uh, rather prevent them with all the tools that, that we have. Of course, we are also working on energy, on mobility to optimize the, the transport system to be more efficient and uh, less energy consuming as well. So we have a vast number of action to support uh, or will to really have the green and digital transition. They go hands in hands and one will not go uh, without the other. Um, thank you. Yeah, I think you raised a, a number of really um, uh, interesting and excellent points. Um, I think this uh, involvement of the different stakeholders is something that um, we can talk about in a minute, which is really interesting. Uh, I just saw that uh, Benedetta was uh, raising uh, her hand, I think, after the data center uh, question. So maybe if you could just quickly answer. Yeah, because I'm, um, I'm always um, like uh, trying to find solution, you know, together with also major corporations. And of course, one of the biggest problems that we face is data centers being opened in countries that are very, or areas, regions that are very desertic. And, uh, and this is something that I think really like big corporations should consider not to, to stop doing because like if you read even uh, some of the most common, uh, um, you know, press releases, for example, from uh, DeepMind, but also, you know, uh, Microsoft, you will see that one of the biggest problem of data centers is water cooling and it's really really the consumption of water and yet we are still seeing even this year um, big 
big corporations opening huge data centers in uh, countries or in regions or states like Nevada. And we know that Microsoft is trying to do its best and it's, you know, operating with, you know, all these new um, kind of technology that are supposed to help with this. But, you know, the question is really, do we have time for all of this? Or is not about time that we use the political tools to actually say, well, probably in a, in a time of a climate emergency where the pledges and where the carbon emissions need to be lower of 50% in only 10 years, is this still the case to keep opening big data centers in desertic areas or can we actually find, because you know, I mean, some of the best innovative ideas that are coming to achieve sustainability and green in AI are coming from the tech workers movements and are coming from these tech workers movements that are growing from the grassroots in major um, tech corporations. And I think we should listen to these ideas because they are really experiencing and understanding the major issues. So that's, that's another idea. But I also think that it's important that we remember that we're, we cannot just refer to the data centers to green AI. We need to consider the incredible and massive energy that is consumed by the computational powers that is needed for the training. And the neural networks, um, the greening of neural networks is another major challenge that I want to put there because we have excellent speakers and I want an answer. Thank you. <laughs> Uh, thank you. Um, sorry, Alexander. I know you 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 really want to uh, <laughs> uh, now um, make a point, uh, probably on that. I just like to um, to come back to Vladimir because you raised a really interesting um, issue at the beginning in your in your statement um, when talking about the opportunities I can offer in the food sector, the agriculture sector. Um, but you said that it can also come with um, social and ethical challenges um, like how can we deal with that do we need some kind of um, ethical guidelines um, code of ethics to uh, guide this development of um, technology <clears throat> thank you and I'm fascinated by the discussion and uh, allow me just from the very beginning to start a little bit with the I, I'm in the previous life I was a diplomat and I believe I'm still a diplomat when diplomacy meant win-win uh, and not zero-sum that's what I try to preach, and that's what, not only preach, but I believe implement, and I believe it's possible. For instance, when we talk about this uh, uh, agriculture and digital technologies, we need agriculture to be environment friendly. Digital technology is assisting agriculture to be environment friendly and more efficient. We simply need to find the balance. We need to find the trade-offs. And we need to base this discussion on the science, which Benedetta is providing very important statistics. But uh, what is important is to find this ground. And the uh, European Union, I know, is undertaking a very strong strategies uh, from farm to fork, uh, green economy in general, and biodiversity, all very important. Moving it into legislation. So we need trade-offs, and we need to have a balance. In terms of ethics, uh, I was talking about the uh, imbalance and the inequalities on the access to digital technologies. And we have it in rural areas. We have European Union, we have Russia, we have Turkey, where agriculture is strongly developed. But we have Africa and some parts of Asia Pacific where we don't have this access. And we, when we plan what we are doing, we need to think about less developed countries and their knowledge of uh, actually the artificial intelligence approaches. And what I believe is very important for us when we debate these issues among the developed countries, and uh, if we talk about specifically about the ethics and uh, together with Microsoft, IBM and Italy, FAO is uh, co-signatory to Rome call for AI ethics uh, in 2020. This is a very specific document which has been prepared. But when we talk, we, we need to talk about access. Sometimes we want to have digital villages and digital rural areas. But even in European Union, they don't have an access to broadband in some places. So they would not have the necessary uh, hardware in order to develop efficient software. So these inequalities, and if we go further, it would be even more difficult. And that's what I say, for instance, uh, gender imbalance. Also a big issue. If we work all together, women, youth, and men, 
We can produce much more, but we need to do it efficiently. And we need to address these issues and uh, to learn about it. Maybe I am just a little bit too strate strategic or <laughs> just general, but that's how I try to approach and we try to approach these issues. We, we need to listen to each other, find win-win solutions, and also uh, taking from my uh, Chinese education, uh, there was a saying in Chinese, Lang tui zou lu. That means walk on two legs. We need, we need to use both. And also another Chinese wisdom, mo shi go he, crossing the river, testing the waters. We need to, to know the signs, but always proceed from the practice. Thank you. Uh, thank you, even for, uh, um, especially for these uh, <laughs> wise words at the end. Um, let me ask uh, one last question um, uh, before we open the discussion to the public. Um, uh, Grisha, there's uh, still no like, real regulation uh, from policymakers to make AI truly environmentally friendly. Um, in your opinion, um, because I know you're working on that, what um, framework conditions, um, political framework conditions, uh, do, do we need to really develop this resource-saving innovative potential of AI? And uh, we talked about this already earlier. Which um, actors should we involve in this whole process, such as civil society, for instance? Well, I think all relevant actors, such as civil society, uh, guys from the practice, uh, regulatory uh, organizations, but also uh, NGOs, for example, should be involved. And um, I think we're at the starting point of trying to find compromises that are applicable for, for all uh, parties here. And I think what has been said is that uh, the social and the ethical um, implications are very important, but I also think that the uh, environmental uh, effects need to be taken into account. So I guess a framework that is really applicable for all these discussions are the SDGs of the uh, United Nations. And if we bring together all these sort of peoples, use their expertise and have this as a common framework that all of us accept, it is possible to develop such uh, frameworks in the near future. I think the European Union has started to do that and I uh, find that pretty uh, a good starting point, but I think we're way beyond or not even close to a point where we say that that is a framework that is really uh, applicable and serves human and the environment um, equally. Thank you um, for uh, also a bit summarizing the debate. Mm -hmm. no, Anna, you look like you want I, to... I just wanted to add one sentence because I really yes. would like to underline that what you said, that it's really so important to bring these two communities together, uh, the AI community on one side and the sustainability community on the other side because I think it's a problem that both of them are quite... Uh, on, on the other, on, on, on other um, parts of, of, uh, of the scientific community, and I think we really need to bring them more together. And what a great mm -hmm. example is, I think, is the Umweltbundesamt uh, in Germany. They started to build an own AI sector in their Bundesamt, and I think that is uh, very crucial that we have these expertise on the technology there, where also is the expertise on uh, ecological questions. Uh, thank you for, for this point. Um, I'd like to open up the discussion uh, to the public. Um, I, but I also see that Benedetta is raising so, her hand. Um, but let's uh, first take a look here uh, in our room. Is, uh, is there anyone who has questions, comments for our speakers? A bit shy. Ah, Stormy. Yeah, thank you so very much. Um, this has been a fantastic um, panel so far. Um, what I would be, I would like to also come back to the issue of data centers um, and the uh, um, carbon neutrality of such. And I know that there's a lot of thinking of um, setting up data centers more in the north of Germany and in the east of Germany, where we do have a lot of wind energy, uh, for example. Um, and it makes a lot of sense to have them close to where the energy energy source is. For other um, uh, companies, that might be a little bit more difficult because they are already set up in the south of Germany. So um, maybe you can also tell us a little bit about how we get the energy from one part to where it is needed um, and the infrastructure um, of such. I know it's not specifically um, AI related, but I think it's, it's really, really important to talk about um, the um, energy trassen um, and where they lead and if we also have the public support um, to get them through. 
Thank you. This sounds like a question to um, Anna. <laughs> question uh, for the whole <laughs> process of the energy vendor, how we get the energy from north to south. Uh, it's not only for data centers, it's for, uh, for the whole industry that is uh, located in the south of Germany. I'm from Baden-Württemberg, so I, I know this discussion very well. And um, of course, uh, we need to have solutions for that, and we need to have the connections from north to south um, where it is needed and sometimes it's very complex to, to make that happen. Um, but to come back to AI, maybe it's, it's part of the solution there also, I think, because the whole process of um, um, calculating where these trussen should be located and where also wind power should be located uh, to make it most e easy to bring it from one point to the other as uh, their AI also comes uh, into it. Um, but I think um, it's a very important question, it's not only related to data centers but to the whole industry and energy vendor sector and uh, it will be uh, a one task of the new government to uh, work very hard on it. <laughs> Great. Uh, any more questions here from uh, our public in Berlin? No. And I don't see questions um, uh, in the online tour, um, which is um, quite good because we can uh, uh, ask Benedetta and Alexander, who raised their hands earlier, to, um, to make a quick contribution. Um, well, I was just um, I was just responding to Vladimir because I really enjoyed his comment about um, what we tend to call um, data colonialism and the inequality you know, that we see between you know, the super wealthy West and East, you know, China, US, Europe, and the global South. Just to say that in terms of the data that we have at the moment, um, it's absolutely even in inconceivable uh, for most of the countries in Africa and even South America to either, even in the next five years have the infrastructure that could be necessary to run AI, for example. So, you know, this is very often a neglected area you know, of policy making. And it's something that, of course, for FAO is absolutely crucial. And I, I still think that embracing a more clear, even if you, if you prefer the ethical framework than an environmental justice, then in the ethical framework, you can still use the concept of harm and you can use the concept of environmental harm to really say we live through an emergency, so we need to have the communities that are suffering from these emergencies. And we know very well that unfortunately these communities are based in the global south. But for the first time in the history of Germany, we saw these major floods in Germany and in China at the same at the same time in areas that um, never suffered as much as the tropical areas, for example, of constant weather events. And so, you know, having a conversation at the global level that brings all of this concept of environmental harm like as the starting point of all this decision making where to place the data centers like what kind of neural networks should we, de should we develop uh, banning all kind of AI applications that are used to extract oil and gas so banning completely completely any kind of AI application that is used for mining because we don't have time because you know the point is we need to clean the uh, electricity grid. And 65% being based on fossil fuels now, right now, is not something that is sustainable. So we need to have interventions that think about that first. And I think we all have the legal and the theoretical and um, ethical framework that we can use for, for this without forgetting that the concept of environmental justice helps us also to avoid the sort of data exclusionism, the sort of data colonialism, the sort of violation and exploitation of the South that has been characterized in the last uh, centuries. So I think we have options. Um, thanks uh, for this positive uh, note at the end. Um, Alexander, you raised your hand earlier. Do you still have um, a point you would like to make? Sure. I actually would like to connect a couple of these uh, points that were just discussed. You know, uh, one on the data center. Yeah, it, it, it shows that you know sometimes things are not obvious and not necessarily always easy. You know, that was on the one side the point made. You know, there shouldn't be any data centers uh, in in deserts, uh, and there was on the other side the point made. Data centers should be very close to where renewable energy is. You know, well that's the reason why they're in deserts because you have solar power. Now the good news is you know the. Um, Technology has made advantages on, on that, and when you look at the, 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 the cooling of data centers, and we nowadays have technologies where actually 
breaks my heart if I see it as an engineer, but you know, this technology is actually liquid cooled, so you don't need extra power to do that, even if you're in desert. So that's one. Second one for all the ones that are concerned, uh, these data centers are now built, you know, I can talk for Microsoft, but that's not necessarily only Microsoft, in, in a way that, you know, you're looking into the concrete, you're looking into really every single aspect. And we from Microsoft, for example, we have set ourselves the target to be what we call water positive. So in other words, you know, have more water in the world that we actually uh, consume ourselves. So there, there's lots of things going on. Uh, two points I would love to make, however. You know, number one, I would want to underline what uh, earlier on uh, Anna Crispin was saying. I believe right now there is really no reason to run data centers uh, in a non-sustainable way. You know, and if it needs regulation, uh, regulation to do that, you know, then it needs regulation. We should regulate that and say, well, you know, we should have them on the highest standards. That there is no question for me. The second point I'd love to make, even though I'm an engineer. Uh, and I love about uh, to talk about technology. We've been talking a lot about you know how we use technology, and, and, and that's great. You know, I could talk for hours about it. But you know, one of the questions that we should also have in the discussions is why are we using technology, and why are we using AI? And you know, what you have, and we've discussed lots of them today. You have good causes where AI can help. But you know, you can also sometimes look and say, "Well, are we using technology always for the right reasons? Is it uh, you know for research on climate, or is it for pure entertainment, or is it for even you know less significant causes?" That's one, and that brings up a whole discussion. And say, "Well, we need to have an understanding of what it means to use technology," and you know that goes into the education sector where I see you know there's lots of young folks that are using technology without thinking about it. And I think that's one of the, the, the tasks we have in our societies nowadays. And say, well, let's have a certain level of understanding what it means to use technology and if it's always good to use technology. And again, you know, as an engineer, uh, I love to have technology, but it should be used for the right causes. Uh, thanks, Alexander. You raised a really, um, really good point. Um, and I think this is also a good trans transition to my last question uh, <laughs> to Cecile. You have the task now to uh, <laughs> um, make the, the last uh, statement. Um, just because I sent you a question um, uh, beforehand, um, uh, looking a bit into the, into the future, uh, what is your prognosis? To what extent will um, AI be a boon or a bust in terms of achieving sustainability goals? Actually, when, when you see this nature paper, I think it was from 2020, where they try to assess the use of AI and the contribution or uh, the negative effect on the SDG, they analyzed the different aspects and environment was, of course, one of them. And there was already at that point a clear added value of using AI. And I agree, it should be used where it is needed, where there is a, a concrete and sub substantial added value. So uh, I, I think it, there will be a, a substantial uh, help from uh, from the this technology to uh, to be sus more sustainable economically and environmentally and also for the society as, as a whole. But we need to be careful when you, we use it. That's that's what we have also the regulation uh, in Europe. We want to to establish it to protect people. So because it must be human centric, it must be there. To, to, for good and for all. That's also the inequality we don't ha want to have. So we should fight on the different aspect to make sure that, that it is really for good and, and that everybody can, can benefit from that. And for that, we need to bring all the different actors, the, the, the users and, and the, the citizens must identify where, and we should provide them with the right information, where they can take advantage of that, where there will be an added value, and then make sure that the technology is developed in a way which addresses those challenges and take into account all the negative effects the technology can have. So the working together, and, and also we see so many different initiative going in the same direction but i think we should really join forces because working in parallel it's it's a it's a waste of effort so we try at our small level at european level to already you know connect with the member state build synergies among them but much more needs to be done and and at europe at, at international level there is the gpi working on that there, there are many many different things but but we need to to bring that together and and yeah Besides talking, acting, and, and make it happen. 
Thank you, Cecilia. I think this has been the um, perfect uh, last statement, uh, wrapping up the, uh, our discussion so far. Uh, thank you all for, for joining us today. Um, uh, it was really great to have all these different perspectives here together. And um, I wish you a pleasant uh, continuation of the conference. Thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you. Thank you so very much for an exciting panel. Um, I learned a lot and I took away um, a lot. Um, I, I also want to thank again um, one of our partners um, who had been, um, and we don't see him anymore, but Microsoft um, is also one of our partners supporting um, our conference today. And I also wanted to draw your attention to um, a project we are doing um, at, uh, at Espen, and we are continuing this next year, um, on agriculture um, and digitalization. And we are doing so together with Berlin Dialogue and the Center um, Liberale Moderne, um, and Microsoft is a partner there too and we're looking at the benefits um, of digitalization um, for agriculture. So stay tuned. Thank you so much again to, um, to you. And now we leave you to go. I mean, you are free to go into the well-deserved first coffee break of today. Um, and we hope to see you back in about 10, 12 minutes to continue our program. Thank you so much. Um, enjoy the networking and see you in a few minutes. And thank you so much again. Thank you. <laughs>
Then next, I would like to welcome Dr. Andre Heinke, who is a vice president um, at Robert Bosch GmbH and is there responsible for corporate foresight and megatrends. So a very warm welcome to you. Then next is Matthias Wachter, who is the head of department at the BDI and is responsible for international cooperation, security policy, raw material, and space. A very warm welcome to you. And last but not least, Lars Zimmermann, who is a co-founder of GovTech Campus Germany, who is the first innovation platform for government technologies co-founded by the federal government, the 16 states, and the tech scene. A very warm welcome to you. So first, let me start with a, a general question to every one of you, and I kindly ask you for a sort of short answer. So in the, in the space strategy for Europe and the research and innovation needs of the space program in the period 2021 to 2027, new space research aims to foster a cost-effective, competitive, and innovative space industry and research community. So I would basically would like to know from you, from your point of view, what are currently the most pressing issues on space innovation and the use of AI? So maybe just start with Christina. Um, uh, hello, thank you for being here. So in my opinion, the most crucial point is to bring all main actors of the space industry to one table. Because what we see in space is that we have extraordinary, extraordinarily high network effects. So we have to bring the polit polit political side, the industry, including startups and established players, as well as the civil, uh, the civil um, organizations and the research side to one table. Because with this, with the joint effort, we can uh, enable and foster sustainable innovation and also use our resources, which are limited, in a very efficient way. Thanks a lot. So you are asking for cooperation. So maybe, um, Sabine, what's your opinion on that? Um, cooperation in space uh, between industries, research organizations, but also cooperations between different, um, different states. Uh, international cooperation is always very important. And uh, this is something which is... Uh, um, one of the extraordinary points of uh, space has been in the last years um, regarding international politics. Um, every time on Earth uh, it's getting a little bit uh, cold here in Berlin <laughs> between the United States and Russia, something like this, but always the cooperation for the International Space Station um, was like a like a holy point in space, so this is at least very important, and I think that um, if we cooperate together, then we can also make, uh, make good points um, regarding the, the, uh, the demands of the society in Europe and all over the world for, uh, for good space programs and good space mm -hmm. applications. Yeah, thanks a lot. So maybe adding with, a, with another opinion more from the industry side, Matthias, what's, what's your opinion on that? First of all, thank you very much for uh, having me today. It's a great honor and pleasure. Um, I'm very optimistic um, when it comes to space. Um, I believe there are very uh, positive developments uh, uh, here in Germany and uh, in Europe as a whole. Uh, we see that um, a lot of new and young companies uh, are coming up, coming online, uh, which have great ideas and uh, great um, uh, applications and solutions of how to make society and also business uh, more sustainable, mm -hmm. more green and more digital. So I think new space, the, uh, the current development, um, it's something positive in general. But on the other side, we also see an increased, let's say, superpower competition kind of thing coming back in space. Uh, Russia, a couple of days ago, shot down one of their own satellites, generating a lot of uh, space debris. And uh, I think we need an international understanding um, that um, all countries which are able and uh, are active in space somehow work together and take care of each other and uh, uh, think uh, of, uh, of how can we, for the long term, preserve space is a common human uh, good and that everyone has, has access to it. And um, 
So I think um, we, we really need an, an, uh, an understanding on the international uh, level uh, when it comes to space debris and, and other aspects. Um, and, and what I fear a little bit is the increased militarization of mm -hmm. space, uh, what we are seeing. Um, so, but yeah, at a whole, I think space and new space is uh, part of the solution, but there are also some, some, some drawbacks, and I think we need to work on that. Mm -hmm. So thanks a lot. Um, Lars, because you're, you're basically working on the intersection between like the, the tech scene and, and, and government, so what's your opinion on that? I think talking about the tech scene, I think the tech scene is completely sold on, <laughs> on space, so they all want to do it. I think we experience a lot of money flowing into the system, private money, by the mm. way. So, and that's, I think, the first point I want to make, that we, again, like in many other areas, see the fact that non-government money is flowing into the sector, and they... They, they try to drive stuff very, very deeply. So um, we have that case, we all know this, that the billionaires, the US billionaires, they really take the space topic to move into new uh, you know, fronts of what they call um, innovation, and I think it's right. But I think a second point that we underestimate, especially in Germany, is um, when Amazon, when the people, and when Elon Musk um, in Germany felt like that they would do some private competition about who's, who's the first in space. We experience here a debate within the society that this is something that's focusing on the complete wrong issues. We have so many issues on the world to be solved, so why are they spending billions to just go to space for fun? I don't believe that it's right. I think going to space is something that will drive a lot of innovation in a lot of areas. But I think you underestimate that when talking about the interaction that the overall political context right now doesn't see or acknowledge space as a mm -hmm. strategic innovation topic. So when you go back into economic history in Germany, you see the most important innovation area that Germany became very good at, like the automotive industry, was an industry where the, the demand side, the people really pushed innovation. So they just used cars, Germans were crazy about cars, so there was a strong demand to make the cars better and better and better. And I think you need to have a domestic demanding demand side to push innovation. I don't see this in Germany, unfortunately, so far. What do I mean by that? I think we need to create a political debate also from the top level that space is not something where we can waste German taxpayers' money. Mm -hmm. It is a very strategic area of innovation, and I think that is uh, something that we have to address much better. Mm -hmm. Yeah, thanks a lot. So, Andre, you are you're basically covering everything more from a sort of meta trend perspective. So, what's your opinion on this whole topic? Thank you, Helmut. Um, we have to understand that there will be no European sovereignty without being innovative in space, being present in space. Innovation has always been connected with dreaming about. Uh, space exploration about a presence. The Sputnik shock has triggered a huge wave of innovation in the United States. Um, the latest Chinese hypersonics uh, test um, was connected to, to space as well and has triggered another shock, um, a shock hopefully that will be creative in positive ways. Um, the priority should be to ensure that uh, innovation made in Germany is being used for peaceful purposes, for understanding, for building bridges in space as well. But there'll, there'll be no automated driving without having a presence in space. We have to understand that there is a race about standardization uh, of space components. We have a very successful company uh, uh, being represented by you, where other American companies have become interested, not because they are not innovative, but because they are building on the R&D capabilities that we have here in Germany and in um, Europe. Last point, uh, we have to understand that uh, many new technologies will be connected heavily to space. And uh, we have to understand that we cannot stand in between a Chinese space technology and an American space technology. We have to ensure our own capabilities. And yet, 
we have to be compatible to the others. And this is a very difficult game. Mm -hmm. Yeah, thanks a lot for all these great introductory remarks. So what I would like to do is uh, dig a bit deeper into specific areas, what we have already discussed. And I would like to start with Matthias um, and basically address the question of which trends and developments are worrying you and which of them you regard as positive. Again, like, like I said in my, my introduction, I, I think the increased superpower competition in space, especially between the US and China, but also uh, with, with Russia, is something increasingly worrying. We see an increased militarization of space, uh, the uh, asset uh, weapon used by the Russians a couple of days ago to shut down a satellite. Um, that's something worrying. Uh, but again, on the other side, the, the overall development, what's going on in space, I think it's something really positive. And um, uh, it was already mentioned here at the panel that space is really an enabler for new technologies on Earth. For example, autonomous driving, Industry 4.0, IoT, smart farming. This is all only possible with space-based applications and data. Um, it's, um, it's already worth mentioning that um, we are talking a lot about these billionaires and uh, the space tourism, etc. But that's really a, a very, very small part of the overall space economy. At the moment, we have a global space economy, economy of roughly, let's say, $400 billion. And $300 billions are space-based data and, and, and satellites who generate and transfer data. So it's uh, really space is at the end of the day, it's about data. And um, uh, space tourism is, I think it's less uh, than 2% of this, this overall market. And it will stay at that, let's say, percentage number because uh, um, the, the, the data business is growing much faster than, uh, than the S aspects. So again, I'm, I'm, I'm very positive. I think new space is part of the solution, especially when we talk about climate change. And um, we, um, uh, we need to set a framework uh, that, um, that allows young companies and established companies in space to thrive. And I think Europe somehow needs to catch up a little bit. Uh, and a lot of the developments in the US I regard as very favorable. So I think we should look what's working in the US and try to, uh, to, to bring it uh, to, to Europe as well. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Um, so probably leaving uh, space tourism aside, for all of this, we need a lot of money. Um, and I would like to ask a question to Christina. Um, so what does resilience mean in the context of EU space research funding, the provision of services, and the required infrastructure for development and explorations of new technologies? Um, yeah, so in my opinion, we first have to recognize how diverse the space industry and innovations from space are. This is the first point. And we also have to understand innovation as a supply chain because it is one person innovating something. It's all supply chain and a big, pro long process uh, to bring innovation to the markets. And I think uh, all the funding schemes, if we're talking about stable funding schemes, programs, they have to be addressed to the certain development stage and innovation is in. So to give an example, if we're looking, for example, to fundamental research, we think how can we uh, secure that people traveling to Mars have enough food on board? These are innovations in a really early stage, having totally different constraints than a startup like us or OHB in a really late stage. Um, so here we need uh, first have to make sure what is our strategy and where do we want to be in 15, 20, 25 years? Where do we want to be the market leader? And once we see where, where we want to go, we have to uh, back this strategy with a big amount of money and say, this must be easy, accessible to a wide range of researchers uh, who can really um, develop fundamental research, uh, which comes to innovation, which is going to be uh, 
uh, applicable into the industry in the future. And here we can't come with uh, requirements looking at a return on invest. We have to see where we want to go and take risks to, um, to fund this. If we go to another stage where we see, okay, we have startups, we maybe have higher technology readiness levels, we have to, don't have to push any program and say, okay, we just give you money, please continue doing what you do. We have to um, be laser focused on commercialization and see where is the business impact, where is the application field. And I think here, what, especially for space, would be super interesting if the government acts as an anchor customer and see, okay, we have a demand, we want to be uh, uh, sovereign in the, in the whole ecosystem. And, well, we need innovation for that. That we change our mindset, especially on the governmental side and the, the agencies uh, and the big players to open up for innovation and to foster this. And I think, uh, it's my strong belief, that once we have the first traction, uh, once we have the early adopters, we will have a spill in and a wide range of the whole uh, society, basically. And with this, make innovation sustainable mm -hmm. and long-lasting. And with this, we will benefit all. Mm -hmm. So having heard uh, more the opinion from a, from a smaller um, uh, space tech startup, I would like to ask you, Sabine, as, as someone who is representing a really uh, large firm in, in that field, so the EU space research funding aims to help uh, to sustain a competitive space industry, including numerous manufacturers, service providers and operators. How do you evaluate the progress so far and how does your company contribute to these processes? So um, EU or ESA research fundings um, have been working very, very good, very well for, um, I think, startups, um, SMEs, uh, large system integrators. Um, this is a very, it's a, it's a good system and um, I think that um, especially the European Commission um, fostering their ideas for dedicated programs um, regarding um, benefits for society like Galileo and Copernicus. Um, it's a very good path to go and to, to go forward on um, establishing space applications, space industry, space branch it's, uh, as an enabler for, for the growth of society and especially also for, for Europe's sovereignty. On the other hand, I think that um, seeing that especially in the, U in the US and especially there with the, with the billionaires or with really private money, seeing what, what their um, next steps are, I think that uh, Europe has to be a little bit better prepared also in the research funding. Mm -hmm. um, for example, um, Elon Musk is going to send people to Mars. He's, since he has, he has uh, all his big steps that he wanted to do and everyone said he's not going to do that, he has done. So I'm quite sure he will do so. He will do so. And, I'm not sure if Europe and maybe also Germany and the new government is aware of what that means um, also for sustainable space matters about what, what, what does uh, people, they are not sent from an agency, um, how do they live on Mars? What's, uh, what's a sustainable way to, to go back from, from Mars to Earth and saying we, we take all our our debris with us. And I think that there is a very, very big um, opportunity, but also there, there has to be more Europe in, um, also in regulations and the question of how can we foster European research activities to not always being on the second, on the second place, not always seeing, okay, someone else is, is going there and we want to follow, but what can we do to be again on the first place. Mm -hmm. And I think that uh, this is something that Europe has to be a little bit more breitschuldrich. <laughs> <laughs> so a, a, a great call for more European and German engagement yes. in the sector. So what I would like to do now is uh, turning to Lars um, and, and basically address the question of the digitalization of administration or e-government involves the simplification of workflows, processes of information and the transaction within and between institutions. Um, so 
is innovation being sufficiently fostered in Germany and is there room for improvement? So um, the question is slightly differently phrased to more German and European initiative in space. So what's here down on Earth? So I could make it very brief and say, yes, there's a lot of room for improvement. Um, but, um, well, there's always room for improvement, of course. And I think of what we underestimate in Germany a little bit in this whole debate about becoming more innovative is that um, the institutions and the institutional settings and the organization is much more important than money. I think money is never an issue. I mean, that does sound a little bit strange, but I think when you do some, when you want to do something great, you will always get money for it, right? So, I think the problem really is within the institutional settings, and that is also why I doubt a little bit that reaching out to the European level right now would be the best way to do it. I say this, really, I'm a strong fan of the European Union, so I don't want to make the impression that I speak against it, but I don't believe right now that Germany or the European Union will be able to speed up in a way in space when they try to do it by themselves. I think um, that the game of space will be more a game of cooperation and not of pure competition. My advice would be just reaching out much more to the United States. I think the space area is a perfect area where Europe, especially Germany and the United States, and via Germany, the European Union, uh, the, the uh, European Union and the United States could do much more better things together. Why? Because I think the German government, and I don't make a political case here, but the German structure of government right now, and also the institutional structure of the European Union, they are not really capable right now to orchestrate the ecosystem that you need to become successful in space. Um, in the 60s, the game, the space game, was a 100% government game. Mm -hmm. um, the Russians against the United States, Europe and Germany were completely out of it. I think when we talk about tech areas like space, ecosystems are more important. So um, we need companies in Germany that are capable of doing it. Um, we need um, institutional settings that um, enable the companies to do what they want. They need to have money, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. But you can't say the German government will become a space tech player or UK or the, you know, France. Um, I think you need to find the best ecosystem between companies, institutions, regulations, the legal system, um, the money and the research behind it. And I think that is more like government private partnership based ecosystems than governments or um, uh, uh, companies. Are we prepared from a pure institutional setting to be capable in organizing these very efficiently? I'd say, unfortunately, no, but I'm per se an optimistic person. I say we have every opportunity, I think, right now. Um, but I think we shouldn't do it by our, ourselves and just focus on the European level. Um, I think we should really, um, you know, get at the side of the United States in this um, and try to find out, to figure out, is there a way of competition between Europe and the United States to explore the opportunities in space much better? We have great companies. Um, I think the space tech ecosystem in Germany and Europe is pretty, pretty well. Uh, I think the United States knows that because the investors uh, who now come to Europe and want to invest in a European space tech, they 90% comes from the United States. So, which unfortunately is always the case in every tech vertical, right? The best investors never come from Europe itself, they just come from other parts of the world. So, what I want to say is follow the money. That's unfortunately a very stupid, simple question or sentence, but it's true. So, if I track the investments right now, uh, many, many investments come from the United States to Europe and we should make use that money kind of flow um, to build an ecosystem between Germany, Europe and the United States. If I, if I may briefly add on that, I, I, I fully ag uh, agree with what, what Lars just said. Um, I, I think in general we need a, um, a different approach of how we uh, address these issues and how we, let's say, do space. Uh, at the moment, everyone recognizes it, it is a huge is issue. There are huge potentials. So the debate is going. We need, um, let's say, we need to put more uh, government money into um, uh, development, etc. Yeah. Uh, on the other side, the US, they are not doing that. What they do is they are giving, and uh, Christina mentioned that before, 
they are giving contracts to companies who compete with each other. 80% of the contracts Elon Musk and SpaceX has and gets are from NASA, from the US government, from NSA, the US Space Force, etc. So what they are doing, uh, they are handing out uh, contracts, they are working together with private companies, and they, they, they not put the money in a way into, let's say, research as we do. We very often think if we just increase the research budgets, uh, everything will be good. But at the end, what happens here in Germany is we, we do a lot of research, uh, we have great developments, but we don't monetize it at the end, and we don't have products which are, let's say, competitive uh, on the European or international level. So I really think we need to change our system a little bit, look how the US is doing it very successfully, and give more contracts, and even if it's very small contracts, to innovative companies uh, in, the, in the space sector. And I think this will really uh, boost innovation and will help the companies to develop products which are successful at the market. that is basically adding to this ecosystem and, and fully follow the money nar narrative. So from your perspective, what are the general and major trends of innovation um, and in which areas is the factor for resilience remarkably high or low? In general, uh, you are only taken seriously if you bring something to the game. Uh, if you want to become a client state, you are just one customer and you stand in line and you depend on political ties or on money flows. Um, with all due respect to our American partners, and Aspen stands for the transatlantic relationship, uh, GPS, to take one practical example of navigation, uh, has been in the past being restricted or not, depending on the security situation, which is not always clear to us. Uh, and I mean German companies, German uh, authorities. Um, national security thinking and using national security as a purpose for economic gains and, and alliances has been an increasing trend in the past few years. We will only be taken seriously in Washington and in, in San Francisco and in the Valley if we bring something to the game uh, and where we have options um, to probably fall back on in case um, the Trump administration comes back in 2024 um, and probably it will be a take it or leave it approach as we have experienced in 5G. Mm. We do not want to be in a position to be strong-armed for domestic American political reasons which we cannot influence. This we can only do if we are united in Europe with our French friends who have a great experience in space as well, um, if we keep our lines open to all the innovative companies that have probably Russian roots, Chinese engineers, but are based in the Silicon Valley or in Israel or wherever. Um, the, the general trend has been to um, be independent in a sense, but data is, and, and was mentioned uh, many times by, by, by you, is increasingly the, the uh, the trend that is connected to space, to navigation, to communications, and so on. Um, developing a joint standard with the United States on data exchanges, that would be a practical first step in using their technology and using our technology in probably uh, bringing up Gaia-X uh, um, in, in a certain sense and building trust starting from there. That has been a trend that is quite reliable. Mm -hmm. Maybe just uh, 
emphasizing a bit more on this narrative that we had for more European initiative and, and probably you know, more investment from, from European or German governments into the sector. So maybe to you, Sabine, where are the sort of great examples of initiatives or companies um, that we have seen in Europe on that? Investing in space? Yeah, so basically government initiatives, grants, money into sort of best class examples that are basically European based. There are very little, I assume, <laughs> maybe others that might help. So I think the, the, the narrative is we are always arguing for, obviously, cooperation, Europe, the US, but also with a strong emphasis on Europe, Europe's independence or Europe's uh, sort of initiatives. And so the question is, is there anything of, of substance that uh, we can bring to the table from a European German perspective? Of course, of course we can. Um, Europe and uh, especially uh, German, Germany is, has extraordinary experience in Earth observation, instruments, satellites, programs, uh, data services. It's really, uh, especially regarding um, applications, um, I, since the US market is not so transparent for us in that case. So we don't really have the total number of satellites being launched in the United States because most of them are for military uses. And um, I think it's uh, quite understandable that uh, the United States Army is not um, sending newsletters out for about uh, their, space, uh, their, their uh, military satellites. But although we don't really know how many satellites uh, are we built in the United States and we don't know um, uh, the whole sp uh, specifications, we know that um, German and European companies uh, are working on a very high level. Uh, we know that from our export activities and knowing that um, especially um, some states in Asia or also in the Middle East are really asking for European technology in here. So at least uh, also the, the tradition in, in Europe for space companies um, and uh, especially the focus on, on applications um, on not so much, but in the beginning there was also a focus on big research programs, but uh, Europe has been very successful in, in applications for a growing European society. So this is something which we totally can bring to the table. Um, I think on the other hand, you see that um, since um, Europe has been very successful in um, astronautic space, um, the European service module has, is built, has been built in Bremen by Airbus, but it's from Bremen. And um, this is flying with, with Orion, uh, and it's going to be uh, one of the key elements for the Lunar Gateway. So mm. there are many, many good uh, examples and projects where Europe has, or Europe and Germany, have been very successful, and there is something that we can bring to the table. But again, this is something that we can bring more from a governmental approach. So this is where agency sits together on the table. And this is, this is already it's, it's, uh, it's very good, it's good working, but um, I think that we have to, to open our mind for more space activities uh, in, in the commercial sector. And this is a little bit complicated because we don't have that big uh, amount of money in Europe as it is in the United States. And since space has always been and will be always also uh, with a very big impact on, on strategic and also governmental and institutional demands, we have to find ways to follow the money and not only to, only to follow it, but to, um, to bring it to Europe. And we have to be innovative, and we have to find ways to be attractive for um, U.S. capital. Mm -hmm. Thank you for this remark. And I just saw uh, Lars um, having an additional comment on that. There's a company called Munarik, which is basically a German company. So they're very international, also big in the United States. But um, that's a space tech company that does I don't understand the technological issues here, but that does um, laser-based uh, comms technology in space. 
And um, this seems to be a technology that is so important that the German government is considering restricting investments from others into that company. So, but that's um, very typical for Germany. So they say, okay, or they, they don't say, okay, you need 400, 600, 700 million. The German government could say, you get it from us. We give you the money because we see so many investors who want to invest in you, the American government, whatever, others. We say, let's restrict, let's, let's build a law to you know, restrict investments from others into the company. And that is, I think, that makes very clear what the lack of mindset is here. When I said follow the money, the best, for me, the best sign that a great technology is somewhere, that a company has a great team, that it has a lot of potential, are the investments from private equities, from VCs. Government is not a smart investor. I'm very sorry to say this. I don't know any government in the world that provides smart money. Um, DARPA is a little bit different, but I won't consider that as a, really a government organization because this is the only organization that is left alone completely. And I totally believe you won't be able to build up DARPA again today. So that was a coincidence, the right people at the right time. And the U US can be very, very lucky that they have that kind of organization where only 250 people work uh, with billions of money each year. But why don't we give away the money to companies where a lot of others private investors are in and just tell them, look, if you want to scale and grow, we don't need to make a law to you know, prohibit others to invest in you. Stay in Europe because we have the money. I mean, the German government, of course, could invest 400 billion in such a company. The German government, maybe another entity. But that is what I mean. So we don't even have to figure out what is a good technology or a great company or not so great. We will also... At any time when you do investment, there will be a lot of failures. Um, you have to write things off. That's how life is, right? Um, but if we just figure out how to build up with our own money, um, four to six to seven companies, I think we will be much better off in the end um, than providing another research program, which is funded by the German Federal Minister of Research. It's nice and it's good, but I think it's money not well spent. Research does need money, and they will get it also from corporates, by the way. It's not only the government money. But in the end, the question is, do companies have the money to scale and to expand? And you need to have the ability to invest also in the national interest. Germany doesn't have that kind of um, entity that is capable of doing mm. it. There's now the plan to change it. Um, I wish the best to actually do it. But I think we need to reach out to the world, and that's maybe... And that's really the last sentence that I want to say. The storytelling of Germany as an industrial nation, as an industry nation, should really be right now going out to the world and say to all the funders, to all the startup people, to all the entrepreneurs, if you need money to scale, if you need 400, 600, 700 million euros maybe, you need to come to Germany. That should be the basic narrative. It's not about 20, 40, 50, one, one, 100 million. There's a lot of money right now in the system. So it's not the problem to get 100 million, but really going out to Asia, to the United States, to all the parts of the world and say, if you have a very industrial-based, a very hardware-based, software-based kind of thing, Germany has a story about hardware, has a story about this kind of stuff, very research-heavy come to Germany because here is your organization that can provide you with 500 million euros. It sounds a little bit strange, but I think now is the time because there are so many big, great ideas coming up. And if we're not doing it, um, I'm quite sure the US will do it and they are quite good in doing it together with the private P&E with all the funds, et cetera, et cetera. We don't have the funds, unfortunately. We are not capable in using the money to do this. So we have to build it up as a government entity and I think that's the best money we could spend. I think space tech needs something like that. Hmm. Bit faster. That's one of the key <coughs> problems we have. It's always it's taking so much time. Yeah. If you have a new research program, then you can apply for a grant, and then someone in the government is checking it and it's coming back with other questions. And two years later, you may may have or may have not starting a program which takes you five years. Yeah. And most of the startups, if they if they don't get the money in the first year, they Away. That would be my question before we open up to, to the floor, because we have an entrepreneur here and a German-based startup. So what is your experience with like dealing with the government, if you have to, or with like external investors into your idea? Is this something that was 
positive perception or do you see all this, these issues we, we are discussing? So what's your opinion on that? Um, yeah, so we as a German startup uh, with a long, long heritage in space research, um, we see that we have a really strong standing, uh, especially um, out of Germany. So Middle East is super interested, Asia Pacific, the US, they're looking at our research and see, okay, we invested heavily since the 70s at, in our field as one of the first institutes dealing with the topic of space debris when no one else did. And they see this, that we have an advantage from our research coming. And also the customers see, uh, see this advantage that we're having and that they trust German technology. And uh, I didn't believe that before I founded my, my startup that uh, Made in Germany is real a quality seal and people love it. And they say, okay, you're independent. Uh, we trust your engineers, you have good products. So this is a really big benefit for us. But investments in Europe are super different to investments from external Europe. You have investment process which are longer, uh, you have to fulfill more KPIs, it's more, you have to have more uh, yeah, numbers uh, prepared, which is very difficult for a young startups. So we are three years old and sometimes you, uh, we just meet the glass uh, wall where we have, uh, we don't fulfill requirements basically in some cases. And we see that, uh, uh, that non-European investors are often more, take, more likely to take more risk and they say, okay, we believe in the team, we believe in the technology, you've proven traction, so we're trusting you and uh, want to invest. So this is what we uh, experience as a startup. Um, yeah. Maybe just an additional follow-up question on this. Would you prefer uh, state money or private money as an investor in your startup? I think private money helps you to focus on commercial products, to a commercial product market fit, to really serve a market need. So in this case, I think private investors play a crucial role and can play a yeah, better role than the governmental money. But uh, governmental money is super important, I think, for research topics, for uh, being with the startup, even if it gets rough and even if the sales cycles and development cycles are longer. But it's hard to get there because, as Sabina said, you fill a lot of documents, a lot of bureaucracy involved. But once you're there, I think it's a good partner to work on long-term uh, innovations. Mm. Great insights from everyone. So what I would like to do is open up the questions to the floor. Are there any questions? So be so kind to <laughs> introduce yourself. Not Stormy, but please, go ahead. <laughs> This is why we choose it for this conference, because I'm so fascinated by it. Um, I do have a couple of questions. The first one is to Christina, because I just want to visualize um, what you're doing or what you're planning to do. Will there be big nets in the, in the space catching the debris, or how is that going to, going to work? Do just, just, I do have a couple of questions to the others um, before you answer. Um, this, the second question is, is um, who actually owns space? I mean, is it something we can divide up? I mean, there's a, a law for the seas, but there really isn't a law for space yet. Um, so who's, who's go going to get a piece of the pie and who decides that? And maybe all of you can explain that a little bit um, to me. And then um, the last question to, to all of you is, like, if you have a vision for 20, 2050, um, how is space going to look like? Um, is it really people on Mars or is it a gazillion of satellites up there or lots of debris flying around or um, how, how, is it, how is your picture um, at that time? So who would like to go first? Maybe Christina. Yeah, Christina. Uh, yeah so coming back to what Okapi Orbits does, so we're not in the field of active debris removal, so we're not cleaning up anything up there. Uh, but we monitor what's up there and simulate how objects are going to behave in relation to satellites, to micro launchers. So we say, okay, there are space debris coming to your satellite, you have to maneuver, and this maneuver has to look like X, Y, Z. So mm -hmm. this is basically what we are doing and using um, artificial intelligence to fuse these big data streams and to have a precise, holistic overview. So it's like flight radar 24 just for orbit. All right, who would like to take the question on who owns space? Basically, 
nobody <laughs> or all of us, uh, th there is um, a law um, restricting the militarization of space. That has been something out of a coexistence coming from this mad concept, mutual assured destruction. What we see is uh, when the ABM treaty was cancelled by the Bush administration, by the second Bush administration, uh, that was a sign for the Russians and for the Chinese that their second strike capability is being threatened. So this race to dominate the commanding heights in space is on. And every test, the one by Russia that you mentioned, the, pre uh, uh, the, the Chinese one a couple of years ago, I think in 2007, the American capabilities that are there, the hypersonic uh, thing, this all points to a race to dominate um, space in order to be the, the foremost military power on Earth. Uh, why did the Chinese uh, land uh, a rover on the dark side of the moon? That points to the future, to uh, the time frame that you mentioned, Stormy, 2050, where increasingly rare Earth uh, um, uh, things that you need in order to dominate uh, uh, current and future technologies will not be found on Earth anymore, but will be found on asteroids, on, on the moon, on other planets. And this is about uh, buying a share into future capabilities. Uh, this might be something that we experienced on Earth in the 16th and 17th century, where um, the spots on the globe included many white spaces. The white spaces today are in space. And the more you develop a technolo technological capability, which was in the past uh, uh, steam or, or, or uh, uh, gunpowder or something, uh, space technology will kind of tell others what uh, you are capable of doing in space and dominate uh, uh, value, value chains uh, in the future. This is my view, at least. Therefore, it's important that Europe has, has uh, some skin in the game. All right, any other remark on, on that one? Matthias? Um, concerning who, who owns space, there is an outer space treaty, uh, international one, uh, from the 60s. And um, it says pretty much that uh, all nations, all humans, um, should have a fair and equal access to space. And space is something that belongs to, to, uh, to mankind as a whole and not to one country uh, specifically. Um, so th th there is, let's say, a kind of um, common understanding, but I think we need to update that. Because in the um, Outer Space Treaty, for example, there is no mentioning of asteroid mining. So um, the German approach to asteroid mining is, because it's not mentioned in the Outer Space Treaty, it is not allowed, and we don't do it, and we don't want to be involved. The US approach is, it's not mentioned, and therefore it's of course allowed, yeah, because it is not mentioned. Um, and, 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 and I think we need to very quickly update this Outer Space Treaty, because as soon as asteroid mining and other activities starts, and uh, some countries will have their first uh, cake, uh, the, piece, the piece of cake of it, um, it, it will get very, very difficult to, uh, let's say, to, to, to update that anymore. So we need, and that would be my looking at 2050, um, my, my vision or what I would, I would hope for is that we get an update of the Outer Space Treaty, that we have a common understanding when it comes to uh, using space, using the, uh, the LEO, the low Earth orbit, that's uh, where all the satellites at the moment are, so um, that we address uh, space debris, that we address on the international level things like asteroid mining, and, and then I, I think we will have or could have a 
kind of fair competition in space, and this will drive innovation, new technologies. And I'm 100% sure that uh, uh, we will reach Mars, that we will colonize Mars, that we will have permanent present on the moon. Uh, I think it will come faster than many believe because the innovation cycles are so fast at the moment. And um, I think if we get, let's say, the, uh, the challenges sorted out, it will be a very exciting future. Yeah, thanks a lot. I what I would like to do is because there are some questions coming from virtual participants. Um, one is, and that is probably a question to you, Sabine. So what does privatization of space and space flight mean for AI? What role does AI play here? That's a good question. <laughs> um, I'm not quite sure if I know that uh, from, from A to Z. I think that um, space flight and all the, the whole space branch is, uh, since we are um, always a little bit uh, ahead and we are very innovative and we have to develop um, technologies uh, that um, that should be innovative in in five years. Um, we are we have that very close connection to AI. But to be honest, I'm not really sure for from from today's perspective, um, flying to space with launchers, and it's really not that important if it's um, uh, with humans or not. Um, is more. Um, it's a hardware thing uh, dealing with physics because once you have to uh, you have to get the step from Earth, gravity is something that is very important for that, and um, most of the of the rockets that we know today um, they are not really I know, stupid rockets, but uh, f they are rockets. So I don't think that um, AI has been. Uh, really a big thing in the development of the actual rockets, but um, since we have to uh, be be aware of AI in everything that we develop, um, this will be, of course, uh, be a big part in future developments, but not only for space flight, uh, for rockets uh, going to space, but especially for infrastructure in space. So satellites and um, especially constellations, um, yes, they have to work with AI in the future. All right. Um, there's another question that is, AI is often seen as a useful tool in space exploration, especially when it comes to a task humans are not able to perform. So what are the challenges? What role does AI play in Mars exploration? Anyone prepared for that one? Andre? short remark on, on exactly that topic. Um, since it takes a while and you have to um, ensure um, steady oxygen flow, uh, uh, evaluate the overall situation, and um, it takes a long time for communications to reach Earth, to react back and so on, you need uh, AI systems integrated into a Mars spacecraft uh, in order to ensure the survival of those astronauts, cosmonauts, taikonauts, however you call them. Everybody will need them. The Chinese, the Russians, the Americans, the Europeans. And um, another field where AI is being used is to reach 2050. Uh, to avoid misunderstandings. Remember that incidents uh, incident in, in the middle of the 80s where a Russian officer decided that uh, it was not an American attack but uh, some geese flying over Siberia or over Alaska. In the future, and we are lucky then, you need AI systems telling this is a serious threat um, because the reaction time, hypersonics was mentioned, is becoming shorter and shorter. And a president in the US that turned 79, that will be woken at half past three in the morning uh, before he understands what is the matter, because the chain of command puts through uh, the information to him. You need at least some double check by AI systems that this is not a, a matter of survival. 
Uh, thanks a lot. So regarding time, we have to come to an end. But before that, I would like to come back to Stormy's great question and, and address this to Lars. So from the vision point of view, so what can we expect like in 50 years time regarding space and utilization of space? I think no one knows. Uh, that's unfortunately the case. So whatever happens, um, if I would say what I would, would like to happen, I think um, the space topic could become a topic where people, societies say, let's not waste money on space. Just before we spend a billion on space or something, let's just raise rents, for example. So I think that's, that's really a question that is under addressed. Um, how open and willing societies are really to move into that very, very far reaching kind of innovation area. I think quick wins are very important, as always. So um, maybe we find ways when it comes to the ecological impact of production, maybe we can bring it in, in, into, into parts of the outer space area um, to prevent ecological impact of some you know, production issues on Earth. Um, I think all the energy issues um, maybe might be not solved by using space tech, but I think it could be better addressed, maybe. Um, and if we would find a way, maybe, you know, collecting kind of sun energy from space and bring it to Earth um, and find a way to, you know, uh, reduce CO2 and all these kind of things, I think that will completely turn around the perception about the impact of space tech and space-based research to mankind. Um, if that is not happening, I think um, space most likely will be a private dominated kind of innovation area. I don't see, or I think the development is completely open, whether it will be government driven, government owned or privately owned. Because when we talk about artificial intelligence, for example, we are not talking about government capabilities here. When it comes to AI, it's only private companies, private organizations who own the AI capabilities. No government is actually better than a private organization. And I think we will experience that in space also. So the game is completely open, whether we will have space as a government regulated area or an area where private organizations do whatever they can do because they can do it. Unfortunately, we have to come to an end. So thanks a lot um, to all your insights and remarks to my panelists. And thanks a lot to everyone participating in the room and uh, virtually. So thanks a lot. Thank you so very, very much. Um, after a lot of food for thought, there is now food for you outside. We do um, now have a lunch break. Um, we will reconvene at um, 1.45, uh, according to my notes. Um, I hope to see you back here again. It was a wonderful panel. Thank you so much. And after the lunch break, we will um, dive a little deeper into uh, government capabilities. And um, we already heard a pretty pessimistic view um, on um, government smart money or not so smart money. And, um, and that there is, in German, we would say, um, a little bit um, Raum nach oben for improvement. And that's what we are going to look at after the break, AI and government capabilities and administration. So enjoy the lunch break and see you later again. Thanks so much. Back to our Aspen Artificial Intelligence Conference 2021. Um, after a really exciting morning, um, we have um, another whole set of exciting uh, topics for this afternoon, um, exciting panels, discussions, and panelists. And it is a particular pleasure welcoming um, now to the stage Corinna Kreza. Um, she is an expert not only on artificial intelligence issues, but also government issues, administration issues. Um, and um, you can tell us a lot what we need to improve with regard to administration, good administration um, and innovation. Um, she is um, Senior Managing Director and part of the Managing Board of Accenture ASG, and that is Austria.
Austria, Switzerland, and Germany, not Australia. <laughs> this is why, why um, I took extra care with Accenture. And um, I have to say, um, I always loved working um, with Accenture when I was uh, still at BDI um, and responsible for, for the business 20, um, Accenture was one of the leading forces in also bringing gender um, issues um, onto <laughs> gender gap issues um, and diversity issues into the equation. Um, and, uh, and you did some wonderful work on the international um, scene. And now they are wonderful work in supporting us in the Artificial Intelligence Conference. Um, thank you so very, very much. Um, we will hear a kickoff talk, um, first by you, but then we will also have a discussion up here um, with a person you've already heard and seen this morning, Lars Zimmermann, um, and he's going to join us in, in a few minutes. So the floor is yours. Thank you. Always a little bit strange to stay in front, uh, to, to stand in front of a very um, empty room, but nevertheless, I hope we got many people out there who watch it um, online. So it's really a pleasure to speak here on the Aspen Conference. And once again, thank you for the warm welcome. And today it's about the future of public sector in Germany. And having in mind that just last week, the designated German government published the coalition agreement, there couldn't be a better time to talk about that. And indeed, if you look in the coalition agreement, uh, state modernization is center stage. And there's a strong focus on digital transformation and innovation. We see a lot of bold ambitions, and it's really the time to get it right this time. If you look at it, there's a clear need for action. And I think we are all aware of the challenges we are facing. It's not only about managing the current pandemic. It's also about the need to achieve the UN development goals, and also not to forget to really maintaining our competitiveness in an increasingly divided world. So Germany and Europe really needs to fight for the competitiveness in this space. So what do we need? We definitely need bold political decisions, but I think it's also clear that we also need a strong government and a strong public administration because to bring political decisions into action, we definitely need a strong public sector in Germany. If we look at the public sector and the public administration today, and we heard it today in the morning, I think, Lars, you were also mentioning it, there's room for improvement. We need to act a bit differently. It's topics around user centricity. If you think about, for example, how applications for approval should happen to really make all the investments which are supposed to happen in the near future when it comes to climate change and so on. If we really want to have it as a kind of impact, these processes need to change, need to manage subsidies in a different way. And we also need to make sure that project management happens in a more professional manner to really deliver reliable results. So overall, we definitely need creative solutions and we need to leverage new technologies. And if you bring it together, it's about really having applied innovation in the public sector. If you look at where we are starting at, it's not very impressive compared to other states where Germany currently stands. We are far behind our aspiration level as a fourth largest national economy. But if you look at scores like, for example, the DESI index, the European index for digitization from 2021, Germany is number 16 out of 27. If we look at the um, e-government monitor from D21, which just recently got published, it, all, it also states that the state itself is progressing only slowly and lags far behind developments in business and private life. So why are we doing so slowly, so poorly compared to other states? I think there are a few reasons behind it, and I only want to cover some of them. 
One is definitely if you look at the German constitution, because our German constitution ensures departmental sovereignty. It's about federalism and local autonomy. And that's all for good reasons, don't get me wrong. But at the same time, it makes large-scale transformations if you want to do something cross-ministry or cross-level, definitely more difficult. And there are also soft factors which we need to take into account if we're talking about innovation in the public sector in Germany. So the German administrative culture is based on Max Weber, on his organizational sociological understanding. And according to Max Weber, bureaucracy is a formally most rational form of exercising power. But what does it mean? It's characterized by consistency, precision, tautness, and reliability. And all that together causes silo structures, which we see in many areas, risk avoidance, and definitely also a lack of um, aero culture. Mehr Fortschrittwagen, dare for more progress. That's the theme of the designated new government, and this also needs to become true for the public administration. So if you want to make a difference, we definitely need change. So what needs to be changed to really bring out the potential of innovation in the public sector? I would like to cover four different areas. First of all, technology, culture and skills, new work, and governance. Let me start with technology and also to be very clear, also coming from a tech company, technology does not solve everything, but it's definitely an important basis. And when we are talking about digital governance, we definitely need a sovereign cloud. And this is not only about having any kind of infrastructure services and having a scalable infrastructure, it's much more also the basis for modern and flexible data management. And without modern and flexible data management, we will not be able to leverage AI in any way. It's also the platform for joint development and use of solutions. So it's not necessary that each and every agency does, it, oh, does his or her own, its own kind of, of solution. And therefore, it is very important that we establish a sovereign platform which is used across all levels of government or public administration, so federal, state, and local. And the good thing is, if you look at the current cloud strategy of the public sector in Germany, it's hinting in that direction that the the objective is really to have one joint platform for all three state levels. This leads to my second technology point. We also need a modern service architecture. And we see, we talk quite a bit about online Zugangsgesetz, the online access law, with that kind of einer für alle concept, one for all concept. I think that's something which we also need to apply for internal processes within the administration, within the government, to really make sure that we standardize and leverage synergies as far as possible to really speed up in, in bringing stuff forward. And finally, we definitely also need a digital identity, a digital identity for each and every citizen in Germany, which is safe, and which is easy to use. So much on technology, but as said, technology is not everything. Culture and skills are also very key levers. And I also mentioned, already mentioned the point around um, lack of aero culture. If you look at the culture of public sector in Germany, it's pretty much around avoiding mistakes. And this is in quite a bit of a contradiction to innovation, because if you want to innovate, you also need to try out stuff. And you also need to take into account that you will fail. And fail fast is one of the themes of agile organizations. If I always want to make everything correct, I will not be innovative. So the public sector really needs to provide room for a culture where I can innovate, where it's allowed to make mistakes, where it's allowed to fail. And of course, experimentation clauses, agile ways of working, digital labs, and so on, are all levers to push that kind of innovation. But I think we also need to take 
or keep in mind that it also might need a bit of change in the way media looks at public sector and the way how failures are covered in media. And we also might need to rethink the way that the Court of Auditors is currently acting when it comes to public sector pro uh, projects. Besides culture, of course, it's also about skills. And this will definitely not be a one-off exercise. And it's not only about training IT people in the latest technologies. It's about basic technical skills for each and everybody in the public sector. It's about not only having an IQ, but also having a TQ, a technology quotient, which is needed. Because if, when we are talking about innovation, digitization, we need both sides. We need the IT side, but we also need the functional experts. So it's about new technologies, new methodologies, new ways of working, and this will never, never stop. It's going to be an ongoing process. So we had technology, culture, and skills. Let's talk about new work, because new culture and skills will only have an impact if they're applied in the day-to-day -day work. Therefore, the organizational framework and prerequisites need to be changed as well. What do I mean by this? We need to think about work location, we need to think about career paths, we need to think about role requirements, we need to think about compensation, incentives, and so on, when we are talking about civil servants. And last but not least, I want to focus on the fourth area, the area of governance. So the right governance is a key lever for large-scale and speedy transformation of the entire government. And all of you probably <laughs> followed quite a bit the discussion around, do we need a dedicated ministry for digitization, yes or no? From my perspective, it should not be about the question, do we need a ministry, yes or no? It is rather about the question, which governance really fuels a speedy digital transformation? And we did a study together with Professor Korte from the NRW School of Governance. And what we looked at is what does successful digital governance look like? So more precisely, we were interested if having a digital ministry would really improve our DAISY index in the near future. And so what we did, we analyzed the digital governance of three countries, which are quite far ahead in the DAISY index, so they are ranked high on the one hand side, and they improved quite a bit over the last years. And surprisingly, none of them got a ministry for digitization. But all of them definitely have governance structures in place, and they all have a central place, a central office, where the threats of digitization come together. And if you look at it a little bit closer, they have five aspects in common. First of all, that kind of central organizational hub, which got the mandate to really drive digitization. They got clear cross-level collaboration models, so it's absolutely clear who is responsible for what and how the interfaces work together. They got the right people and the right skills on board, not only a few, but enough of them. And, and I think that's also a key element, they got a clear budget responsibility how to spend money on what kind of projects to spend money and how to drive digitization forward. And they are also focusing on synergies for joint progress created through targeted knowledge ex exchange. So technology, culture skills, new work and governance, all are key levers to drive innovation in the public sector and to make a real impact in the new way public administration brings political decisions into act action. With that, I want to stop here, and I would like to ask Lars on, on, on stage for a more detailed discussion on what can we change in terms of innovation in government. So. Lars, maybe we, we, we start with a short introduction of the GovTech campus. So you are one of the masterminds behind the GovTech campus. What kind of role, what kind of objective does the GovTech campus have when it comes to innovation in the public sector in Germany? 
First of all, thanks for having me and, and explaining what the GAFTA campus does, who hasn't opened yet, so uh, we are in the last phase of uh, preparing the official opening. So it's basically about bringing external innovations to government and the public sector. So we believe that there's a great technology scene, not only in Germany, but also in Europe, and government and public sector um, can collaborate with these companies uh, to bring the solutions into government, to strengthen the tech scene, and then, of course, in the long run, uh, to provide what we are also you know, naming as the digital uh, sovereignty aspects. If you want to be sovereign on tech, you need to be able to have your own tech that you can use. And the best way to do it is strengthen the own tech scene, use your products and solutions. And bringing this together um, is the main mission of the GAFTA campus. And, and, and what kind of concept do you have to really Im improve or, or mm -hmm. strengthen that kind of collaboration between the different parties, really play that kind of ecosystem? Yeah. First, it's a governance model, which is really pretty unique. So uh, we did great research globally and said, um, is this the first kind of GAFTA campus of that kind? And we can say yes. Um, so basically, um, for the first time in Germany, um, the federal government, the lender, so which is the main regions uh, in uh, Germany, we have 16 of them, and in the long run, uh, also the city level. We have uh, uh, over 11,000 city governments in Germany, quite a lot. So the, the main question was, how can we bring them together in one institutional setting? And um, the GAFTA campus, for the first time, is where all these three layers can come together in this one entity, which is the GAFTA campus, which is pretty new. Um, but that's not enough. We said, um, OK, um, it doesn't make sense that only government is doing this. And it wouldn't also make sense if only the tech scene would provide something like this. So we said, why not trying it out and bringing the technology scene, the startup scene, the investors, the developers, the founders, the entrepreneurs, together with these government layers? Let's also integrate the top research organizations on applied research, which is important. And um, of course, um, let's also bring in uh, the nonprofit um, um, agencies. There are a lot of nonprofits who do great stuff on you know, data security, who make up their minds about um, the sovereignty issue. So bringing the, what I say always say, bringing the best of breed together from the GovTech scene, um, providing them with that platform where they can actually um, co-ideate, co-create, and co-learn to, together. You just mentioned what you think has to be done. Um, and we said, okay, we need to build a platform where this is possible. And maybe as a last word, we don't do that only as a hybrid model or a mm -hmm. virtual model. Um, we felt like um, a good way to bring this GovTech scene together is also to provide a co-innovation space, so really a location uh, where government agencies can send their digital teams in, where startups will be, where investors will be, where civil society will be. So providing them with an opportunity to, first of all, meet and see each other and know about each other. Um, and of course, Germany is a highly federalized country, so we organize the campus in a way that we will open not only a campus place in Berlin, which is pretty nice, um, we are also planning op opening up the GAFTA campus in other uh, lender. Um, we started with Hamburg and Hesse, um, which are two very entrepreneurial kind of countries when it comes to um, digitizing of government, but we're also negotiating with many other Bundesländer. Yeah, and I had the opportunity to visit the location in Berlin, and I must say it's really impressive. It's really top-notch in, in, in terms of innovation space, and I think we are all looking forward when it's opened. <laughs> Everyone does. <laughs> okay. So, Lars, let's, let's get a little bit more in, in, into what we expect from the kind of next government. And um, I talk quite a bit about the prerequisites for, for innovation. Is there anything specific from your point of view, what you would like to ask from the new government to really provide space to, to really drive innovation and bring mm -hmm. it forward? Well, the first thing I think is <clears throat> to understand that it's not about technology in the first place. So um, Germany loves to, about it, to talk about technology all the time. I like technology very much, but that's not the most important kind of stuff. Yeah. So you just mentioned it. Um, I think leadership is very important uh, and the organizational and the cultural issue is very yeah. important. So I don't want to say that you know, the outgoing government had no leadership behind it, um, but I think that our focus was far too 
um, you know, we, we focus too much on processes, like we have a government service and it was very analog, so we digitize the service and now we have a digital government service. That's basic stuff. So um, it doesn't sound nice, but I also tell this to government officials, so it's just not blaming them here. Um, for example, what we do right now in Germany when it comes to digitizing the, the government services is pretty much nothing else than digitizing the past. Mm -hmm. Because what we actually do right now is what other countries did 10 years ago. So it's great that it's done, and I'm quite sure in two, three, and four, five years we will have a very basic uh, kind of top-notch uh, digital services. But there's no addressing right now about what is the impact of artificial intelligence, um, what technologies can be used to make governments better, yeah. how do technologies change the way government is operating. So, and this is what we want to address. So how does it have to be? I think it's definitely necessary that we don't see digitizing of government like a procedural kind of thing, which is a nice to have. I think it's a strategic issue of any government in the future, because if democracies are not getting technological savvy, what I call it, I think they won't be able to survive. So that sounds very harsh, but if you have a look around the world, um, if you own technologies, if you're capable, we had the artificial intelligence aspect. Right now, if you look around the world, no government is artificial intelligence savvy. So all the um, all the skills, they are based in private companies. Mm. Um, and sooner or later, um, the government will not be able to speed up with them. And of course, there will be then the question, who just owns the power of AI? And if you own the capability, you own pretty much of the value chain and you own pretty much of the things that you can do in the society. So leadership is important. And maybe as a second and last point, um, this is the organizational issue, um, not only in Germany, but especially in Europe. We have to think that governments are pretty much organizing the way they have been organized 150 to 200 years ago. Prussia in Europe was very famous. We all like Prussia. They did a lot of great stuff when it came to renovating how a state is run. Um, but um, we are now in the same situation. So we have a federalism that has been invented at a time where uh, you know, nothing we use on a daily basis ever existed. Um, there was no internet, there was no iPhone, there was no platform business. Um, so I think it's time to, um, you know, j just ask the question, if we want to become a digital savvy government, to make government better, that's very important, right? Yeah. Um, what do we have to do to actually do it? And I think it should be time to think about, do we have to have a new uh, process to change the way federalism is working, what we call in Germany the Staatsreform, it's a big word, but I think it's definitely time to update federalism because the context right now that Germany has to operate in, like any other European government, also the US government, if you ask me, is completely different from what we had even 20 years ago. And um, I think especially the German federalism is not capable in, in addressing these issues the way it sh could be. And I don't want to make an argument to get rid of federalism. I'm a, I'm a big um, fan of the, the federalism way. Um, but I think we have to adapt it to the technological context. And I think especially when we are talking about federalism, it's sometimes also used as an argument in, con in a context, in a technology context, where you wouldn't need to talk about federalism. Yes, You can of find solutions of collaborations that yeah. keep the federalism. So. Absolutely. That's, I think, sometimes very easy excuse as well. Yeah, <laughs> some of I the agree. points. <laughs> so um, I guess you already also had a look in the new coalition agreement and the different initiatives, topics, ambitions which are in there. And when we get a new government in place, um, it's also about really realizing first achievements fast. So are there any kind of topics, initiatives, climate change, whatever, yeah. <laughs> where you would start if you would be in government to really demonstrate that they can deliver results which are tangible for, for the citizens? Yes, so the question is, will it happen? I don't know, but of course, I think on an organizational level, every ministry, for example, on federal level, but also on the lender level, um, they have all the requirements and prerequisites that they you know, need to change the way how a ministry is working. I know that this sounds a little bit ridiculous. The Germans here who, who know how German government system is working, it's not easy to change it, but they could immediately do it. So we have in Germany right now, so this huge debate about agility in government and government organization, and I like it and I think it's right. But 
um, too often we talk about this as a theoretical concept only. So it, when I you know, talk to government officials that, you know, take the first five processes in your ministry and make them agile and do it. Just not wait for anyone telling you that you have to do it, so just change it. And if it's mm. just a very simple process. So I think it could have been done already, mm. but there's a reason why they're not doing it, right? Because everyone waits for this grand strategy that someone says we will change it in whole, whole government. Mm. So the ownership about doing things by yourself without waiting for someone else is also a mindset and a cultural mm -hmm. issue that I think should be addressed. And that could be a quick win. I think what's great um, in the coalition agreement is that there will be, for the first time, a kind of a, this one single budget when it comes to um, digital projects. Um, I think that that will help to um, to to make things a little bit quicker um, because it's clear where the, where the money comes from. And if you work with government very often, um, the idea, everyone said it's a great idea, but the time that really is a little bit exhausting is um, watching the government to check where the money comes from. So that, mm. that, can, that can take years, right? So that will speed up the processes a little bit. Um, and I think um, digital identity is something that you also yeah. mentioned. I think that's really something where Germany has to speed up tremendously because without digital identities, you won't be able to digitize government. It's very simple. And I think the, the situation which we had with the digital identity is a perfect example of, of an error culture at the end. Absolutely. Because they yeah. tried it, they did it very fast, yeah. I think they did it they just could keep on and, and, and fix the issues. Absolutely, and there's another thing that yeah. I think um, gives us a lot of pressure, and that is that Apple, for example, a few months ago, they did an announcement saying um, that you can upload your ID in the wallet, so I think we all, most of us, uh, use um, Apple Pay, so and uh, nine states in the United States uh, just agreed that the driver license can, you know, be uploaded in the wallet, and you can uh, use that. Um, so, and this is for the first, really for the first time, where one of the big platform companies just moves into the GovTech scene because yeah. we all use Apple. The most of us, not everyone, but most of us, we have the hardware, they have the software, they have the brand, they have the design, and from one day to another, Apple moved into the GovTech scene. So, um, if governments don't do it companies like Apple will become huge, important players within the GovTech scene. My projection is that they will be already a yeah. big uh, player yeah. in this. Um, but this is something that a lot of government officials, I, I won't say that they don't understand it, but I think that they don't really um, want to you know, deal with that question, is that there is, there is competition for governments. A lot of governments believe there's no one else who can compete with us because we are the only government, right? But Companies like Apple and Amazon and all the others, want, they, they are competing with government services, and that, of course, means that there will be competition for governments. Absolutely. Look at the Corona app. It's based Something on like Apple that. and Google right. <laughs> technology and, yeah, at the And end. we saw that also in the space issue. So the more, yeah. um, the, the, the more relevant private companies are because they have the capabilities, and it also is the same with the data issue, right? So just look into health tech. Um, if you want to analyze all, all health data, there are very. There are only companies who are capable in doing it, yeah. not a government organization. So, if the government wants to actually do it, they need to hire a company that has the people. They can pay the people much better than any government would ever pay them. Yeah. So, there is, you know, a shift of power because it's not about you know who owns the biggest armies, for example. If you have a technological capability that needs a lot of investment, it's very it's not easy for government to cope up, and that means that power is shifting to that kind of private organizations. Absolutely. Let's look at it from a different angle. You're an absolute expert in the startup scene. Is there anything which government could learn from the startup scene? <laughs> Well, yes and no, because you can't really compare yeah. a government system with a startup organization. Completely agree. Yeah, yeah. But in, in terms of innovation, yes, agility, sure. being yeah. fast, trying stuff. Sure. So, um, I mean, there is this kind of risk thing. So, I think if you know that the risk is calculable for yourself, every startup founder would take the risk, right? Saying, okay, there is a risk in everything, life is a risk, um, but we're just taking it because we feel like it's calculable for us. Government needs to have a 200% uh, insurance that is, will be working. And 
it's a little bit sarcastic because the government is waiting a long time to have this kind of two two hundred percent certainty. So the, the longer you wait, um, the more the more likely it is that it doesn't work, right? So having a little bit more this kind of risky attitude it doesn't mean that government has you know to spend money wherever it wants to. So it doesn't mean that you that you, sh you that you sh shouldn't evaluate how risky the business is that you want to do. But I think you can learn from that. I think hiring processes are totally forgotten in government. Um, startups scale and grow because they are capable in hiring great talent. The yep. HR uh, perspective is very important. And there is a reason for that why the best people don't want to go to government. They go to a lot of startups because you know they have the working environment there, not only physically with nice offices, but also they just know they can grow, they can learn and all that stuff. That brings me to the last point, and you also mentioned it, um, the learning things, yeah. also, um, what skills do you need to have? So we have 4.8 million people working in German public sector. Um, it's very likely that um, um, there will be a gap in talent also in the next 20 years because there's a shortage of talent um, and the public sector will experience it. So there is the need to skill up or to upskill um, the uh, um, uh, public administration people. Uh, and of course, there are a lot of you know, programs, but I think they don't address the tech issues properly. So there is one goal, and that would be also wish for German government, just build the best education program for public administration when it comes to tech. To, um, uh, tech. There is no upskilling program right now from the German government to all the cities and all the lender, and that would be something very, very easy to actually do because you need to have a very skilled workforce. Absolutely agree, and, and I think it's really not only the IT people, it's around each it's and every... It's really everywhere. So we just experience it when we go out to Lender because of the campus. Um, yeah. So um, you have, and that's, that's a good thing in German government. So you can go to every city, you can go to every Bundesland, it's always a kind of the same. So you have CIOs, CDOs, you have the head of the HR department. So there's a lot of, um, there are a lot of people who have the same role and sales function. So you can easily do some kind of peer-to-peer -peer learning. So yeah. there are a lot of countries and a lot of lender and a lot of cities who do a great job and other cities can learn actually for them. So it's just like providing them a platform where they can actually do it and where they can reach out to the tech scene. So this is also what, what we want to do at the GavTech campus. We want to bring best of breed content-wise to the campus, mm -hmm. create you know, skills, create um, the learning modules with them, and then provide it to everyone. Uh, one of the partners will be Stanford, the mm -hmm. um, Institute for Human-Centered uh, uh, Human Artificial Intelligence. And we will work with Stanford to provide, for example, several courses when it comes to algorithms and what the impact to government. Perfect. I think we need to come to an end. <laughs> Um, so many thanks, Lars, for that very interesting conversation and discussion. And ladies and gentlemen, I think it's about waking up a sleeping giant, <laughs> which was the title of, of our talk. <laughs> and there's a lot of potential in the public sector, and I think we just have to harness it, bring it to the right governance, building the right structures, and then I think we can really turn into action. And with that, Thank you for your attention. Thank you for listening. And have fun with the rest of the Congress. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, this was an excellent uh, panel. We don't have any qu time for questions right now. I'm really sorry because our next discussions and panelists are already waiting in the waiting room. Um, and our moderator is also already here. Um, we don't do a big break now. Just a few minutes uh, to get our moderator set up to um, get the stage set up and then we continue. But let me thank you so much again um, for sharing your insight with us. Um, I want to make a connection between your panel and the next one and share a little anecdote with you. We talked about cybersecurity at another conference not long ago, a uh, panel discussion, and we talked about German federalism there um, as well. And if it's a good idea to have so many different agencies trying to take care of the security of cyberspace, and one of our panelists said, 
well, you know what? Resilience is also about redundancies and not giving too many access points. And I mean, who from the outside would really know who to attack with so, such a complicated system? And that's the first time that I heard that our complicated governance system was actually a part of building resilience. <laughs> so there's always two sides of the coin. Um, thank you so very much. And um, yeah, we should take use of giving applauses as long as we see each other here physically. <clears throat>
uh, and and pushing that discussion into that into that venue as well. So um, we also have been dealing with obviously the uh, um, dealing with ransomware attacks and the. Uh, United States started a counter ransomware initiative with countries like Germany and uh, uh, thanks to Germany for chairing the diplomatic track of that effort. So I would say um, I admire the longstanding uh, leadership and, and partnership that we have with Germany. Thank you. So Mr. Schwimmer, what's your answer? <clears throat> there are so many <clears throat> different ways uh, different areas what we can admire from the United States. One is um, what Ms. Franz has already said is regarding the areas of, let's say, partnership and cooperation. I would add, if I may, so one area, this is friendship. I think um, our two countries are, are real friends. And there we are working very close together. And that, that's not just a rational behind it, but this is also a kind of feeling behind this. And that's where I'm very grateful for. And what I admire that uh, if you are, if you have generated this kind of friendship, it's a long-standing friendship and partnership. And this is what I admire there in, within the U.S. The other area is, of course, the so-called can-do mentality. And this is what you see very strong in, in the area of, let's say, innovation. Like, for example, on the industry side and the entrepreneurial side, um, when I look to the Facebooks, Amazons, Googles, or Alphabets of this world, or Tesla, I think there's a, a very strong creative um, potential in, in this area. And I think this is something that can be also a kind of benchmark for us within Germany. And then number three is, from my perspective is not just talking, but also walking. So I think it is great that there, um, when I, if I remember well, when we met last time in uh, Washington, uh, uh, with France, right? And then uh, the German embassy, whenever I look to the different kind of discussions we are facing with Caesar and, and the other guys within the administration. And there, I, I must say, what I admire always very strong is that it's a creation of a plan and then implement this kind of plan. Just do it. And I think this is great and this is um, very important in this world in a digital way because this is a basis and a fundament for being successful. Information security for, for us, as you know, is a precondition of uh, successful digitization. And therefore, we, we, I think, have lots of commonalities to cooperate on in this area. Thank you, Mr. Schoenbaum. You mentioned the can-do mentality, and uh, you could say that the trillion-dollar package of the Biden administration is also a can-do thing. And it's not only about infrastructure like mobility or, or energy, it's also about cybersecurity. So, Mrs. Franz, maybe you can elaborate a little bit about what is planned and what's going to change under this package and this investment, this huge investment into cybersecurity. We can't hear you at the moment. <laughs> there we go. Can you hear yeah, me now? Yeah, perfect. Yes, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> After so many uh, of these virtual meetings, you think yes, that would be the forgot. first, <laughs> the first thing. <laughs> um, well, I think uh, one thing I'd like to say is that I think we have seen over the years an evolving but yet sort of remarkable change on the focus on cybersecurity in at the, the top levels of, of government, and that has been uh, very welcome. So when you see a uh, uh, new uh, policy or new packages or investment, uh, I, it's very it's very welcome. You know, here at the State Department, we work on international diplomatic engagement, but our... Um, efforts are complement and are strengthened by our strong partners in the U.S. government uh, that are, are doing more of the practical work to build, um, build technical resilience and incident response capacity. So with regard to the infrastructure package you mentioned, the largest share of cybersecurity related funding is for a $1 billion fund that will help state and local governments improve their cybersecurity preparedness. 
Um, we have our own version of a federated system, I suppose I would say, yeah. and uh, and uh, that, so that is, uh, I think, will be very welcome in that in that regard. Um, uh, there's a separate one million dollar, one hundred million dollar fund that will pay for response and recovery efforts from significant cyber incidents, and that, and then other funding goes to research to implement cybersecurity upgrades for uh, specific critical infrastructure sectors like public water systems, transportation systems, and energy grids, which then you can sort of see is part of the, uh, the uh, infrastructure package. Um, so that's the kind of thing that th th those kinds of um, investments are, I would say, uh, I would say probably the newest element mm -hmm. of the, the sort of evolving uh, policy and attention to uh, cybersecurity over the years. Um, and you were, and in Congress, there's a debate about the obligation to report ransomware attacks. If you pay a ransom, you have to inform the federal office. So is that something, Mr. Schönbaum, this regulation of the private sector and to learn more about incidents that happen that you wish for too? Would that something be, we have that for critical infrastructure, of course, but is that something that we need in Germany as well? Now you're mute too. You see, it happens to the best, so. Look, follow, follow the leader, so sorry. <laughs> so, um, so um, but, but I hope I, I did your, your question right, uh, Johannes. So, so if I understand well, we need something like a kind of, let's say, um, uh, a report yes. if, if, you are, if, if you have have a certain kind of attack. Yeah. So this is something, as you know very well, we have implemented since uh, 2016 with the IT security law 1.0. And we have enlarged it even on the IT, IT security law 2.0. And uh, as you know, currently, I think there are some discussions ongoing if it is legally still possible that you are paying a kind of ransomware mm -hmm. or not. This is, I think, currently under discussion of the, uh, within the Conference of Ministers of Interior, um, uh, if I read it correctly. So, so this is something I'm very easy. I like to get all the reports I can get so that I can have an overall situational picture. And that's what I need, these kind of reports. I need not just regionally and nationally, but also on the European scale and then on the international scale. And that's why I think it's so important that we are exchanging very close with our partners, for example, with CISA in the US, or also with, with NSA and the other partners we're having. So this is something what is of utmost importance for us so that we have an overall situational picture so that we can exchange views if we see some, let's say, new attacks like from Emotet coming, for example, um, the re rebirth of, a, of the dead king. If we see additional, let's say, users, usages of, um, of uh, weaknesses on Microsoft Exchange, what we are just seeing currently, where we are seeing uh, of, of the weakness here, and uh, if we, for example, see hey, that 3,000 uh, servers in Germany are not yet, let's say, updated and fixed, even if they had a month of time for fixing it. So, so these are areas what we have to identify, and yes, I would get as, as many reports as possible. So Mrs. Franz, I, I best thank you. Uh, that is something you would wish for too, right? Well, we certainly um, uh, agree that the, the situ building the situational awareness um, uh, picture is part of the part of the ability to address it. Uh, we do have, um, again, back to our federated system, <laughs> we do have um, breach notification legislation or laws in most states, if not all states at this point, um, for uh, companies or entities that need to uh, report, report on uh, breaches that they see that reach a certain threshold of the number of people that they might, uh, that they might um, uh, touch. Um, and so there's a similar, there's an, uh, have, has been for many years an attempt to make that a more national, uh, national law. And uh, as you rightly note, there is a discussion in Congress about um, uh, requiring reporting for uh, ransomware incidents and ransomware payments. Uh, where that will end up, I'm not entirely sure, but um, yes, there is a active, uh, active debate. And of course, those in 
uh, those of us in government, uh, like like uh, Mr. Shumum says, the more we know, the more we can uh, try to address not only directly as government, but also in partnership with the private sector and the technical community. Thank you. So um, you mentioned the cooperation between both of our countries. And uh, Mr. Schumann, you said um, we are friends. So how does this friendship look like on a daily, or not a daily, but you know, in the cyber world? What are you um, exchanging? What are you talking about? Are there regular meetings you interact? Can you tell us a little bit about it? Yes, of course. So uh, you're absolutely right. There are regular meetings. I myself be normally uh, twice a year uh, in the US. I see my counterparts as they are coming here to, to Germany or uh, to Europe, for example, also during the so-called Munich Security Conference. So there are on the, let's say, on the executive uh, side, there are exchanges, but there are also very technical exchanges uh, on preparing what is the right level of standardization, for example, on the way of artificial intelligence. What is the right level of standardization certification on high security areas like uh, 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 common uh, criteria certification? Or like, for example, the C5 standard or artificial intelligence C4 standard, um, there we are exchanging in-depth discussions, uh, one. Number two is what is the right level? We always try to learn. When I'm always there meeting with the Department of State, with my uh, counterparts and within the administration, but also when I'm on the Congress or uh, uh, Senate, uh, um, there I'm always, always having the questions, hey, what are you doing in, in, in Germany or in Europe on the legislative side? So, so what can we learn from each other regarding um, how, how to secure critical infrastructures, for example? And what is for you a critical infrastructure? How are you preparing if there's an attack? And there are also in this discussions, and last but not least, in case of an emergency, if something happened really, there we are having very, um, let's say, operational exchanges regarding threats, but also how to react on this, like, for example, on the, within the third community and so on. And therefore, I think it is more than just partnership, it's real friendship. Thank you. I have, uh, you said, case of emergency, and I think we all remember, or in case you don't, the audience and there was this huge ransomware attack on colonial pipeline and it was like very critical and i bet a lot of you also talked about and there was some exchange but mrs france did this incident or this almost a catastrophe did it change something in the perspective the public perspective but also in the level of alert you or you experienced in the united states <laughs> Well, unfortunately, unfortunately, there's nothing that focuses the mind like an incident that has uh, that has um, uh, implications for the public, right? Mm -hmm. So um, um, that the incident that addressed the Colonial Pipeline that had direct impact on what individuals see on a daily, you know, in their daily life, is uh, um, something that catches a lot of attention. Um, so yes, that was it. Um, Focus the mind. It focused some efforts, uh, as uh, Arnie said earlier. The, the um, do you know, finding something to do, setting a plan, and doing and implementing it. There was very rapid movement on on addressing um, the colonial pipeline issue, uh, addressing the critical infrastructure aspects, and of course then ransomware as well. Um, so uh, I, I think it uh, once again an incident has focused the mind. Um, but it did also prevent, present an opportunity, yet another opportunity for working together. I mean, as Arnie said, we have been working um, across uh, the interagency contexts, both in the U.S. and uh, Germany, whether it's working with our colleagues in the, our counterparts in the um, uh, German Ministry of Foreign Affairs, or whether uh, our incident response functions in CISA and and certs work together practically every day, I would say. Um, so we have been working on this full time for more, well, with regard to the sort of di diplomatic aspects of it for more than a decade and uh, the incident response for several. So um, I think we have um, made important progress on both. Um, and in, in, in an incident like uh, Colonial Pipeline or 
any of the ones we've seen in recent uh, in the recent years, uh, we have been trying to make sure that we have both the incident response and technical connection, but also um, um, looking at it from a, a foreign policy. You know, look, here at the State Department, we look at it as a foreign through a foreign policy lens. And for over a decade, we have been making important progress on defining what is the what is um, responsible behavior by state states in cyberspace. So while we have um, you know have to address an incident once it happens, we're also trying to set up what we have also been trying to set up the the what I what we would call the international environment. What is the expectation um, of the behavior of states in cyberspace? And we have had uh, quite success in doing that and setting up this framework that includes the applicability of international law to cyberspace, uh, a set of norms that um, uh, for responsible state behavior in peacetime, and what we call confidence building measures. Things like who are our points of contact with each other? What are our national doctrines? So that's how we look at it from a foreign policy perspective. But yet, when an incident like that happens, we want to be sure that uh, we have uh, partnerships that we can work with to address it in a, in a rapid way and, and, and dealing with it uh, both in a public fashion and in the technical fashion is, is something that uh, we, we work very closely with Germany on as well as, as, well as others. And uh, we have a, um, as Anya said, we have many opportunities to meet each other and under normal non-COVID times. <laughs> Uh, to address uh, to address any number of those issues, whether it's in a UN meeting or a, a conference of the international response, uh, the forum for Inter incident and security response teams is a global uh, a, a global community. Um, there's no shortage of meetings and opportunities to to meet, but we also have a regular ongoing uh, interaction uh, bilaterally as well. One thing that I didn't mention earlier is that um, to your question about how often we get together, we have had an ongoing US-Germany cyber dialogue. Um, and uh, while we have had that addresses thing, uh, uh, cyber issues across sort of the spectrum of foreign policy and incident response and capacity building um, and uh, things like that, um, that we are looking forward to revitalize in early 2022, hopefully in person. <laughs> Thank you. Um, Mr. Schonmom, the Colonial Pipeline was a very heavy incident. And I think uh, you also ask yourself, I would presume, what would happen if that, if that happened in Germany? So my question is not, could that happen in Germany? My question is, um, it was very present. Everyone could experience that something is bad, that something bad happened. So is it um, a f part of, un of the public unawareness when it comes to cyber incidents that it's not in the real world, that it's very disconnected from, from the daily basis? Is that where our unawareness in certain fields comes from when it comes to economy, for example, or private people? Uh I think you're right. Yes, absolutely. The, the challenge within cyber is, or cyber attacks is, you don't see it, you don't smell it, you don't taste it. The only issue what you're seeing is the result of a cyber attack. You saw it within Colonial Pipeline. You saw it regarding the billing and so on system there. You saw it within the hospitals. You know, be, because IT is so... It is so normal that it is working, that everything is running, running on it, but we don't understand quite clearly how, how much we are depending on IT, on, on working IT. And it is fascinating when you're having small children and you ask them, how are you going from A to B? They put it on a certain kind of navigator. I, I will not make any advertisement, but you know what I mean. And put it down and they will, will go exactly to where they have to go. But if this is not working, they don't know how to, how to use even a normal map in former times. So this is, we became more and more dependent on this one. We, within the colonial pipeline, we understood that this is not just hypothetical. 
And that means the same on all the different attacks, uh, wanna try and non-petia and so on before that. So, but this is also questioning how our real li life is depending on working IT. And therefore, for me, it became very clear, and that's why I'm so grateful that the German government understand it so well, that information security is not a cost factor, but information security is a precondition of digitization. That's, that's what we see every day. Thank you. Um, Mr. Franz, you are on the other side, like Mr. Schumann is the interior and from the title and from the organizational background, and you're then the foreign politics. So are you also raising awareness uh, among your colleagues or are you advising and helping them to understand? Because like Mr. Schumann said, the US and Germany, they are friends, but they are certainly not all over the world they are friends. So what are you, how are you advising, how are you helping your colleagues to understand cyber diplomacy? Oh, that's a, that's a great question. Um, well, first of all, since, um, well, I don't know, we've always had a very strong interagency uh, collaboration across the departments and agencies dealing with various aspects of the cyber problem, as you noted earlier, um, uh, or perhaps in the introduction to the, se to the session, there was a question about um, having uh, a number of agencies or departments that might be dealing with any aspect of, of uh, cybersecurity. Um, so we have had a very, I guess, robust <laughs> interagency discussion for many years. However, it became much more formalized um, about 10 years ago or more uh, in, a, um, in a, a deliberative process that, uh, that the interagency works on um, and included developing an international engagement strategy, and it included developing a cyber deterrence strategy. And both of those efforts have required a lot of engagement with our um, interagency partners, including how we might address um, uh, malicious behavior in cyberspace, what kinds of things can we do, what countries that we can partner with, and how we determine as a government when we might um, publicly attribute uh, any cyber incident to, to another state. Um, and all of those um, deliberations have been a very uh, um, active engagement process over the course of the past few years and resulted in not only building awareness from from our side about to our colleagues in the in the government about our uh, um, what we might do with partners internationally but also what for example the law enforcement community does with their partners globally or what the incident response community does with their partners globally so pulling all that together in this sort of deliberative process to come up with to come up with processes that we can that are repeatable and that we can rely on over time um, so I would say that that awareness has sort of been in, uh, intrinsic in that, in those uh, interagency processes. And it has been very useful to formalize the um, internal process for deliberation on things like a, a public attribute, a political attribution we might do um, uh, to, an, to another state. As part of that, we have been building um, our partnerships with uh, other countries or a coalition of countries that are willing to um, engage in that discussion um, and what to do about it, whether or not it's a political attribution, whether there are additional consequences that can be imposed on uh, states that are transparent, that are um, um, reversible if need be, and how we can utilize those things to really deter uh, states from taking that kind of activity in the future. So that is uh, an ongoing activity. Um, so I would say it's ongoing awareness as well. Uh, but that engagement with our interagency is very, uh, very robust, regular and deliberative, I'd say. Thank you. So I have tons of questions, but I think I will open up now for questions from the audience, if you have any. Otherwise, I would continue with my questions. Oh, we have one question here. I think we need a microphone. Microphone is coming. 
Hi, my name is Wolfgang Kleinwächter. I'm with the Global Commission on Stability in Cyberspace. And Leslie mentioned already the uh, uh, um, achievements uh, in the open-ended working group and the group of governmental experts in the United Nations. So, uh, but there is a second process now in, under the third committee of the General Assembly, uh, which is the negotiations on the uh, Cybercrime Convention will, will start in January. So uh, both Germany and the US have favored for many, many years the Budapest Convention, and we have just signed the second protocol. So uh, do you expect that something will come out from the UN process, in particular if it goes against ransomware or an attribution? Thank you. Do you want me to start? <laughs> yes, I think you, you nodded, so yeah. Uh, well, I'm sorry I can't see you, Wolfgang, but uh, nice to hear from you. Um, the, uh, well, yes, it is, um, the third committee process will start in January, and we have been um, uh, obviously following that very closely and wanting to make sure that the modalities for this discussion are, are acceptable. And it, it, it um, uh, our support and um, promotion of the, of the Budapest Convention has not waned at all. And in fact, I think uh, it would be very useful, continue to be useful to refer to um, the, the Budapest Convention as, as uh, not only um, the existing, but increasingly um, uh, adopted by other countries uh, as, the, as, the, as the standard for dealing with uh, global cybercrime issues. Um, so as we look towards those negotiations, we're looking at them very carefully for the right modalities, keeping the scope where it needs to be uh, in this discussion, not letting things uh, creep into other areas of cyberspace. Because one thing that we also uh, believe is that applicable, that existing international law is applicable to cyberspace and we don't need uh, another legal instrument or treaty to address cyberspace writ large. So keeping the scope and the, uh, um, the parameters for this uh, cybercrime uh, negotiation will be important to us. Thank you. Did you answer your question? Perfect. So, Mr. Schumann, I know you have to leave in five minutes. So, um, is there a question that Mr. Schumann should answer before he leaves us? Okay. Any questions from the. No. Okay. Then, I have a, another, then I have a question. And my question is. Um, the U.S. Is, are very um, bold when it came to, comes to naming and shaming, which comes from uh, attribution cap capacity and a very, very strong system there. Um, do you think that we need to be better with our attribution cap capabilities, or do we need a European concert to, to foster that? I think we have the appropriate capability, capabilities what we need for. For example, if you remember well, um, before the German elections, um, the uh, Ministry of Foreign Affairs made a very clear attribution um, uh, towards uh, a state, a different nation, regarding not to interfere with, with the German elections. So this is something what they have made very clear. The question is, uh, and that's a very political question, do we need it to be better in the future? Sometimes it's good to say, to attribute someone and say, yes, stop because we are watching you on the one hand on the other hand to be very clear I, i'm not so much afraid regarding the state actors we we see there day by day between 350 to 550,000 new malware programs new malware programs and most of them are coming out from organized crime so this is for us a challenge and if you are uh, an, an outlaw you don't care regard any convention or attribution. You just do it for earning some money. So, so this is for me, let's say, so these are the two pillars we are facing. And this is something we have both to be on a safe side. And therefore, I think, um, yes, if we do it on a European scale, I think it would be appropriate. But then there, the evidence has to be very, very clear and not just to, uh, with a certain kind of margin. 
trans the attribution thing is that something um, can you attribute a state that easily because every attacker will hide between like a single person or a group like uh, Mr. Schumann said someone who's not linked to a state or will say well we're just doing it for money and not for political uh, or ideological reasons. Uh, to whom is a question? Is it to, to me? Or sorry, Mrs. To, France. To, to sorry, Mrs. France. Well, certainly it um, uh, it certainly matters to um, how we respond uh, publicly or politically um, based on the actor, um, which is why we take a very careful approach to um, determining, you know, making making a, either a technical attribution on the one hand. Um, which, um, you know, we used to say attribution is very hard. Um, but I think that, um, as Arne mentioned, there's more and more capability for, for doing that. Um, oh, and the fact that we work together um, bilaterally and across other, with other countries and communities is very, uh, very helpful in that regard. But also, it also, when you're um, doing a political attribution or a public attribution or talking about ad addressing the act, the actor, um, uh, it, it may not be that you have to have every, um, every piece of evidence that you might have to have in, 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 in the technical attribution if you're following the trends, if you're following the, the, uh, the, um, following the money, say, uh, to be able to at least identify that there is malicious behavior um, and uh, can condemn the behavior, even if you can't go as far as calling out a specific actor. But as you um, have seen, the United States has done um, both political attribution to another state and also uh, called upon states to address what might the criminal uh, activity that might be coming from their territory, uh, particularly in uh, the recent ransomware cases. So there's varying ways that you can address um, the actor, the problem, and the and the um, acti the malicious activity that is, that is uh, going uh, happening. And I would say that the um, it's it's one thing for either one country like the United States or uh, Germany to, to make such an attribution, but it has far more impact if there are, if there's a community of countries that are able to make um, an attribution or a public statement about the behavior, or the actor, or, or the um, activity. Um, and so that is why we're working so closely with a number of countries and with the EU and utilizing uh, their, diplomatic, their diplomacy toolbox um, to to expand the landscape of countries that are are making such statements because that makes it much harder for either denial or um, for um, any one state or actor to retaliate uh, because the the landscape of countries that are standing up is so broad. So that is why we continue to to work with uh, Germany and other countries to do that. Thank you. So I have a question from the online audience, and it's about um, how do you get top talent for democracy, but also, I mean, uh, technology, um, when it comes that a private sector can pay much more than a state can? Mr. Schumann, do you want to start? Yes, so, so we are when I have been younger than I'm currently young, um, so uh, 30 years ago, something, um, and I started to go into business. It had been the time of Michael Douglas and Wall Street, this kind of movie. Greed is good and so on, you know? So at this, in this time, the young generation at this time wanted to earn money. That's the core of most of it. Today, the young generation, I understand, is very different. They like to earn some money, but they love to do something good. And they like to have a challenge. And they like to have a combination between, on the one hand, a professional life and a family life. So to bring it all together. So, so there, I think, the generation has changed. And 
this is exactly why we within BSI are having no big challenges regarding getting the right people because you're getting a perfect possibility to train yourself. You have the spearhead of, let's say, new technologies and you do something good for your country. And this is something, and then you have a right work-life balance. And this is something what is most important for them and it is much more making much more fun than just earning some money, doing some database, uh, let's say, analytics behind it. So this is very boring. And this is what the young people understand. And therefore, we are getting the right people. But the more challenging is regarding um, lifetime training and educating. So after hiring them, that's a bigger challenge from my perspective. I can hear the words purpose like in there. Mrs. Franz, would you like to, to, to add something? Oh, well, I'm glad to hear if the, um, that there is optimism for this younger generation, um, because I do think that, that uh, I, um, you know, I think for many, building up the workforce is a challenge, not just here in the United States, but other countries as well. And we, we often get asked about how, how uh, we can build that up. Obviously, a lot of it has to do with the education programs and the curricula that are put forward. And um, we have um, had an initiative um, in the government to deal with um, our education curriculum and uh, um, focus specifically on how to build up the cybersecurity um, uh, cadre of professionals. Um, I would say from a diplomatic standpoint, um, we also are seeing some um, um, uh, desire to do something for your country. And um, I think it's also too important, important to understand that not everybody that works on cybersecurity and certainly not everyone that works on cyber policy has to be a technical person. Yes, we probably have to have a little bit of understanding of um, the, trans, you know, the translation between the technical and the policy aspects. But, uh, for example, we find ways to uh, train our foreign service officers who are in embassies um, abroad to address the cyber policy issues that we have, or how to how to uh, work with the um, the element, what elements in any particular government may be dealing with cybersecurity and cyber policy issues. Um, so we've been proud of that part of uh, training our diplomats, um, but uh, that's a whole different um, sort of multidisciplinary way of looking at it. We also have a um, we also have a program in the government for uh, recruiting um, students from college into a program for uh, service. You know, we pay for their, the government pays for their college and then they ha have to serve in the government uh, in a cybersecurity capacity for a few years. And that has been very helpful, but um, I'm not sure that anyone would say it meets the need. Uh, so we're still we still find ways to fi finding um, exploring ways to to recruit <laughs> recruit and retain the talent because I think that's another issue, not Thank just you. getting them in but keeping them in. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you very much. So um, I just so have to step out. I'm so, I'm sorry. I just have to step out. <laughs> we are in I'm sorry. Bye. Thank you, Mr. Schumann. Good to see you. Bye. So since so we are over time, so I would close our exciting panel now. Thank you so much, Mrs. Franz, for your time and your expertise and your insights. And thank you all for listening. And um, back to you, Stormy. Thank you very much. Thank you. It's been a pleasure. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much for this wonderful uh, moderation. And I'm just so sad that Mr. Schwimboom had to leave before he got the applause. Um, I hope that he got a feeling um, how appreciated uh, or how appreciating we all were um, of this uh, exciting um, exchange. Um, we now have a coffee break. And we will reconvene again at uh, 3.40. And we are, um, <laughs> this is going to be another really exciting panel. I keep on saying this, but I really mean it. Because it's the chief, um, chief scientist of the WHO.
Oh, and um, I find it amazing that she makes the time um, to speak to us today because I'm pretty sure that she has a lot on her plate. So come back, um, both our <laughs> on-site audience, um, after you got some, something sweet and something um, with a little bit of caffeine, um, and certainly also our digital um, audience. Come back, it's going to be an exciting afternoon. Um, welcome back after a coffee break um, to the second part or almost third part of today's um, Espen AI 21 conference. Um, it has been already an enjoyable day um, and we are continuing with, with really exciting um, discussions. And it is a particular pleasure um, welcoming a special guest um, to us today um, who I know has a lot to do and a lot um, on your plate. So thank you so very much for taking the time joining us um, today. Um, it is a great pleasure um, announcing and introducing to you Dr. Sumaya Swaminata. She is the chief scientist of the WH. Oh, and why we have um, invited you to our conference, I don't, I don't think I need to explain this. Um, it has become um, a part of our everyday life to think about health, but also to think about digital health and the benefits of artificial intelligence. Um, thank you so very much for being here today. And since we have the pleasure of having a real audience also in the room, let us all give her um, a very big applause, not only for being here today, but what she's doing for us at the WTHO to make us uh, safe. So many, many thanks. Thank you. Thank you very much. And how we wanted to do this today, we wanted to give you the opportunity um, to speak to us for um, maybe 15 minutes, um, and then we would also love to ask some questions uh, to you. So the floor would be yours. Okay. Thank you so much, and um, many thanks for this, uh, this opportunity. And I think it's one of the examples of the good use of digital technology that we're able to connect like this, and it doesn't matter where in the world we are, we all can um, connect. And in fact, it's been quite, uh, that's been one of the real high points for me during the pandemic is this ability for us at WHO to be able to connect with networks of scientists and researchers and doctors from around the world from the beginning um, to really understand what's happening with this disease to get the latest information and the incredible passion uh, that scientists have shown and also their willingness to share information, share data. It's a completely different model from what it was in the past when um, academics would first wait to publish before you know talking about their research findings. But today, you know, we have data platforms like GISAID, which host uh, the genomic sequence data, um, over 5 million whole genome sequences from around the world. And that's the kind of global collaboration that has enabled us to keep track of this virus, to, to track its evolution, to track the variants. The fact that we have talking about Omicron today is only because we have this ability in real time. So it's really thanks to scientists all over the world. And this is why we feel sad when we see that countries are punished for their transparency, uh, particularly the you know South Africa and the neighboring countries have now been put on travel bans from many other countries. And uh, this is uh, a way of disincentivizing data sharing because then the next country to detect a new variant will think twice about declaring it if the reaction of the world is, is going to be to cut you off. It also impacts science because, you know, uh, supply chains uh, are all dependent on, on these transport links. And the moment those are snapped, you also have an impact on what can be done in laboratories. So, so I just wanted to make that uh, statement because I think I want to start with talking about equity. Equity is is I think at the center of everything we see today, including digital health, digital technologies and artificial intelligence, 
if we do not think about equity from the beginning, we are going to go wrong. And we can have the best algorithms and the best technologies and the best of intentions, but we will not be serving people uh, if, if we don't include uh, 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 equity. So in fact, I want to start with that because we started thinking about this in 2019 when the science division was set up and I was appointed as the first chief scientist at WHO. What are those cutting edge technologies that we need to be leveraging for public health and clinical medicine? And what should WHO be doing? And as you know, WHO is a normative agency. We do standards and guidelines and, and, and many countries depend on us um, and our guidelines. So we said, let's take two examples. One was artificial intelligence uh, for health and the other was genome editing. Again, a technology with immense potential for curing genetic diseases, but we had just heard about experiments by a Chinese uh, researcher to you know, have used genome editing to actually edit the genomes of embryos that were then uh, born as, as babies. In fact, those twins today are growing up. Um, and, and there were huge ethical concerns around that. So we took these two topics and we said, let's put together a multidisciplinary group of uh, experts who um, include not only the people who understand the technology and the science, but also people who uh, are from background of ethics, of law, of social sciences, philosophy, and so on. And we came up with a framework for the ethics and governance around artificial intelligence in health. And some of the principles that the group came out with were around equity and the digital divide. And you know, will, will the movement into digital technologies further exclude some people? and further exacerbate the health inequities. Second is around data protection. You know, how do you protect the, uh, I mean, everyone's talking about this and, and what we believe is that people are willing to share their health data for the better good, for the public good. If you can explain to people that their data is going to be used for a particular purpose and that it's not going to be used for, let's say commercial uh, gains or, or you know, won't be used for things beyond uh, uh, certain analytics which are useful for public policy. The third uh, thing to think about when you think about AI-based uh, diagnostics or AI-based treatment decisions is a liability. Who is liable if the algorithm makes a mistake? Is it the developers of the mm -hmm. algorithm? Is it hospitals? Is it clinicians? How will these tools potentially alter the relationship between providers and patients? Because traditionally the doctor makes the decisions and takes responsibility for them, but here you're, you're you know, allowing an algorithm to do it. And how do you regulate the private sector in this area, which includes several of the world's largest technology companies? And um, this committee concluded that ethically optimized tools and applications could sustain the widespread use of AI to improve human health and quality of life while mitigating or eliminating many risks and uh, worse practices. And uh, one of the good examples where AI could actually help uh, in public health is in TB, which is uh, tuberculosis is one of the uh, infectious diseases that actually kills uh, one and a half million people a year. It's the, it's the top infectious disease killer. It's uh, getting worse because of the pandemic and artificial intelligence algorithms, reading x-rays of people can actually differentiate there are many companies now that have developed algorithms which are quite sensitive and specific and potentially you could probably diagnose also cancer and other things. So, and COVID, it was used also to, to diagnose COVID pneumonia. Um, and, and so it could be used in many areas of the world where you don't have radiologists. This could potentially really be very useful to increase the diagnosis of uh, TB. And similarly, we're looking at another application on cervical cancer. Cervical cancer is one of the biggest killers, uh, the fourth leading cause of death due to cancer. And the, the deaths due to cervical cancer are disproportionately higher in the low middle income countries because of late diagnosis and late access to treatment. So if you could diagnose these lesions early, they can usually be cured uh, and they can be cured quite easily by doing uh, some kind of thermoablation or cryo-based uh, local treatment. So 
using an AI algorithm on a phone, a nurse or a community health worker should be able to take pictures of the lesion in the woman's cervix and the algorithm reads it and gives her an opinion and then the woman can straight away be sent for further investigations and treatment. So, so these are just a couple of examples where you can have these AI uh, algorithms have huge impacts on public health, apart from all of the other applications that have been in high income countries, you know, for cancer treatment, for radiotherapy, also for personalized medicine and so on. Uh, of course, uh, it also plays a role and has played a role during the pandemic in detecting outbreaks. You know, we, we, uh, you can have algorithms that are screening um, all of the news that's happening around the world and the social media and so on. In fact, we use that in a system um, uh, that our emergencies program uh, uses to, to scan and pick up signals which need further investigation. So you pick up like four or 5,000 signals. And out of that, of course, you know that, you know, there are a couple of hundred that are worth further look, and then you come up with a couple that need to be investigated, but it helps to do that. And, uh, and of course, it's also helped uh, in predicting, uh, in, in, uh, in, in modeling and in predicting mobility of people uh, and, and so on. So the um, use of these technologies obviously has to be done thoughtfully and therefore um, you need people who have the expertise, not just in developing the code, but obviously in understanding the the landscape, the epidemiology, the amount, the kind of data that's available, and again, we we all know that biases in algorithms are uh, very very common, and you need a very thoughtful approach to avoid those biases from uh, really becoming a limiting uh, factor. So, our uh, Department of Digital Health and Innovation that was created as part of uh, the Science Division set about developing a global strategy for digital health. This was endorsed by all of our 194 member states last year. We know that different countries are at different stages of digital development and we, we're coming up with some kind of ranking of the maturity level. But the main thing is that countries need to think very holistically about what kind of backbone they want to build for their health system. Because in the future, we're uh, really not going to talk about digital health so much as digitally transformed health systems. So we have to keep in mind that the ultimate goal is to provide better health care. And I remember that uh, during, again, the peak of the Delta wave, uh, which affected India and many countries in South Asia uh, over the summer months, that there, were, uh, there was a call from uh, doctors in, in uh, small towns, um, which uh, they had to suddenly handle a number of patients who had severe respiratory illnesses, and they did not have the experience. They were not specialists. And they suddenly they had to use all sorts of new oxygen devices and things that the government was providing to them, but they had no experience. So we used platforms like the ECHO platform, which is one way of democratizing knowledge. You had uh, experts sitting in the US or Canada or wherever in the world, or in one part of India or Nepal, teaching uh, in, in a very uh, sort of inclusive and uh, in, in a dialogue going through once a week cases of the severe COVID and how to manage. And I sat through many of those sessions. So I could really see the benefit of having platforms like that. So not just as a one way delivery of knowledge, but really in a way to engage and, and be able to think as a group and come up with solutions uh, as a group. So this is often not uh, used, I think adequately, these platforms are not used for the purposes of training and, and mentoring uh, healthcare workers who may be further removed from the cities and who don't have the latest uh, uh, information. Of course, you know, because we're in, in, in the pandemic, um, uh, the DG, Dr. Tedros, along with uh, Chancellor Merkel announced a couple of months ago, the creation of the WHO hub for pandemic and epidemic intelligence in Berlin. This is a new center that's designed to foster greater sharing of data and information between countries and to improve global surveillance for epidemics and uh, pandem pandemics, again, by harnessing the power of artificial intelligence, quantum computing, and other cutting edge technologies. And the idea is to have better data 
better analytics and better decision making at the country level, because ultimately these things have to have an impact on the ground. So a global hub that does not have an impact on the ground is, is really not the, uh, what we aim for. And because you strengthen countries' uh, abilities to use data wisely and decision making that can all feed them into a global um, hub. And it's, it's uh, wonderful that our member states yesterday at the Special World Health Assembly have agreed to debate and discuss uh, a treaty or an agreement which will be called a pandemic uh, instrument of some kind or the other, where there will be rules, regulations, and guardrails laid out about what the world should do when faced with a pandemic in terms of having a coordinated and comprehensive uh, response, both in terms of the, you know, the kind of uh, restrictions that are put in place, uh, travel, trade, et cetera, but also about how to develop the tools that you need and how to share them uh, equitably. So over the next couple of years, I think countries will be investing more and more in preparedness. Hopefully, a lot of the preparedness will mean using digital tools, putting these tools in the hands of people in the community and at the lowest levels of the health center, at the primary health care level, expanding surveillance, one health, not just human, but also animal and environment, because we know that new pathogens most likely will come from the animal kingdom and then jump into humans. That's what all the previous uh, zoonotic uh, diseases have been from Ebola to, to Zika to, you know, to SARS and MERS and, and now the SARS-CoV-2. Um, so zoonotic infections are uh, going to increase. And so we need to, to have that kind of a surveillance, which is across all the three uh, environment, human and animal. And, um, and then I think transparency is, is the other thing about how countries are going to use these tools. What, how is the data going to be collected? How is it going to be used? How can individuals actually have control of their own health data so that they also learn uh, to, to um, uh, that's one way of making people more health literate and taking more responsibility for their uh, own health. So perhaps um, I can stop there and, uh, and turn it back to you for, uh, for any comments or questions. Thank you. Thank you very, very much, um, Sumia. Um, and I'm so, so glad that you started out with the issue of equity, um, because this is something which has been like um, a theme throughout many, many of the panels uh, we had. Um, yesterday, um, Rebecca Greenspan told us um, that some countries were put two decades um, back in their development efforts. Um, today, we talked to Gabriela Ramos um, and heard that there is not just a huge digital gap between countries, but still also within countries. Um, what I wanted to ask you first is, um, since we do have that huge digital gap, um, is the international community doing enough to really utilize new technologies in all countries to help us prevent pandemics, prepare for pandemics, and answer to pandemics? I, I think clearly we have to do more. And, you know, all different sectors have to think about what they can do actually to make this. You talked about the digital divide. And one of the things that I've seen in some of my travels uh, in Asia and in Africa is the fact that even now we, we don't have connectivity in many parts of the world. And in fact, it's estimated that half the world doesn't have access to the internet, though, you know, many more do have access to mobile phones, but, uh, but they don't have access to internet. <laughs> that was very fitting, I have to say. <laughs> yes. <laughs> I said phone and my phone rang. Um, so I have been in villages where children have had no access to online education, whereas their counterparts in cities obviously could at least do that, even though they didn't have in-person learning. So I think the, the companies and governments have to make sure that they provide connectivity to all of their citizens, particularly not leaving behind those in remote areas, not just focusing on the cities. So I think that's the first thing. The second is also around uh, thinking about those people who will have more difficulty. So we have to look at the gender aspect. Generally, women have less access to the internet than men do in most countries. Older people, disabled people, 
they may not be able to use the way that younger people are able to. So we need to think about how to assist them. And this is true also of high income countries where a lot of services are being provided now through the tele mode and uh, older individuals are really not that comfortable with having virtual consultations. Uh, and there are some things that you need to see a doctor for in person. And then uh, thirdly, I think we need more research, uh, more monitoring and evaluation. We're rolling out many things, digital thinking that it's all good, but I think we have to measure the outcomes and uh, not all digital innovation necessarily is improving. Some of them actually add burden on healthcare providers without improving the uh, outcomes. So I think it's important, just like we assess new vaccines and drugs through clinical trials, we need to also be doing studies, uh, research studies to document the impact on, on people and, and whether they're actually uh, benefiting from it. So this needs carefully done studies and governments, I think, should collaborate with, uh, with academics uh, and with companies as, as they're rolling out these, these new initiatives so that you're constantly learning and uh, updating your policies. Um, one of the other things you mentioned was trust. Um, it was also liability, um, the quality of data. Um, and you also mentioned um, data privacy and what we do with the data. Uh, so I wanted to ask you if you could tell us a little bit more about how you're discussing in the uh, WHO the issue of where to get the data, how the quality of the data, how to use the data, and where to find the line between data privacy and the right to protect your own data and the, so to say, necessity to protect uh, society? Yeah, I think this is a very important topic. It's fairly complex, but basically if we, take, if we approach it very simply, we have, we're looking at say three or four types of data. The first one is public health data that governments collect and they provide to WHO. So that's at the very aggregate level that we see uh, data. The second is, uh, and, and that kind of data I think can be shared, it should be shared uh, openly. Uh, it doesn't, uh, because it's aggregated. So it's, it's not about individuals, but it's about the whole country or the state or the region. Then we have data that comes from research. And I think this is where we can actually make a lot of progress. We need to be able to share that data Uh, quickly, more openly, transparently. There has been a lot of moves in the past. WHO was also at the center of leading a movement where research funders actually put into their grant proposals a clause whereby researchers must make their data wide, you know, publicly available within a certain time frame after completing the study, particularly clinical trials, because otherwise you get biases. People don't publish negative studies. You get only the good results being published. You never know about all the trials that did not show a good impact. So, so that has to be enforced and, and also more rapid sharing like people have done in COVID. And I think that can happen provided there are some principles around data use. And I say this because of the experience with the whole genome sequences that people have so willingly shared for COVID and why they didn't share for other pathogens in the past was because researchers from the developing countries felt that if they shared all of this data, that they would lose their, uh, their right mm. to or, or, or the ability to be able to publish it, to write about it, because someone else, it becomes public knowledge and then anyone in the world can use it. So that, so that fear needs to be, uh, or the disadvantage really needs to be uh, addressed by having some principles that academics, researchers agree to the way they use data and the credit that needs to be given to people who generate the data. And the third set of data is a patient level data, individual data, which is where the data privacy and confidentiality issues come. And we need to build in mechanisms. Uh, there are ways of anonymizing data uh, and, and there are other ways also by building trust. There are countries where citizens have volunteered to share their health data with the government, individual data because they believe the governments are going to use it for the benefit of the public as a whole, and that they're not going to use it for any other purpose which might disadvantage them. So there you have to start with building trust and um, 
even though you know there are many ways of anonymizing data i understand that if you really want to you can still go and find the identity of people so i think we want to on all of these three areas who is working with countries firstly to strengthen data collection systems on the ground because still we have many countries with very poor data collection and surveillance systems even basic things like births and deaths are not being properly counted and uh, uh, and monitored and then we have um, um, so strengthen it on the ground but then talk about how the, how to share and how to use that data and so that it's beneficial for all and you know i always think about cern and and how but then that's data that's physics that's not data to do with human being so in a way it's easier but the concept there is thousands of researchers around the world actually working on a common data set if you could do that for health data and we have an experiment uh, a group called idair which has recently been set up essentially to look at research and artificial intelligence around health data so i think there are some small steps being taken and i hope that it will become a movement in the future Thank you so very much um, for explaining those three different um, or in, in, in clearly different shades between those three different um, fields. There's the first question from our audience coming in um, digitally, um, picking up on one of the um, dilemmas, so to say, um, which you also um, touched upon um, in your opening remarks, and that is the dilemma of we need transparency to fight the pandemic and we need the numbers at the same time then there will be as an answer severe travel restrictions um what <laughs> where is the balance um how can we ensure that there is an incentive to 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 share the data without having to be afraid to be severely punished so to say for being transparent Yeah, I, I think it's it's quite easy, and it really uh, boils down to countries agreeing on certain uh, responses. You know, for a pandemic which affects the whole world, you do need a global set of rules that everybody will play by. Unfortunately, the world doesn't have that. We don't have a set of rules, and so every country responds the way they feel. Of course, every country does it in the you know to protect their own citizens. So. Uh, you know that's that's what they they are supposed to do but sometimes they end up doing unscientific things uh which doesn't help anyone and on the other hand it hurts a lot of people it hurts lives and livelihoods and so i think at least now from this experience that we've had we for the future we should have a system where the only way to encourage open sharing of data and information is to make sure that firstly you're not punished and secondly that the rewards the benefits are also shared equitably mm -hmm. so if everybody is sharing their data and then vaccines are being developed based on those genome sequences then those vaccines must be shared with people around the world wherever they are needed so that that's a, a, a right now it's a it's a dream and an ambition we need to get there we're not there Thank you so much. I'm looking at our audience here in the room. Um, this is also your opportunity. We have another five minutes um, to ask questions. And if not, I'm going to pick up another one of the digital questions. Oh, yes, please. The, the mic is coming. Just one second. <laughs> Uh, artificial intelligence and what artificial? Shall I start again? Yes, please. So yes, I didn't hear the. Okay. Uh, so my name is Charles Litchfield. Uh, I'm interested in what you said about bias in artificial intelligence. Uh, what you've seen, the sort of biases you've noticed when you've tried to um, use artificial intelligence in your work. What's been obviously wrong? What mitigating um, procedures you've managed to put in place? Thank you. So um, we we haven't used uh, used it for too many applications, but one thing I'd mentioned was the cervical cancer study, and we started off with um, you know you need images to train the algorithm on, and so one of our sources was uh, the 
the National Cancer Institute in the US that's got a big collection of images. But it was clear that, you know, you, you're dealing with a certain demographic. And so we decided that before that algorithm could be considered to be uh, efficient enough at picking up cervical cancer lesions, it would have to be tested in at least five countries around the world, a couple of countries in Africa, Asia, Latin America, because we do not know if uh, cervical cancer lesions look exactly the same. So, so it, I think if you, because they can be genetics, they can be other infections, there can be uh, you know also things like the the pigmentation of your skin, etc., which can have an impact. And so I think this is probably true that if you train an algorithm on a set on on a people who come from a particular background, either racial, ethnic, age, sex, etc., then you may not be able to generalize it to everybody. I think that's quite a well accepted. Uh, principle and needs to be thought about right from the beginning, I think, when one is developing a, a solution. Similarly, I came across another example where uh, I think a, a, by a company um, in a European country was developing an algorithm for, uh, for doc doctors to, to uh, have a decision support tool. So if somebody comes to you with fever and headache of three days or four days, what's the differential diagnosis that you would think of? Now, this would be very different in Germany and in Nigeria and in India because the first set of diseases you would think of for fever and uh, headache would be very different in these three settings, right? So if you had an algorithm that's trained on German um, health record data, that is not going to work in Nigeria or in India. Mm. And so one really has to think about what is the application and, and then what data set would you need and this is again an area I think where global collaboration is important. That's why these large data sets are going to be critical to inform and help developers actually train their algorithms on, uh, on a properly representative data set. Thank you so very much. Um, we are coming unfortunately already to, to an end of this very interesting di discussion because I mean listening to your cell phone going off every five minutes we know that you have a lot on your plate. Um, let me end with one of the questions which uh, came up here from our digital audience not specifically on AI but um, on crisis preparedness and one of our participants is asking um, if the WHO is doing crisis preparedness scenarios where all countries come together to play through different crises to be better prepared um, for future crises? Yes, in fact, that's been happening for the last couple of years, you know, just like the, the war games that the army plays, there has been this kind of scenario uh, being played out. In fact, uh, I think even at the G20 meeting in 2018, perhaps, uh, this was done for the G20 leaders. So yes, it's a good way actually to look at it, but clearly it wasn't uh, enough uh, because ultimately countries were not investing enough in preparedness, in surveillance, in health systems. And we always say that health security and preparedness for pandemics has to go hand in hand with investing in universal health coverage. It's not one or the other. They're two sides of the same coin. And so it's really important, even for the high income countries, you know, that they, they were all found lacking in, in public health capacity. So they had very good tertiary care, could take care of very ill patients in the hospitals. But when it came to work in the community, it was, it was found to be, there were big gaps. So I think every country now recognizes where those gaps are and really needs to start investing both in workforce, not just in infrastructure and putting up more buildings, but really in training people. And I think it's an opportunity for young people as well, um, huge opportunities. So I think digital, digitally empowered young people can really play an important role in the future to link between communities and, and the health system. Thank you so very, very much um, for your time, for your insight, for your knowledge, for your experience. It has been a really great pleasure having you. Um, a big round of applause to you and thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Goodbye. <laughs>
<laughs> so this ends um, this panel. Um, you already know the practice. What we have to do is uh, take a five-minute break, very quick break, to change the setting up here. Um, don't run away. We will continue on time again, uh, almost on time, um, with a very exciting next panel. Um, and um, it is going to be just as fantastic as the other ones. So stay tuned. Okay, so um, with a little bit of delay, um, you had a longer coffee break. We are back again. We just heard in the previous panel um, about the digital divide, the digital de gap, um, just not between countries, but also within countries. Um, we heard a lot of, about um, equality and not so much equality. Um, and uh, this is something we need to pick up. Um, and talk about, and talk about honestly, and uh, not have this as a, in, um, uh, as a Western debate only, um, but as a global debate. And um, thus, I'm very, very happy um, that I can now hand over um, to the moderator of this uh, panel, Merle Uhl. Um, you are Officer Artificial Intelligence and Digitalization um, at Bitcom. And you're going to lead us through this uh, panel, the conversation on intrinsic inequality. The floor is yours. Thank you so much for the introduction. Uh, welcome uh, to everyone from my side as well. I'm very happy to be here at the Aspen AI Berlin Conference and to moderate the panel on intrinsic inequality sources and solutions to bias in artificial intelligence. I am very glad to have three amazing guests here with me today. Um, I'm joined by Carla Husted. She's the director of the Center for Digital Society at the Mercata Foundation. She headed until 2021, so this year, the Bertelsmann Foundation's Ethics on Algorithm project. So she has experience on the topic, and I'm so glad to discuss um, yeah, bias in AI with her today. Welcome to you. Also, a very warm welcome to Gabriela Ramos. Uh, so nice to have you joining rather spontaneously today in this panel. Um, Gabriela is the Assistant Director General for the Social and Human Sciences at UNESCO. Um, the UNESCO recently launched um, a recommendation on AI ethics, which was adopted by 193 countries. Um, Gabriela led the initiative leading to, these, yeah, to this recommendation, so it's great to have her and her expertise on the topic here on the panel. And uh, our third guest and speaker um, here joining digitally is Ivana Bartoletti. Warm welcome to you as well. Um, Thank you. <laughs> Ivana is a global data privacy officer at Vipro, an international information technology consulting and business process services company with over 150,000 employees. She's a visiting policy fellow at the University of Oxford and co-edited and authored several publications on AI. Great to have you here, Ivana, and uh, yeah, joining the discussion with your insights. Um, I can already yeah, remind the audience here, uh, we have great speakers. If you get any questions throughout our discussion here, please keep them in mind or address them to us virtually so I can hand them over uh, in the end of our discussion to our panelists. So, um, starting on our topic, bias is an unavoidable feature of life. It's yeah, the result of our necessarily limited view of the world. What I find so very intriguing about AI and its relation to bias is the ambivalence of the consequences the technology can have on bias. So let me elaborate on that. I, um, AI, on the one hand, potentially amplifies the inequalities we have in our world by using models that are trained with real-world data, um, we can reinforce existing structures. So I guess you all 
know already the example of a hiring system trained on a data set with mainly male employees, which eventually led to a model that preferred male employee um, applicants over female ones, just based on their gender. So that's the, the potential downside AI can have for bias. On the other hand, AI can also offer the chance to mitigate the bias we as humans um, bring into, into our world. So for example, it can hide certain characteristics on a, on a CV, for example, so that a recruiter is not somehow or is less biased through these characteristics. So what I want to discuss today with the panelists is um, yeah, whether artificial intelligence is helping us yeah, solve human biases or instead camouflaging um, them through technology. So um, if you get questions also regarding this topic throughout our discussion, please uh, address them to us as well. So for the start, maybe a short um, insights or yeah, view from, from your side on how you felt the discussion around AI and the role of AI shifted during the last two years. We saw kind of a shift into the digital through the corona crisis. We're all in all video meetings all the time. AI is kind of a little bit more than just digitizing um, yeah, what we have now in the real world, but through legislative initiatives, for example, um, but also ways of mitigating the current crisis, AI changed also over the last two years. So maybe, Carla, you want to start how you're impression is around the discussion and role of AI right now? Sure. I mean, of course, I have um, a better overview over the German debate on the topic. Maybe you can later add something on the international view. Um, to be honest, in the last two years, like you said, the focus has been so much on the corona pandemic, so on the overall public. I actually think um, the awareness on the importance of talking about the societal issues of AI hasn't really increased, which I think is really a problem, like you said in your, your entry statement, um, artificial intelligence or automated decision making, the term that I prefer, is already impacting all areas of our society from education, healthcare, recruiting, credit scoring and so on. And most people, including most policymakers, to be honest, are not aware of this. And when they talk about AI, they focus solely on economic aspects, industrial aspects and so on. So I think this is where we still got a big job to do, and um, when I looked, for example, at the discussions um, heading to the German elections, and the role digital topics played there, it was basically non-existent. There was a talk of two minutes about digital infrastructures and a little bit of bashing against data protection, and that's it, and other societal aspects of digitization played no role. So overall, I feel we haven't really moved forward in the public debate, but in the background and among um, politicians that focus on digital topics, among scientists, among civil society, there's been a lot of work going on. And I mean, you just mentioned the UNESCO principles, but there's also the, this work happening right now at the European level on the European AI Act. You have a lot of civil society organizations trying to create awareness, producing great analysis on the topic, working on practical solutions. So these two things happen kind of in parallel. And um, maybe the biggest positive development that I see is that in the um, debate among experts, there's been a shift of focus a little bit away from the pure technical aspects and a more holistic perspective on the issue, also looking at institutional economic aspects of, of bias, of discrimination. And that's, that's been positive. Okay, so I see the, the holistic approach of, from your perspective exactly is, is uh, to be welcomed, but at the same time you say it's not enough, at least on, on German European level. Maybe Gabriela, you can um, yeah, tell us your opinion or your impression on how that development or discussion on AI developed on a global scale. Let me just start uh, and thank you for inviting me, uh, uh, rescuing two things that both of you say. You, you said at the beginning, uh, we really need to look at uh, our world. If our world is unequal, if our world is biased, if we have bias, and we have, all, all of us have bias because bias uh, help you uh, explain to yourself certain issues. 
Um, so, so you need to be aware of that. And then artificial intelligence, we are artificial intelligence. We develop artificial intelligence, we translate it into that. The only way is how you produce the, the, the guardrails, the ethical guardrails to recognize that these things are happening and are translating into the system. The other point is that artificial intelligence can be discussed from the economic point of view, from the commercial point of view, from the geopolitical point of view. But what I would go with Carla is really from the people's point of view. Because we are consumers and we are users and we are producers and we are, no, we're just people. We're just people. And what we know is that these technologies, if they do not uh, have high quality data, representative data, if, if, if they don't have diverse teams, which they don't, uh, if they are produced mainly by five countries of certain language, of certain profile, cultural profile, uh, and, and if uh, the whole 77% of patents on these technologies are produced by 200 firms highly concentrated in some countries, then of course you're going to get a view of the world pretty linked to those that are developing it. Uh, I have always said 22% of, 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 uh, of uh, the whole world of, of, of developers, only 22% women, even lower to what we have in STEM. And therefore, if you don't have diverse teams, if you are not confronting yourselves, and it happened also in the financial crisis, you have this hurt thinking, mm -hmm. you just reproduce what you believe, you just put it there, nobody tells you, hey, 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 hold a second, why are you saying no? Then it, it happens. And then the data also uh, uh, represent, reproduces the, the, the fault lines of our societies. You will always have in the criminal records people of low socioeconomic background of certain groups. Well, you need to know that. Because if you're going to use it for judicial purposes, you're going to be super unfair. In the financial markets, you will always have overrepresented wild men of very uh, high income. So, so these things, I feel, need to be uh, uh, tackled. I, I have to say that I'm proud because I have been working in UNESCO for a year and a half, and my main uh, uh, priority uh, that the Director General asked me to oversee was the development of these uh, recommendations on the ethics of AI. And, and I can tell you that these things, among other things, but, but the fact that, that you can produce unfair outcomes that you can reproduce the inequalities, that is not uh, really, in many ways, uh, uh, the downsides are so scary that it blurred the positive sides of the technology. We had 193 countries signing to it and adopting it as in a standing ovation. And what do they say? Change the governance of data. Make sure that you have these checkpoints. Get diverse teams. Get more women. Have human oversight. And, and let alone this question of, uh, uh, oh my God, this is a black box. How would I know? No, <laughs> no. The outcome should always have a human person that is there to decide. Uh, and actually we're saying other things like don't give uh, legal personality to AI systems, uh, avoid uh, massive surveillance, uh, and about social scoring. So it's for companies, but also it's for countries, and is the whole AI cycle and how do we develop these technologies, but we also look at the, at the business structure and competition issues because that also leads to these unfair outcomes. Thank you so much, Gabriela. I think we can come back again to the kind of regulatory side of AI because I think it's a kind of recent development exactly with the AI Act and also your recommendation for AI ethics, so it's progressing, the question is uh, in, in what manner. Uh, now, Ivana, to you, maybe we can build on what Gabriela just said and also look at the kind of the company side, if, if that's all right for you. Um, how the view or the discussion from a business perspective changed regarding AI and also topics exactly like Gabriela said, diversity for developing AI, for example. What's your yeah, take on that? Thank you so much, and thanks for having me. And, uh, and I just wanted to say to Gabriella, sorry for, for interjecting here, and say that um, I, it's really great to see what the UNESCO has done. You know, to have 193, correct me if I'm wrong, signatures, um, it shows that you know there is the possibility to agree on 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 principles, and there is a role for international work on on this matter. So I really wanted to say that it was really good to see that happening. 
Um, I, um, to, to be fair, I mean, I was listening to what you both, have, both all of you have said, and, and I couldn't agree more. Um, I do want to offer a little bit of more of a mixed picture here, because I think over the last few years, we have seen some really positive things happening. Um, so we have seen um, a proliferation of privacy laws across the globe. So now all countries with India coming in, sort of last, um, the last one to, to um, at the moment, to be discussing uh, privacy legislation. So we have seen a, a widespread, now we do have data protection and data privacy legislation across the globe, which mostly encompass issues around algorithmic um, explainability, transparency, and all of that. Then the actual implementation is another matter, but I think that is positive. The other things that we've seen as positive is, um, is um, governments, uh, sorry, regulators stepping up. So we have seen, we've seen uh, cool cases happening. We have seen cool cases around Deliveroo, for example, Uber, Ola, um, cool cases really highlighting how transparency is essential. Uh, cool cases are really saying to companies, hey, you cannot do this. You cannot be transparent. A cool case in Italy saying, um, look, you know, if an algorithm is not transparent, that consent cannot be deemed as valid. Um, a cool case saying, for example, to in, in, in the um, food deliveries companies are basically saying you're not differentiating the reasons why, why employees are cancelling their shift and by doing so you're discriminating when you're uh, assigning employees a trustworthiness sort of uh, um, uh, code and, and um, because you're not differentiated um, the reasons why people may be cancelling their shift and therefore some may be looking less trustworthy simply because they wanted to attend the strike which is guaranteed or because they're looking after a child so we're seeing regulators stepping up we've seen just yesterday that the internal market and the civil liberties committee will jointly lead the negotiations on the european ai act which i think is really really important we've been fighting a lot for this to happen but i think this is really really important and the last thing that we have seen i think is um that these issues have become a little bit more mainstream i mean coded bias has been mainstreamed streamed on Netflix. Um, I sometimes when I talk about bias in AI, you know, even my 75 year old mom, you know, knows that this is happening. She doesn't understand the ins and outs, but she does know that this is an issue. Now, the problem is that all of this does not correspond to the to the speed and to the the, the urgency that we need to address some of these issues with algorithms increasingly having an allocative function, as it was mentioned, a curating functions that curate what we see, what we are exposed to. Of course, we need urgency to deal with these issues. And this is really important. What I've seen from the business side is that um, businesses, um, th 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 there is a need for clarity in this space. So companies, they know that uh, these issues are absolutely important. We have seen a proliferation of tools in markets, you know, how to make algorithms fairer, as if, you know, a purely technocentric solution would work. It doesn't. Um, but I think it's really important that we are seeing an attention in, in the business community. Of course, I mean, the, what Gabriella was saying is true. I mean, we can't talk about all this without taking into account the bigger picture, which is the link, immeasurable link between privacy and competition, between privacy and antitrust, between the, the, the sort of the geopolitical dimensions around all this, without the, the fact that AI is being seen often and too often as a race, rather than an opportunity to grow if done in, in, in the proper way. So I think the picture is very much mixed. On the one end, we are seeing an increase of attention around these themes. Companies are, they do want to feel that there is clarity around this. Um, they, we know that current legislation around discrimination law, around consumer law, and, um, uh, and sometime even around privacy is not fit for purpose when it comes to handling a lot of these issues. This is why regulators are stepping it up. But I think it's really, really important to, 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 to recognize that, uh, particularly thanks to the amazing work that some, some campaigners have done on these issues and the action of some regulators. And I think we are, um, these things are becoming more mainstream. And I think now is, is, is the time to, you know, to see a lot of these concerns turn into proper action, the action that we need now. I mean, the, the U European AI Act is going to take two years just to be to be um, finalised as a text, you know, so the negotiations are going to 
go on for a long time. And the issue is that we need action, we need it now. Thank you so much, Ivana. Maybe I can also highlight as well that um, I'm seeing in, from the industry perspective that uh, the, the topic gets increasingly important for, for industry players um, as well, which I think we all um, welcome as, as a development. Ivana, you mentioned the connection between uh, transparent, uh, transparency and trustworthiness of AI transparency, maybe also with regards to how is my AI system biased? Where are uh, potential sources of bias in AI systems? Uh, maybe, Carla, you can take or give us your view on the importance of trustworthiness for the acceptance of AI in our society and whether um, trustworthiness or transparency is a good mean of preventing, for example, that people are afraid of bias? I mean, first of all, I would maybe say that, of course, acceptance is one goal, but it's not the only goal. And there might be some cases where um, we will actually have more transparency and then less acceptance because there's actually something wrong with the system. So I think what we should make clear is that the protection of fundamental rights and of course also acceptance, because there is a lot of great examples for um, positive impact of AI systems, those are two equal goals. And then there's a couple of measures and transparency, um, which can mean a lot of different things, is, is one of them to actually help create systems that do protect fundamental rights and that do create acceptance. But something I see in the de debate on AI, but I think this is actually a problem with all um, discussion on digital legislation, is that there's this search for a standardized solution. And this, is, this focus on debiasing is very symbolic for this, right? We, we hope that there's an easy fix for a complex social problem by buying this one AI system, and then there's a problem with it, like bias discrimination, and then again we hope, okay, let's just take out the bias from the data and then that's the solution. However, this, and this is something I think we agree on, and your statements made this very clear, it's much more complex because the problem can lie in the data, it can lie in the model, it can lie in the underlying assumption, and there are some systems that work extremely well, and they work well for women, they work well for men, they work well for people of different skin color, but they discriminate because of the way they use, the purpose they used for. And something that was mentioned is the increased use of AI systems, for example, for state surveillance. And um, this is a case where it's not the technical issues, but it's the purpose behind it that has a negative effect on democracy, which is why in this case, transparency actually means something completely different. It's not just about explaining how the technical system works, but having an open discourse, a public debate, where you include civil society on what kind of um, purposes we want technology to be used for, whether there are red lines, for example, which is something that makes me quite happy that we have this included in the AI Act, that there's actually a potential right now to have a ban on, for example, facial recognition being used in public spaces in the EU. So this is a great improvement that I see, that there's no sole focus on this technological aspect of transparency. And another thing that I find um, positive in, in the AI, which is also represented in the AI Act, is this risk-based focus, which shows that we cannot apply the same solution to all application cases. Whether an AI system is used in an industry case, an image recognition system, you need very different rules applied to it compared to an image recognition system used in healthcare, or like I said, by a state authorities in a security context. Um, so we need a very sector-oriented um, discussion about this, and we also need to look at the, the kind of task an AI system is doing. Is it a classification system? Does it do a regression? Because the way we, the technical solutions we also need to find for, for removing bias are very different depending on where you apply the system. So it's quite complex, and I really think we need to look at this as an ecosystem of solutions where um, re scientific research, where civil society plays a crucial part. And I would be happy if we could maybe later talk a little bit more about this. It's one of the main uh, focuses of my work at Stiftung Mercator to strengthen civil society in the debate. And it's something that's, that's actually worrying me a lot when I look at the, 
lobbying power of big tech industry in Brussels, for example. I see. Thank you so much, Carla. Um, maybe handing that on to Gabriela. Um, how does the, the recommendation for AI ethics maybe take into account such concerns, for example, by civil society? I th my impression would be that such a recommendation would also serve as a mean to create trust for the user, as you mentioned, who is the most important like part in, in that yeah, ecosystem. Um, what is the contribution the recommendation can, can make in that regard? Because as I understand, it's, it's not, um, not like the AI Act uh, binding regulations. So what's its power on a yeah, global scale for companies? Well, let, let, thank you for the opportunity to, to explain this very important instrument because it's true that it's a recommendation, but we managed to get very, very concrete provisions. It's not just let's be transparent and hold hands together. It's about rules and regulations. And it's about rebalancing the power equilibrium that we have now because governments need to enact those protections that we don't have everywhere. We're still in the world, not in Europe, because Europe has, and, and then you have this discussion, because you have the GDPR and because you are more exigent in terms of protecting human rights, you are not as competitive as the innovators that have all this free space to do whatever they want. I think that the time for self-regulation is over. And you saw that even the office of the President uh, Biden launched this Bill of Rights a bit, because, because now it's, it's people. And it's a civil society that is bringing this. Let me tell you that when we produce, actually, it was a very interesting process in UNESCO. I, I, Stormy knows that I come from 15 years, 20 years in the OECD, which I was more into the economics and the, and the competition. And I see kind of on wire here. The, the point is that, that the, the fact is that in UNESCO, it was a human rights based, human rights based. So there's no discussion of whether the company or whether the technical solution or whether it's like the purpose, as you say, should be human rights protection and promotion. And then the whole thing should follow. And governments with their different legal uh, traditions and uses and, uh, and yes, of course, you need to be super effective because it doesn't mean that you are just going to overregulate and stifle the innovation. But the fact is that innovation is being stifled by the lack of competition. Mm -hmm. This is a fact. But we have these narratives. So for me, just the narrative of having 193 countries saying, yes, this has to be human rights based. This has to be uh, enhanced by good regulatory frameworks. This has to be policy driven because policy matters. It's not only the, the, the value statement that we did in terms of uh, uh, protecting and being fair and having uh, uh, fair outcomes. It's also the human rights framework that is our guide, uh, but it's also the principle transparency accountability, which is the rule of law. Yeah. It's so basic as to say, yes, let's have the rule of law. And if you are hurt, you have somewhere to go and complain and have redressal, and you, and you have the right to know whether a, a decision that was taken for any institution, public or private, was done by using artificial intelligence, because more and more we're doing that. But then we move into, into the policies very concretely on education, on communication, on culture, on gender, on environment. And let me tell you, we did a huge uh, regional, uh, this, wa this was put by 24 experts from all around the world, not only economists, not only technicians, they were some coders, I have to say, uh, but you also have philosophers, you have sociologists, you have psychologists, and then it became very rich. But the, but the basis of the whole thing was to talk to people. And we did this global uh, um, uh, consultation, and, and what people said was, yes, we need protection. It's as simple as that, when things go wrong. And when you have a good regulatory system that people trust, then innovation flourishes. Can I jump in here just real quick with one thing? Because I found it so important what you said about the narrative and, and like, how it should be so basic that the human rights principles at the bottom and that we need to break this narrative of innovation versus human rights. Because if we look, for example, at the debate of climate change, it took us 
20, 30 years to break that narrative. And I'm really hoping that we can kind of leapfrog in the digitization debate and not take 20 years uh, to get there. And this is so key, I just wanted to underline it. <laughs> yeah, maybe we can um, just a uh, reminder to the audience, if you want to ask questions, I'll have one uh, additional one for Ivana, and then I'll open the the floor. Uh, maybe we can build on that, Ivana, because what I find um, the, the really interesting question is when I have these high-level principles, a recommendation how to use AI ethically, how do I get that implemented eventually in companies, for example, than using developing AI systems? We already spoke about diversity, for example. Maybe, Ivana, from your experience also, with the GDPR, maybe, or with data privacy, which uh, was like the last maybe big initiative with regards to that. How can we yeah, build the bridge between what our ethical yeah, standards are and how we bring that into businesses and products? It's a really good question. I mean, what I'm seeing at the moment is that there is one need, I think, that all companies have which is they have to um, bring together teams from different backgrounds, the engineers, science, data scientists, legal, um, to agree on a common vocabulary. And to me, this is really, really important because, for example, even the word fairness, it means different things to different people. And I don't mean just in terms of, of, you know, in terms of values. I also mean in, term of, in terms of understanding um, the, from their specific background. Even the term bias means something to a, a um, uh, different to, from sort of a lawyer's and a lawyer and, and uh, an engineer. So I think it's really, really important to settle on, on the common vocabulary. So I always say that I think um, the um, uh, companies are realizing, I think in, in some of them at the very least, they're realizing that the way that, for example, they interpret fairness speaks to the values of the organization. And that is because we've got to be clear here that, um, that there is a dichotomy between fairness and efficiency. And this happens a lot of time in artificial intelligence in, in algorithmic decision making. That is because um, unless there is a strong determination of an organization to say that they want to be fair and determine how they want to be fair, because fairness, there are different ways of achieving it there are different, and then there are different ways to turn that definition into then it, uh, its sort of computation. Um, but the thing is that sometimes there are um, situations where there will be inevitably a discrepancy between uh, the efficiency and, and, and fairness. Um, so it's really important to make these choices and companies need to make these choices in, in, in an open way, in a transparent way. Um, so settling on the common vocabulary, understanding the concept, for example, of fairness, what it means, um, how they want to achieve it, um, understanding that it's not just about the data, as was mentioned, and understanding also that there is another problem here, that even a tool which may be in theory not biased at all, may end up being biased just by the way it's deployed. And I always make the example of facial recognition where, for example, a lot of people are saying, well, the problem with facial recognition is it discriminates. Yes, it, it does. And it's really a dramatic problem. But also, even if we have the perfect facial recognition system, that doesn't mean that we need to deploy it because inevitably, even its deployment could be happening in a very biased way. I can imagine, for example, that facial recognition cameras would be deployed in particular areas um, by making privacy a luxury good for people living in some other areas of the city. So I think it's really important to understand that. And also in regard regarding to transparency, <laughs> we can have all the, the definitions that we want. I mean, the General Data Protection Regulation has a definition of transparency, uh, so it talks about transparency, explainability to, in certain circumstances. But the problem is that transparency requires people to understand you know, transparency has to be meaningful because there is little meaningfulness if 
uh, the if we continue to have, for example, the, what we've had in privacy, which is a 20 page privacy notices that, the, that people do not read, you know, we have to identify um, innovative ways to make that transparency work, even if that impl- means, for example, that we have to have a more deliberative approach to, to transparency, involving the people who are going to be impacted the most by a particular system. And the other thing that I think comp- companies is very important is that companies need to start rewarding the scent on this. They need to start rewarding instead of punishing those who actually highlight a potential failure or a potential pitfall of a particular system. And I think this is really important. And I, and I think, you know, the companies are starting to understand that when they do this, then you know, they could be, uh, uh, they, they can sort of disseminate a message of, of trust amongst the consumers and the users. The really last thing that I wanted to, to say on this is that I think, um, I think it's, it's, it's really important um, I mean, we're seeing a lot of talks about all these things, a lot of talks about transparency, explainability. They mean different things to different people. They're very difficult to translate into practice. But I think we have to have the courage to move to a situation where we do not leave on the users the burden to understand, vet the system. I would be very much more in favour of a, an approach that um, means that systems are vetted before they enter the market before because otherwise the, the, the asymmetry of power between an individual and the system and the company behind it is too big for the user to deal with by himself i mean frank pasquale talks about you know the distrust by design, you know, so you, you distrust the system and then it's, it's, it's for the system to demonstrate that, that it's, it's trustworthy and does not discriminate. And there is a point in that. He also talks about licensing models. But I do think it's really, really important to, to, to shift that burden on responsibility because in the world we live in, it's hard to ask a user to navigate these complexities and to be able and to even spot the potential bias, to be asking for decisions to be reviewed. Because if that is, because that transparency could be failing the ones who actually need it the most. And this is why I think we need to shift the burden of responsibility onto the pre-market stage with checks and controls before products enter into the market. Thank you so much, Ivana. Um, I want to remind the audience here, if someone wants to uh, address a question, I already have one here in my uh, iPad, uh, which is a very good f- following up question, actually, to your statement, Ivana, you spoke about fairness and that we have very different understandings of fairness. And that's also related um, to the question here, uh, which states, um, it feels that we talk a lot about how to address Uh, bias that comes from AI, but um, yeah, the question remains, how good are we actually at identifying bias and do we even have a universal understanding, which is, I think, very much related to our understanding of fairness. Maybe uh, relatively quick because we're uh, already at the, at the end of time. I don't know, Ivana, if you want to start and then I'll yeah. hand over to you. I'll start. And this yeah. is, I mean, to me, this goes straight to the point of why the human oversight issue is, is, is an illusion. You know, um, If we think that we can get away with sort of fair AI by providing human oversight, then I jump in my chair because <laughs> like you're asking biased individuals to be the ones having to provide the, the, the oversight. I mean, that's not the panacea, is it? Um, you, you're totally correct. Um, and I think it's important that um, that for, for organizations to, that's where having different voices in the discussions, having different people involved, um, that is where we can define what fairness means in a particular context. It is very much contextual. Um, in the financial sector, for example, giving everybody the same access to loans may sound fair, but it's not. Because if people for historic inequalities are going to default payments, you're just going to make the situation worse for them. So it's really, really important to, to, to sit down and say, okay, what does fairness mean in this context? What is, and, and so it's not just about our outcomes, that's the first thing. It's really about the process, obviously. But it's really trying to understand in this context, what does a fair outcome look like? 
in, in a situation where it's very difficult. I mean, think about compounded discrimination. I mean, the fact that somebody could be discriminated because they are black and female, because they are black and disabled. How are we going to tackle this in AI solutions to this? This is still a mystery. Thank you, Ivana, for basically raising more questions <laughs> <laughs> than answering them. Maybe I can, can I yeah, please, great. Carla. Um, I agree with everything Ivana said, and I want to actually add one thing, which is that I feel in a way automation can also be an opportunity to talk about what discrimination actually means. Because, um, like you said at the very beginning, hu we, as humans, we are biased in so many ways, and we're often not very aware of it, and in a way, we are the biggest black box overall. And if we do have good oversight, at least um, we can kind of make it well, tangible the way it's happening. And for some people, who I, what something I realized is that for some people who have never talked about discrimination and inequality issues before, they started looking at it because it's now somehow a technical issue. It's not a soft topic anymore, and you can make it very visible. You can say this facial recognition system detects men in 99% of the cases and women in 60% of the cases, and nobody can deny that because it's there, it's numbers. And that's a great opportunity to maybe also win more people to actually talk about these issues. That's one thing. And the other is, of course, we need to talk about what fairness means in a particular case. The other thing is that we also need to look at, again, what kind of problems are we actually solving with technology? And are there maybe certain problems that are not being looked at? Are there some people who um, have needs that are not a business case? And that will never be solved if we just look at this from an economic perspective. So in, like talking about fairness and inequality also means talking about uh, civic tech and social innovation and the state also being an actor who innovates and who does not only regulate. And what we see right now is that um, digital innovation is mostly happening to strengthen stakeholders that are already in power and not those that are um, marginalized, although I don't like that term. And I think that's an additional, like more portfolio holistic view that we need to have on this debate. Thank you so much. Carla, so I guess the discussion needs to be a little bit more inclusive, maybe of all actors concerned. Maybe we're in the last minute. I'm so sorry, Gabriela, but maybe you want to, it's a little bit a mean question, but what would be your like number one priority now to tackle bias in AI? <laughs> to have the ethical reflection. And that's why, because you have to really look into the very specific problems you're trying to address, and there is no one single size fits all approach. And that's what UNESCO said. Of course, we advance a lot of very concrete policy recommendations that are not rocket science, like having affirmative action in the teams. So please, let's not get philosophical about what the outcome is. Let's just look at the process, and if you only have certain kind of people from certain kind of universities, for certain, well, it's, it's for sure that the outcome is not going to be so uh, diverse. So you need diversity, you need inclusion. But what we are also called to do at UNESCO is to develop this ethical impact assessment because there are so many questions that you need to ask yourself in how you build the system, but also, as Ivana was saying, the outcomes. And the outcomes, sometimes, you need to redefine the objectives. We talk a lot about the technologies. What we're not talking about is how do we ensure that these technologies help us humans to solve our problems? We are always saying, how do we fix the technology? I would say no. How we see we fix the framework so we have more investment in the technologies that will help us to address the issues, to give more opportunities to those that have never had the opportunities to address the question of climate change, to address the question of inequalities. So I think that that's why I think we need this whole redefinition, uh, and that's what we try to do with the recommendation. <laughs> Thank you so much. I, I guess that's the perfect ending of our panel discussion here, using AI yeah, to make our world a little better, hopefully, and uh, cover our flaws. So thank you so much, uh, Ivana, Carla, Gabriela, for being here with me today uh, at the Aspen AI Berlin Conference. Uh, thank you uh, to the audience here in the Landesvertretung Baden-Württemberg and the audience at home. And I'll hand back to Stormy. <laughs> yes. Yes.
And also, thank you so very much um, to you for moderating this panel. Um, you jumped in on the very last minute, actually, and this is an extra applause, I think, um, for... <laughs> yes, thank you so very much. Um, you all know the drill. Um, we uh, continue in just a couple of minutes. Our next speakers are already um, at the door waiting, to, waiting for, for their mics to be um, placed on. Um, thank you for this amazing and insightful discussion. And we will continue with a panel on education, and it is a very special panel. We heard over the whole day and yesterday that we need to um, well, bring people together who wouldn't usually talk to each other, right? The philosophers, with the coders, with the sociologists, with the doctors, and so on. On that panel, we are actually, bring, actually bringing together a designated minister, um, a teacher, <laughs> scientists, academics, policymakers. So we'll see what comes out of that panel. So thank you so much, and see you in a couple of minutes. So we will continue um, with a last firework um, of today. Um, <laughs> we had already um, wonderful discussions uh, yesterday and today on artificial intelligence here at the Espen AI 21 uh, conference. And this is uh, going to be another um, highlight um, of the day. Um, and um, it is welcome to all of you to our panel on the new normal obstacles on the path to digital skills and education. And as I said earlier on, this is also a very special panel because um, we not only have a designated minister with us, but we also have a teacher um, and a director of a school with us. So um, I also tried to get a student to join us, um, but there was no, no student, um, at least not in my close family environment, being brave enough to come on the panel here. I, have to think, I, I think I have to do a little bit of more work on that. Um, I want to hand over to um, the moderator of our panel tonight, um, who is uh, Johanna Burs-Supan, and um, you are Director of Strategy and Program of the Vodafone German, Germany Foundation. Um, you are doing a lot of very good work um, on media literacy, um, on digital skills, on education, and you have been su very supportive to us in our um, school project on media literacy and also our influencer project. Thank you so much, and with this, I hand over to you. The floor is yours. Great, thank you. Thank you so much for the warm welcome. And I'm uh, particularly honored that I get to uh, chair the grand finale of this fascinating two-day uh, conference that we've had um, from the Aspen Institute Germany. Um, and this last panel, um, as you've already said, um, of the conference, I have the pleasure of welcoming five really, really interesting um, speakers. Um, and we want to talk about the future of education. Namely, how has education actually changed during the past 20 months um, with COVID-19 around? Um, which new normal, as you said, um, uh, the title of this panel, which new normal are we actually aspiring to? What do, what do we want to see in the future? And, of course, uh, this is not going to be the last crisis, um, but um, what will make our educational systems and, of course, the people in it, the teachers and the students, what will make them resilient so in the next crisis um, we, we actually look better globally? And, of course, uh, and this is why we're at this conference, how can digital technologies and artificial intelligence maybe help um, with all of these questions? Um, but we're a large panel, um, so I'm going to take uh, uh, just a moment to introduce everyone. Um, to my immediate right, um, uh, you see Bettina Stark-Watzinger. Um, she's a member of the German Parliament and head of the National Parliamentary Group of the Free Democratic Party. She's an economist by training, um, but she's been active in the educational system since um, 2006. Um, and uh, as uh, she was already introduced, um, uh, more importantly, she's the designated Secretary of Education and Resource, uh, Research I'm sorry, in the new coalition government um, that is supposed to be sworn in next week. So fingers crossed, but congratulations already. And I'm sure many of you out there and, and in this room are as excited as I am um, to hear about your visions for education in Germany. On the screen, 
Um, I'm uh, welcoming um, Dr. Georgi Dimitrov. Um, yeah, little wave. Um, he heads the Digital Education Unit within the European Commission. And um, Georgi has been instrumental in leading the first Digital Education Action Plan the Commission put in place in 2018. And he's also been one of the core architects of the new DEAP um, that is guiding the Commission's work right now and until hopefully uh, 2027. Then, uh, very exciting, a good morning to Katrin Röschel. She is joining us from California, where she's the head of the German International um, School of Silicon Valley. Um, Katrin trained as a maths and physics teacher, um, but she's always been looking at how to uh, learn and teach using technologies uh, since the late 80s, um, I've read. And so I'm guessing all that experience and all that, um, uh, and all, uh, all of this uh, came in very, very handy um, when the pandemic struck and her school went into distance learning, uh, just I hear two weeks after she took over the school. So I'm very excited um, to, to hear about those experiences. Um, also on the panel with me um, is a Professor Dr. Niels Pinkwart. Um, so one of the distinguished centers of AI research in Germany is the German Center Research Center for Artificial Intelligence, as we know it as a DFKI in, in Germany. I'm very uh, welcome to, uh, I'm very happy to welcome you as well. You're the scientific director of the Educational Technology Lab at DFKI, and you've widely researched and published in the field of educational technologies um, with the DFKI, but also um, with more research institutions like the Weizenbaum Institute, the Einstein Center for Digital Future, and the German Informatics Society. And lastly, um, it's, it's actually a real privilege because we can look at um, education from so many perspectives tonight. Um, because lastly, education is not only driven by the state or by those who are in schools um, or by those um, who, who research it, but also by the uh, civil society, um, by NGOs and by foundations. Um, and I'm very happy that Dr. Wolf Pries um, uh, is on the panel as well. He's joining us from the Joachim Herz Foundation, um, where he leads, among many, many, many other things, um, the research and development of new learning environments. So, um, with this in mind, I thought we'd kick off with a warm-up question um, to all of you, um, and um, I'm asking for short, snappy answers, um, but what does the term resilience, what does it mean to you in your current role when we think about education? Um, and uh, why don't uh, you start? <laughs> Resili uh, resilience is the core of nearly everything. Um, freedom, self-determination depends on being able to live that, and that comes not only with the own will, but education helps quite a bit to that. So education is, plays a prominent part in becoming resilient or self-determined. Great. Thank you for being spot on. Mm -hmm. Yeah, Nils Fielkwart, do you want to? Yeah, it's a tricky question to answer in short because it has so many dimensions. I mean, institutionally, educational institutions like universities, they are resilient. It's, I mean, maybe you remember a couple of years ago, we thought universities are going to disappear because now we have MOOCs. Oh, surprising resilience. Uh, on the individual level, we will probably discuss how, how tricky, uh, except the last... Um, well, especially the last years have been in the COVID pandemic uh, to have the resilience on that individual level to survive studying through a pandemic. And uh, well, the question how AI can help is on the table here. Yeah, great. Katrin, Rochel, maybe um, because um, Niels Pinkwart already said individual level, what comes to mind on your end? Yeah, everything that was said already, but resilience also means for me flexibility, we have to be more flexible in the future. And I think education is a key here and um, not so much changing hardware and what, what we bring into schools with a max plan or whatever. I think the mindset has to change and that's what we can do in our schools. And that's what we have to do in, in teacher education all the way to educating students in first and second grade. Thanks. Wolf Pries. 
Um, yeah, it's a, a difficult question indeed. Um, for for us uh, in, in in our role from the foundation, we uh, offer different methods in in, in learning and in, in digital learning. So uh, what is important for us to to stay resilient is also to just be in in contact and in touch with the teachers, with the students, and to learn from each other to to still offer all all these uh, new. Yeah, ways of, of teaching and new ways of learning, especially in the pandemic. So I think, uh, yeah, stay in contact and in touch and learn from each other is, is a great founding for, for stay resilient. Great, thanks. And uh, to finish the round, Georgi Dimitrov. <laughs> Uh, well, given that I work primarily on digital education, um, for me, resilience is the capacity of education and training systems to continue to deliver education in times which are perhaps not um, uh, the best, uh, which are around maybe a pandemic, um, or uh, that may require a very long-term transformation of society, uh, such as uh, the ones driven by um, digital transformation more generally. And to be able to have adaptable and flexible systems continue to, to include uh, pupils and to provide quality education, this for me is resilience. Great. And uh, I think if, we, if you could add on there a little bit, because um, you've already know, said it's, it's, um, it's a systemic feature as well. So if you look at, um, from the European perspective, if you look at the many, many different countries in the European Union, which educational systems would you say have proven highly resilient during the crisis? And, and what are the core principles um, that other countries could um, learn from them? Oh, um, I, could, I could go on and write my PhD thesis right now with that question, but um, may, let, let me give you, give you perhaps two, um, two specific um, uh, variables, let's call them like this, of resilience. Um, one um, really has to do with um, the ability to have an integrated worldview of what education in the digital age means. And um, I think that if you look across the European Union, uh, you know that um, we have a very big diversity. And um, if you look at the history of investment and education, um, in particular in the digital capacity of education and training systems, you sort of start to see a pattern that countries that have started earlier, uh, not only to invest in um, hardware, uh, let's say platforms and so on, but to accompany this with teacher training and perhaps integrate this investment into the overall digital transformation uh, strategy, let's say, of the country, they tend to be more resilient. And this is what we have seen, for example, in a country like uh, Estonia, uh, just now uh, through the COVID crisis, where the shift has been rather um, uh, smoothless, where existing platform uh, were in use already before uh, any crisis uh, struck and were essentially um, the shift of the teachers also and pupils to using those was just a matter of scaling this further. Now, this is not the perfect situation, but in terms of um, the way it has been done, it, uh, it worked rather well. And then, uh, of course, this is the rather, let's say, uh, best case scenario, perhaps. But if you look at some other member states, which uh, one could not maybe think of as um, very maybe best in class uh, because of low investments in education. For example, if you look at uh, Eastern Europe or uh, some other countries, you see that wherever there was autonomy and flexibility in the school to take a decision and to move fast and to do um, uh, what is necessary in order to enable uh, the shift um, to this provision, which by the way is just uh, emergency driven provision, so we should not uh, equal uh, equalize, uh, equalize it with uh, proper digital education, still you, you see that autonomy, the ability to move and the ability to take action at the local level, at the school level, is a really important factor. And uh, you see this in studies where um, uh, you, you immediately observe how teachers have been able to put on video classes uh, just from day one, uh, to be in touch with their students, to keep them going, despite the very difficult situation. And this, for example, uh, happened in a country like, um, uh, like Bulgaria. So this is a very special variable, but uh, I think autonomy is also an important factor. So overall, there is no one size fits all. 
And uh, given that I work in the European Commission, I have to finish by saying that we operate, of course, in the field of subsidiarity. So um, we have some uh, limited competences here. Yeah, yeah. Thank you. Um, I remember uh, when, uh, when the um, pandemic struck in, in March 2020, there was actually a huge euphoria in Germany. Um, maybe that was only in the foundation sphere, um, but I do feel it also came from, um, from the schools themselves, um, maybe mixed with a bit of panic uh, on, on that side. Um, but everyone thought, finally, finally, we're going to digitize because now we have to. Um, one and a half years later, I think uh, this summer, there was a lot of tiredness. Um, and, and we felt really, really frustrated by how slow the system is actually changing. So um, my question to you, obviously, is how are you going to turn it around? What are, what are sort of the, the main priorities we need to tackle in the next four years um, to get transformation going in Germany? Yeah, wonderful question. Thank you for that. Now, the, the pandemic crisis, it, it, it actually uh, threw a torchlight on, on the uh, German education system, which as such has pros and, you know, strengths and weaknesses. Um, but we've seen that we've waited so long to actually implement the digital world into our schools. And, I mean, there was the example of Estonia. And Estonia... I mean, I really, I'm really impressed what they did in a very short period of time. Um, somewhat they could start from scratch because they really had to start after, you know, after the, uh, the, 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 uh, the Soviet, Soviet Union um, broke up. Um, and we are living in an existing education system and we have to transform rather than, you know, there is not a real revolution. Mm. But with the speed, with the revolution in, digital, in digitization around us, we need to become much faster than that. Two, point, two main points. First of all, we have the federal system, and digitization needs economies of scale. You need standardization, and of course, you need the skills. And school, I mean, teachers, we've got wonderful teachers, but they are not necessarily trained um, for digitization. Um, I mean, this will change. But even if we start now to put it into the teacher's education, it, it takes a period of yeah. years until it really, you know, these teachers are standing in front of classes. I mean, a lot of, I mean, there, there was a lot of um, teachers really catching up with it. But the federal system, um, means that um, we are sometimes too slow because we need the, um, the, the economies of scale. So we have to look into that. Uh, second, um, bureaucracy is rather resilient in Germany. So this is something we have to address. If you have to write up 400 pages for applying for funds out of the so-called digital, digital pack, a lot of funds are available for actually funding, um, funding digital tools, um, that's too much. So we have to really lower the bureaucratic hurdles. Um, and... Um, and, and second, we should not only, and that has man, been mentioned by, by, I think, all of the speakers, uh, we should not only think about um, hardware, but about software. And this has happened too late, so um, mm. even if you have the tools, it's difficult to implement. So teachers' education, um, also using the funds for people actually looking after your digital infrastructure and then having the hardware as such. And uh, last but not least, this is only phase one where we actually use digital tools. We all also have to learn to um, use much more of the chances, you know, having uh, AI to help uh, children that uh, need uh, special support and things like that. A lot of things are happening, but this could be done in a much more centralized way. Mm -hmm. um, best practices, um, joining forces, so um, strong schools, strong states, but also um, uh, a lot doing together. Yeah. Great. We'll talk about um, technologies and, and the promise of that uh, mm. in, in a short bit. Um, so, yeah, it, bureaucracy is slow. Um, I wonder, Wolfgang Pries, if, uh, where do you see the role of, of civil society organizations in, uh, in addressing educational needs and how can civil society uh, um, organizations like, like the foundation you work for um, actually maybe help push along this transformation in, in a speedier way? Um, I think the, the benefit of the foundations is that we, well, we are not profit-driven, 
Um, we have our funds and we have our aims. Uh, in, in our case, it's uh, fostering education and research. So we could uh, go into the niches and, and try something um, where we don't know what is coming out. Like, for example, we have a, a big project uh, started, um, uh, which uh, uh, researchers together um, um, try to look for a solution for adaptive learning in the economic education. And uh, it's, a, it's a big project with, with different researchers from different uh, universities, uh, machine learning and computer linguistics and economic education. Um, and uh, it's uh, three years, uh, uh, several people uh, work on that. And we ourselves don't know and the researchers don't know what's coming out. But um, that's the difference of, uh, of foundations compared to, for example, the school publishers. Um, there is no... Uh, they see no profit in, in these adaptive learning systems, um, not in the near future. So that's the big advantage of foundations, that we give it a try. And, and uh, hopefully there are uh, results that, that uh, the society could, could base on um, uh, new learning technologies and, and use that. Yeah, hopefully. Um, in the end, I mean, I guess uh, systems are made up of people. Um, and... Uh, and we also need to talk about the resilience that we, we have to build up in, in people. And I wanted to ask you, Katrin uh, Röschel, which uh, competences make teachers um, and which competences make students more resilient? Um, and maybe you could share a bit of your experience of the last 20 months. Where did you see uh, resilience pop up in, in those students and in those teachers around you? What astonished you there? Yeah, I mean, my school is in the Silicon Valley, so the digitalization was well on the way already when we, when we started here. And um, as you said, I was literally my ninth day on campus when I started the job here, when I announced we're going to close down the school. It was a Thursday, and I said, tomorrow you keep your kids home, we need a one teacher workshop day, and on Monday we'll be online. And that worked. And... Uh, everybody was excited that it worked because we had just the, the regular schedule and in every subject and every hour you would find, you would dial in where you can go to a class. But we thought it's till Easter. So we planned for four to six weeks and not for 20 months. And then it was quite clear that we need to go right into that adaptive management, into adaptive planning. It was clear that we can't go the full circle. We have to reevaluate. We have to, you know, as a picture, I always told my, my teachers, you know, we are on the dance floor and then we stop dancing and go on the balcony and look down what we are doing. And then when we decide on the balcony, what we are doing back on the dance floor and, and keep going. And that's, um, that really worked. We stopped teaching every four to six weeks for two days and uh, gave the students work to, to do at home and, and work with our students, uh, work with our teachers to re-adapt. And I keep saying that worked really well because it did, but I cannot not say that we are so glad that everybody is back on campus now because we get, need to get the advantages of both that uh, component of social emotional learning is not to underestimate in that whole process. And uh, to combine both, that's what it takes now. You know, now we need, and that, therefore I, I love that group here. I mean, <laughs> for Stark Watzinger, all eyes on you, no pressure, but <laughs> we, we, we need you here. <laughs> we need the AU and, and uh, it's, but I also want to offer our expertise as heads of schools. And I'm, I found it very interesting that you picked a head of school from, from a German school abroad, because we have, as Germany, 140 schools abroad, and all those heads of schools adapt the system in that country to our German school system. So you have your expertise, basically, in, in, in that group. And um, I really want to offer that and, and that we can, can work together and should work together. And we also need the universities, of course, to do research. We, we did pretty well because everybody was, was excited that it worked. But now we really need didactics and pedagogics to kick in and uh, need theory to define that new normal and see what it means. It's not about organizing a drive through and pass out tablets. We did that, that was nice and great and, and worked for a while, but now we need more. And, and 
we really need that pedagogic students, we need didactic research to give us to that next step, you know, to, to go back on the balcony and look together, what can we do better on the dance floor before we go back into the schools. And that's what our, what I think makes us resilient, to stay flexible. You know, we do not know what the future for our students will look like. We do not know when the next crisis comes, but we know already who has to handle it. And that's our students. And we need to make them ready for that. Great. If, if we um, look at the technologies we've been, we've been talking now, um, uh, digital technologies, obviously, but, but more specifically, um, the, the kind of artificial intelligence we can bring into school, um, and uh, obviously I'm looking at you, uh, Niels Finkwart. Can you, from your, from your broad research, maybe say what for you is the, the largest promise that um, artificial intelligence can make in the, in the educational um, sector to, uh, to make uh, the kids, the teachers more resilient um, and to prepare them for a digital uh, and crisis-ridden world, I guess? Yeah. Um, well, there are a couple of areas where AI can help. Some are um, pretty obvious that, for instance, through personal assistance technologies, uh, that, that people that uh, have a hard time reading, seeing or moving, that AI-driven technologies can provide personal assistance. These are then not educational technologies, but general assistance technologies that can just, you know, come in place very handy for education. Then there are some AI applications that have already made their way in education, even though they are not intended. Look into what's happening in language classes, for instance. Mm. We all know that these language translation tools are extremely good today, much better than they've been five years ago. And so what happens in language training, sometimes probably unintended by teachers, is that you learn French, you make up a messy sentence, you go to some online tool, translate it to German and back to French, and it's wonderful. <laughs> So is that a cheating technology? Hmm. And there are even texts, uh, tools right now that will produce texts for you. So you, you start off writing something and it completes an essay. Now, you won't find that it, it, on, on Wikipedia or anything for a teacher is almost impossible to detect whether this has been written by a student or not. Um, you can call it a problem, but you can call it a fantastic opportunity to, to explore what, what artificial intelligence can already do. Uh, and where the limits of this technology are. Also, that is not an educational technology, but I'm, I'm mentioning that because we need to broaden our view. There are so many technologies mm -hmm. in our life that have an impact on education, even though are not intended to have a didactic function. But um, to the core of your question, there is really ample research out there that we have ignored in this country for, I think, a decade. We are now starting off and uh, funded by BMBF in a higher education and professional education in many sectors. We are, we are catching up there. Um, but there is really ample evidence that um, supporting children more individually at scale mm. and supporting a more diverse uh, and heterogeneous uh, well, citizenship or uh, students uh, across the sectors, that this is really one promise, that the traditional textbook where you have a book or maybe you have a PDF, that this is on the long hand uh, aren't going to vanish and, and so that you have more training in sectors where you really need it. You get feedback by your textbook and uh, I somewhat disagree. We are in touch with some publishers, also school publishers, that really have an interest in doing just that, to make this traditional textbook disappear and having something that is more interactive, that can provide guidance to students and where maybe also the traditional homework is going to be replaced by some extent, that, that you can really have the training that you need and uh, maybe even contextualized. There is evidence, particularly uh, from the United States, but also from China, from, from other countries, that these systems are really highly effective on the cognitive uh, dimension, so that you can really learn stuff. Um, some papers write better than with a human one-on-one -on -one tut tutor. Hmm. You have to contextualize that. I'm not talking about the social dimensions of learning there. It's really about learning, um, learning the content that, that, uh, that you want to have. Um, so there are really huge potentials, and we are already now s slowly, I would say, but we are going this way. The school sector is probably the one where, you, where we need most pushes, uh, because there you often, when you, when you talk to German schools for it particularly, um, they have to take many steps at once. Uh, when I 
give talks about AI in education, they sometimes, oh, not so much now, but some two years ago, they said, well, we, we don't have enough plugs, really. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so there is yeah. one which is for the vacuum cleaner, but that's it. And um, so they had to take multiple steps. And uh, in, uh, in early 2020, we, we offered teacher trainings on the basics of online teaching. And in, in two days, only advertising in Berlin, we had 2,000 participants. So there, there was a movement, but you have to move in different scales. Mm. Mm. Yeah, no, that makes sense. I'd, I'd like to uh, bounce this back right away to you, um, uh, Katrin Röschel. Um, if you hear about these technologies, and I'm guessing, giving your school in, uh, in Silicon Valley, you, you are also experimenting with a lot of them. Um, what does that mean for the role of the teacher um, today? And what does that mean in how we need to support teachers um, or, or even train teachers so that they're ready for this new role in, in a digitized uh, classroom that doesn't have books anymore, possibly? I mean, how cool is that? That's just <laughs> amazing. And um, it, what I said in the beginning, it really needs a different mindset for me as a physics, informatics teacher, physics, uh, math teacher, in informatics, or when you use tools in, in math, even a calculator, uh, you better get ready that the kids know more about it than you. And I mean, then, then teaching is really cool and, and really good. And that's what our teachers need, I think, is that openness that knowledge, that development will go faster than we, than, than our job is over or so. I mean, it's now in informatics students for, for many, many years, there's no hardware existing when they finish their studies from what, what was there when they began. And it's even more for schools because they're just longer in schools, kids. And we, we really need the teacher training. I believe in a heartbeat that you had 2000 applicants in, in like no time, but even more important is to strengthen our teachers, to give them time to adjust, to, to leave that dance floor that I talked about and go on the balcony needs time. We really need prep time. We need to time to exchange best practices, but also to, to dive into that new technologies and all that. So when we, when we started teaching online, it's not because we are in the Silicon Valley that everybody can do it. It's, we have, as in German schools abroad, you have a a colorful mix of very highly educated fresh from the university coming teachers to all the way to people that just speak German that are in the area. So we had that formal groups, but we also had many, many informal groups. You know, there are still teachers around that say, oh, I don't find the any button. Uh, it, it's just, I mean, that the knowledge is from there to there. And you really have to give opportunities that it's not a problem if you don't know yet. We have to educate ourselves and follow our students in that education process. And we want to, want to teach for a long time. And teaching is about educating for the future. So that's a mindset that we need in our teachers. But, and I, I really, I see it in many, many teachers, totally independently from the age, totally independent from the passport they have. Uh, teachers are ready for that. We just need to strengthen them and their, and their ability and also in their value. And I say education is, is the key, I mean it. It's one of the greatest jobs that we have to offer. Thank you. I'd like to, um, I'd like to focus a little bit on how we can get digital education right for everyone, mm. independent of, of uh, socioeconomic background. Um, to ensure equal opportunities. And I think this, I mean, it's a problem, the digital gap everywhere, but it's particularly large um, in, in Germany as well. Um, and I think COVID has shown us uh, just how deep it can run. Um, and the coalition agreement has, has a few good ideas on this. Um, uh, I've read about the Talentschulen um, as a way to, to strengthen um, schools who deal with these kind of students. But, but what do you think um, we can particularly do um, to, to close that digital gap, or uh, at least not to make it wider? And, um, and which role can digital tools mm -hmm. play in that? Mm -hmm. um, 
where they can play a vast role. Um, it starts, or let me say that um, at, the, at the center of, of everything is that digitalization becomes part of the school because there you have all children from all social backgrounds, from all areas, from, from you know, you have them together. You can actually uh, use um, your access to everybody there. So. Um, digitization needs to be an integral part of our schooling system. Um, this is why with these um, Talentschulen, with this start chances package, um, actually um, we want to provide, and this is already done in Nordrhein-Westfalen, we want to provide schools with special funds, with special um, opportunities to cater for children who don't have the support from home or they um, you know, they, German is their second, is not their mother language, and, and all these hurdles that actually still lead to, um, lead to differences later on in life. And um, the, the tools can be, first of all, you have to provide the hardware there so mm -hmm. that they have access to that. Like we heard about the plucker, I mean, you know, in, in some families you just have one computer at home, so, you know, there is access to, to tools. But then secondly, because um, teachers, and we just learned about the role of teachers um, in digital education, um, teachers have to, um, to train much more heterogeneous groups classes, and this will enable them to actually do more individualized training for, for each, for the children. So um, the, the, the chances of individual learning and self-determined mm -hmm. learning and becoming, you know, self-determined, um, it's a huge, huge opportunity. Having said that, it's a bit like with medicine. Um, if you take too much um, then it becomes the obvious. So the right balance between being in schools, having a social life, motoric skills, um, social skills uh, being trained um, is also important, but digitalization helps a lot to get, uh, to get the right composition of uh, competences. Yeah, yeah, and we've, I think, I mean, mostly what, what we've heard of um, the promise of artificial intelligence is that we can devise um, individual learning paths um, and that we um, can have adaptive learning um, and adaptive teaching, I guess, in that respect. And um, I wonder um, if, if you and um, Wolfgang Pries, both of, out of your, the research that you're doing and the, and the sort of uh, practical research you're doing with schools, um, can tell us about some of the concrete data. Um, I don't know if there is data yet. Um, that actually gives us hope that yes, we see when we uh, put those adaptive learning systems into a classroom, we see that, let's say, overall um, competences are going up and we do actually see that those from disadvantaged backgrounds um, have a different kind of uh, learning experience um, so that we can actually see, yes, this is, this is most effective. Um, mm -hmm. wh whoever wants to start, really. Well, maybe I can start. So there is um, ample evidence that these individualized uh, learning support uh, technologies, that these can help. So this is pretty clear. Um, it's not as much studied whether that really and or how this transfers uh, across cultures, societies, and cultural embeddings of your education. It's simply not possible to take something that is highly effective in China and put it here and expect that it would work because education is much more than an algorithm. Mm. Although some of the math learning can, uh, it, you need to make careful uh, transformations when, when you want to uh, use something that has proven successful in one area of education into something, uh, in, into another one. It's, it's usually possible, not straightforward. Uh, so it, it's a process that you have to go through and this is why uh, it, has, it is an active area of research uh, how underprivileged groups uh, can benefit. There are some evidence uh, papers in, in that respect, but it's not as much studied as we should do. Great. Um, maybe I can add and, and point out, maybe again, connecting to what uh, Niels Winkwart uh, said before. What is the great promise of, of digitalization? Uh, I think it's not uh, putting paper in PDF and now uh, watching YouTube videos. That's nice. That's good for uh, 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 the motivation, but a uh, big uh, uh, challenge is the, the classroom differentiation. So um, there are different needs uh, from students, different learning levels, different motivations, and that will increase um, with the challenge of inclusion. So uh, 
there are adaptive learning systems, um, a big, big promise uh, to, yeah, to have a solution for that. And uh, well, in our field, in the economics, it's a little harder because um, there are um, now data, there is data um, with mathematics uh, and with uh, linguistics. Uh, there are uh, already some adaptive learning models, but it's uh, harder if you don't have so many um, uh, right or wrong answers. And in economics, it's very often um, that there are different perspectives and you have to mm. ground your arguments on that. In the social science, it's different. So, and there is no data how adaptive learning can, can yeah, teach uh, students um, in in this kind of, mm. of field. And um, maybe one last thing, um, very often um, um, it's said, well, uh, the teachers uh, will be replaced with computers and um, it's a fear here and there. And I think you have to see the, the benefits there. Um, the, the adaptive learning systems, um, they, are, they have the aim to, yeah, to, to teach the, the, the basics. Um, and, and it's a great opportunity that uh, flipped classroom is the key word here, um, that at, Every student gets what, what he or she needs, and then the teachers have the time um, to discuss and to lead the students in a discussion and show them how to uh, mm. argument on these bases. And, and that's, that's a big, big promise. And um, although there is not so much data, the promise is so big, we have to do the research. And it's a, it's a great, great chance. Thanks. Before I um, open up, uh, to the to the floor and to the uh, virtual audience out there, and you can get ready and type your um, questions into the chat or get ready for someone with a microphone to um, uh, to uh, come to your place. Uh, I want to zoom out again um, to the European regional level um, and ask you, um, Georgi Dimitrov. The EU has set itself very ambitious goals with, uh, within the digital um, decade for education um, and obviously also within the Digital Education Action Plan. Um, how, how can the Commission uh, best support the diverse set of member states in reaching those goals and to maybe also counteract not only the digital gap that we're seeing within countries but also the digital gap that we're seeing between countries so that we can move forward as a highly skilled um, Europe, which is in, in the end the aim that the Commission has with, with its great plan. Thank you. I would uh, list uh, perhaps three main points on how uh, the European Commission contributes to this very, very big objective indeed, as you, as you are uh, rightly identifying there. The first one is really to say that um, the core business of the Commission when it comes to education is about best practice exchange and uh, cooperation. And what uh, some of the speakers identified here as um, innovative examples and practices is exactly the, the type of thing that we are looking at. We are sharing it with as many member states, in fact, with other countries as well, uh, from the neighborhood countries, from, from other uh, as well. Because I think we all agree that uh, this is not a European issue, this is a, this is a truly global issue. But um, we make sure that uh, together we strive to find what works best. And this is the so-called best, uh, best practice exchange and cooperation. And uh, with this, we believe that we can achieve more excellence because we can together elevate the level and perhaps avoid mistakes and things which are tending to reinvent the wheel. So that's number one. Number two is the question of funding for which the um, uh, European Commission is uh, um, mostly uh, known. Sometimes people associate this uh, primarily with funds and distributions of money. Uh, it's true as well. Um, we have, uh, of course, the Erasmus program where we support a lot of different uh, cooperation uh, beyond the mobility of students. Um, and uh, we support also the digital competence development. Um, we support digital transformation plans in school, for example. Um, but uh, we have now the Resilience and Recovery Facility, which um, is an unprecedented answer to what has happened since COVID. And um, in this huge uh, instrument, um, funding instrument, we observe, and I have seen all the plans of the member states, we observe that the investment in digital education is the most uh, important priority when it comes to education. Uh, so this is really what is standing out. And of course, this is uh, due to the crisis. 
but also maybe because we have missed some opportunities over the last decades. And the last point which I would like to make here, and the third, which is very, I would say, timely, and this is why I'm mentioning it, it is a bit more political, so maybe of interest also for um, some of you, is that um, after um, um, the State of the Union address of the Commission President um, just two months ago, the Commission launched what we call a structured dialogue on digital education and skills. It is led by uh, Margarete Vestager, who is the um, um, uh, one responsible for digital transformation overall. I mention it, it, it because it is important to think about education and training in this continuum. It is not an isolated fact only. And with this structured dialogue, we want um, over 2022 to exchange with the member states and see where are the gaps, where are the challenges, do investments also need reforms? Because of course there is now a lot of money coming in from the uh, resilience facility, but maybe sometimes we need to think also about reforms that can accompany this type of um, funds. And these are three specific instruments how we together want to contribute to achieving those objectives. I think my final statement would be to say that uh, looking at the um, growth in the past in terms of achieving our targets, um, we cannot assume that we're going to achieve them if, you, if we continue with the same instrument. So we need to do a little bit uh, more, but mostly we need to do some things differently. Thank you so much. Um, I would like to open up the discussion for questions from the audience. I'm looking into many curious faces. Um, there is a question over there, yes. We're waiting for the microphone. I think you, you uh, on the screen, you won't be able to see the lovely lady who's asking the question, yes? Well, thank you very much. Um, I have a question about the emotional and motivational deficiencies that you discovered with your pupils, with the students, that were not addressed by uh, the digital communication or the programs you use uh, in order to teach. So what, what were the most deficiencies that you could see that it's hard for the pupils to catch up with? I'm guessing this is a question for Katrin Röschel. Or? I would say so, but if someone else is also having an answer, um, yes, please. Yeah, we observed quite a bit. So what DEI is easily said, diversity, equity, and inclusion, and it, the gaps become bigger. And that is in the nature of differentiation, if you differentiate, and that's always connected with the hope that finally everybody reaches the same goal and knows the differences get bigger when we differentiate more. It can be a good thing, but we have to be aware of it. And um, a colleague shared a picture with me after the pandemic and said, when they come back to the classroom, the kids and are together again, they sort of knew each other from, from the screen. But it's like if you come out of a long distance relationship, you think you know everything the other one does and the other one thinks, and then all of a sudden you are together in, in a small apartment and can't get along that, that very well. Or it takes you a while. And we really um, decided now to, to hire a middle school counselor as because especially our kids in puberty, as you would expect, fifth to eighth grade, there are difficulties, difficulties there is more need to talk. They were basically, here in the States, on the, at the West Coast at least, we were literally locked at home and we were in lockdown for a long time. And they were with their parents, sometimes didn't even have siblings. Some, some parents built groups with other students, but they didn't really see people in the same age. And you know that growing up and growing through, through puberty is hard enough if you see the others every day. It's uh, even more difficult if you haven't seen them in a while and think you know them and then you don't. Hmm. So there is more need for talks. There's more need to build up trust again, to talk with adults, to talk with other kids, with um, all the diversities you can imagine coming from so many different backgrounds in our school, but that's normal. It's in Berlin, the, the same thing. You come from different backgrounds. You, your family dived more into their religion and their beliefs and their home 
whatever. <laughs> and then they come back and have to have to be in the group again. And yes, we have to be aware of that. And yes, we have to tackle it in order to go back to a, to a stage where we can appreciate the differences and, and celebrate them instead of being held back by them. So it, it has to be tackled. It's not, we cannot talk it away. We have another question in the audience. This is a related question, um, although it actually goes the other side on the teachers. So I was really astounded. I'm sorry, I've totally forgotten your name. But you mentioned about uh, teachers not being able to recognize uh, the essays which had been produced by AI. And uh, I, when I think about uh, you know, detecting plagiarism in my own classes, uh, I'm a university professor actually of ethics and technology, um, which is why I'm astounded I hadn't heard about this yet. <laughs> but, um, uh, you know, you, if you're creative and you, you do something you know hasn't been done elsewhere, you can see it. But at the same time, I don't deal with the full spectrum of education that, that you see in other uh, grade categories, you know, in primary school or whatever. So I, I, I'm just really curious about this and more generally what it sort of implies about having, uh, maybe it's, is it no worse than when we got calculators and you just had to tell people, no, write your essay yourself? or. <laughs> that we uh, change our, the way we educate as technology evolves uh, and that these two things are deeply intertwined, that we have new possibilities that come up that are technology driven. At the same time, we need to design technologies that make sense educationally. And this is one of the facets where technology is there that has not been thought through, uh, particularly by, by educators, uh, also by university education of teachers. There are fantastic opportunities to redesign language training based on many things that current technology does. It, it comes from very, very simple things like assessing um, easy texts that can now be done with, with, uh, with great correctness and where those um, teachers that are, uh, that are teaching language say, hooray, I can really now focus on, 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 on discussing with students, whereas the simple uh, things like uh, mm. as assessing a vocabulary test can be automated. But these, are, these go higher. And making teachers and teacher trainers aware that there is a technology underway that will probably prompt them to at least rethink a bit what they do, and that maybe the, the goals of a language education may change as, uh, as some other educational goals have changed because many of the facts that we should know are like in our fingertips and on our smartwatches and so on. So um, it, it's a larger complex probably than we can discuss today. It was just an example that is not av available to everyone, but that really has an impact or will have an impact. Perfect. There is one more question, I believe. Yeah. yeah. Oh, yeah. Two more. Yeah. Okay. Uh, I think I will use mine. Great. Yeah. <laughs> Keep her running up. <laughs> Thank you, Annika. Um, one of the reasons Katrin is here is not because she's a great teacher and a great uh, school director, but also because we did a project together on media literacy with three, three schools, her school and two, a school in Berlin and a school in Dresden, bringing together 60 kids to learn about um, media literacy. And uh, those kids are also working on a, on a manual, student-to-student -student manual, and also producing a podcast um, together. And what we noticed, uh, not very surprising, that there is a huge gap between, I mean, different schools, different kids, different ages, on um, how to really navigate the, um, the net. I mean, and the social, social media is a wonderful tool to learn um, and get information, but it also has its downfalls. And my question is, um, and... Uh, to whoever would like to answer, um, how do we start in an early age um, to, to teach media literacy and not just when they have already used for three, four years um, social media um, and we almost, I mean, already lost them on the way. Um, and uh, to add on this, um, in a setting where um, education is um, organized in a very, very federal way, um, where states have a lot of competencies over the curriculum. <laughs> I believe the, um, 
the European Commission actually has a whole expert group uh, on this topic. So maybe you want to kick off the answer. Um. Yes, thank you. I can definitely do that. And uh, indeed, thank you for, for this. Um, because we have also actually some of you on that group um, as it happens. Uh, first of all, I would say that uh, I'm, um, maybe I would address just one part of the question and leave um, how exactly that can be done um, to, to someone else. But um, I think that we need um, for sure to think about uh, who um, teaches um, and who takes the kids through this environment. And of course, we need to think here about the teachers first and foremost. And we set up indeed this um, uh, working group, uh, which is an official one of um, um, high level experts uh, from uh, very different parts of society, from private sector, journalism, media, uh, broadcasting, but of course also teachers and educators and researchers to come together and together develop guidelines for educators and teachers on how this information can be tackled uh, in a more effective way, and how we can promote at the same time digital literacy. Now, I have to confess that on the part of how we can do that from an earlier age, or as early as possible, I am perhaps less of an expert, but for sure it needs to be a systemic development with teachers who are those that guide, uh, because we know from research and from evidence, by the way, the private sector has excellent research on that, we know that children turn to teachers even in these kind of uh, questions. Um, uh, we always assume that children are much more, uh, let's say, digital than the teachers, and it's true. But in fact, in some of the research by indeed the Vodafone Foundation uh, 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 shows that, um, teacher, uh, that children turn to teachers um, in order to get guidance in terms of how to deal with fake news and this is very interesting, and we need to really think about that and how to capitalize on this. So uh, perhaps um, that would be my 50 cents. Thank you. If I may add just two thoughts. Sure, sure, sure. Um, it is a difficult question, but I would say let's start early and never stop doing it. Um, I think we have to become very realistic that children already start at an early age to be using or be confronted or, you know, using these new uh, media and, and, and social media. And um, they, they, have to, they have to be trained, but we should never stop. Because in a way, it is a very, it is a democratization of information, um, having this uh, World Wide Web. But on the other hand, we see that much, that it's used for fake news, uh, for, for interference in democratic processes and so on. So um, first of all, start early. Um, that, and, and maybe we should have a learning process that information has a value, so that we have certain gatekeepers, that we have certain proofs, um, and of course it should be part of every curriculum and uh, teacher education. Um, um, we are early stages, but we have to learn that. And we can learn, and this is actually, we can learn to get, I mean, we can have best practices on a European level, but um, it's a worldwide phenomenon. Mm -hmm. And the Friedrich Naumann Foundation for Freedom, um, we see that in, in the countries where there are democratic, young democratic, you know, systems are building up, luckily. Um, then um, y y they have much more experience with that. So having that as a task that overcomes borders and learn from each other. Start early, never stop, and do it globally. Thanks. I'm going to allow one last question. Now I'm very torn because two uh, arms went up. Uh, I'm hearing we're running out of time. One last question, or do we take this offline? I think the car is already waiting. <laughs> Do you give us two, mo two more minutes? Two more minutes. <laughs> two more minutes. OK, then uh, one last question, snappy question, snappy answers. Very briefly, because uh, the coalition treaty was mentioned a couple of times, could you just elaborate, Ms. Stagbatsinger, what you expect after four years? Because we have three different parties with very different traditions and different histories, and we know from Hessen and Nordrhein-Westfalen how different FDP educational policy is from the SPD and from the Greens. Maybe very shortly you can elaborate. So your elevator oh, pitch. I mean, we worked so long, four weeks on this coalition agreement, and you want me to finish it up in two sentences. 
Um, first of all, um, that um, it is very important, education, uh, I'm very proud that education, being it um, early stages or being it school or being it uh, later on academic or, um, or uh, lifelong learning, has a prominent role in many chapters. So, and there was a huge agreement on that. And of course, um, you know, the FDP has a more individual approach um, um, when it comes to education. Other coalition partners have a more, um, yeah, community approach, but we all share the same goal, that this is part of the promise we have in our country. Um, regardless where you come from, regardless what you eat, what you drink, um, whatever, um, you know, education is the core of um, social inclusion, and um, this is what caters for it. And there is, in all the chapters, there's a lot of education in there, and that is why I'm so proud, and this is why I'm going to say, yes, this is the right coalition agreement. That's a wonderful end, I would say. Thank you very much. And I hand back over to you. Yes. Unfortunately, this concludes our conference. Um, it has been a wonderful day. It has been a wonderful last panel. Thank you so very, very much. Before I know that you have to rush off, um, I would love to ask my team, it's a very, very young team at Aspen, they suddenly have the opportunity to be <laughs> in a picture <laughs> with the, um, with, well, I mean, um, with, an, with, a, with a minister or designated minister. Not yet, not yet. Um, I'm not jinxing it. Um, so we would love to take the opportunity before I thank all our partners and sponsors. So team, come up here. <laughs> because we wouldn't have been able to do so. This was one of the conferences we've done, which were, um, well, I mean, in the given circumstances, not so easy to pull off. <laughs> I know. Yes, yes. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, I mean, this is how I feel every single day. <laughs> I know, right? It's uh, it's. Oh, um, there, th 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 well, we have one for you. <laughs> and he's a tall one, so. <laughs> so this is this is the Aspen team. This is who stood behind that conference. This is who stands behind all those wonderful events, publications, ideas, enthusiasm at the Aspen Institute. So please give them a very, very big applause. <laughs> thank you very much. And with this, um, I want to thank our host. Um, we wouldn't have been here without you. It was um, really, really amazing. Um, we hope to be here again um, next, next year. Um, the state representation of Baden-Württemberg is just a wonderful partner. Thank you so much. Thank you also so much for the Dürr Stiftung, um, who have supported us for the last four years. Um, it, it has been a great ride so far. And um, in addition, also many, many thanks to Accenture, the Friedrich Naumann Stiftung. Thank you so much um, for being here today. Perfect. Um, and all your support and your patience. Oh, dear. I mean, to everybody, I mean the patience. Um, the Heinrich Böll Stiftung, um, Microsoft and SAP, thank you so very, very much. And um, drinks are served outside. <laughs> thank you. <laughs> <laughs>